I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Senators, I invite you as I read the prayer or pray to reflect in your own way on your responsibilities to the people of Australia and to future generations. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <coughs> Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? President. I table documents pursuant to statute as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? President, <coughs> a committee has lodged a proposal which is shown at item three of today's order of business. Uh, the, Senate, uh, uh, the Senate will now proceed to the consideration of government business. I call it Senator. Oh. <coughs> Government business order of the day number one, safeguards <coughs> mechanism accrediting amendment bill 2022, further consideration in committee of the whole. Yeah, we just need the deputy president. I note that you want the call. I'm not ready yet. No, that's right. the, the committee is considering the safeguard mechanism crediting Amendment Bill 2023 and Amendments 1 to 14 on sheet SK147, moved by Senator McAllister. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. I call Senator Dunningham. I oh, thank you, Chair. And after that shameful adjourning of debate last night, when we're all prepared to go, so. Late into the evening, I uh, family friendly says Senator White. Well, we could talk about that. But look, let's talk about the bill before us and the uh, question before the chair, which I think is extremely important. And there was a high degree of interest last night in the modelling. We could get nowhere on that. We kept getting stonewalled by this Labor Green government and their inability to be transparent about things, the uh, facts, figures, the assumptions, the modelling that underpins. The actions this government is taking to, they tell us, uh, assist with driving down emissions. I don't think they'll be driving them down. I think they'll be driving them offshore. But look, we're going to just park that for a moment. And I want to go to one of the second reading amendments that the government agreed to uh, a couple of days ago, I think, in this um, semi protracted yet guillotined debate on this legislation. And it was Senator Thorpe's second reading amendment, which I have a copy of here, uh, and it was the uh, one around uh, First Nations verification, uh, amongst other things. And I just um, uh, want to understand—it was the one relating to um, the requirement for Scope 3 emissions to be offset in the Beta Lou. Uh, firstly, Minister, what consultation has the Australian government had with the Northern Territory government about this change? Minister. Uh, Senator Dunham, thanks for the question. Um, uh, I'm interested in your description um, as a change. It is my understanding that the previous government, of which you were a part, um, supported the findings of the Pepper inquiry. Um, the government intends to use the safeguard mechanism to implement the PEPA review recommendation 9.8 in relation to the direct emissions of any gas project in the Beetaloo Basin. 
that is the scope one emissions, and the rules will therefore include provisions that have the effect of requiring gas facilities in the Beetaloo Basin to have net zero scope one emissions from entry. Uh, the government will refer the remainder of recommendation 9.8 concerning scope two and three to the Energy and Climate Ministerial Council and continue to work with the Northern Territory Government uh, on the arrangements around the PEPA review, uh, which we understand uh, the Northern Territory Government supports. Senator Dunningham. So my specific question was what consultation this government has had with the Northern Territory Government on the amendment that was supported uh, earlier in the debate? Minister. Senator Daniam, the government is, uh, regularly consults with state and territory counterparts. Your government supported the Northern Territory in their acceptance of the recommendations in the PEPA review. We do also. Senator Dunningham. I appreciate being reminded of what the former government that is no longer in government did. My question was what consultation on this specific issue uh, my question was what consultation has been had with the Northern Territory Government about this change that was agreed to in the second reading debate. Minister. I don't accept your characterisation of this as a change. It's a continuation of a policy that's been uh, consistent across governments to support the government in uh, the Northern Territory government in their implementation of the PEPA review. Senator Dunningham. So the amendment had no effect then. Minister. The amendment has the ordinary effect of a second reading um, amendment in this chamber. Senator Dunningham. Okay, so supported so an amendment that had no effect. That's fine. Was there any consultation with industry on that amendment that was agreed to, if not with the Northern Territory Government, which sounds like there was not? Minister. Uh, Senator Dunningham, I have indicated to you that our position as a government is to support the Northern Territory in their commitment to implement uh, recommendation 9.8 in the PEPA review. Senator Dunningham. So what consultation occurred with industry around the supporting of that amendment? Minister. Senator Dunningham, we were here in the chamber for an extended period of time yesterday and we talked about the very extensive consultation that has occurred about the entire package with industry over an extended period of time. Senator Dunningham. Did that extended consultation over an extended period of time that we talked about for an extended period of time cover consultation on that amendment? Minister. Senator I don't think I can add any further to the answers I've provided. The government has consulted broadly with industry around the package. Uh, the government has consulted with the Northern Territory around the PEPA review, and that has occurred over uh, successive governments, in fact. Uh, and the government intends to work with the Northern Territory around the PEPA review recommendation 9.8. Senator Dillingham. Thank you. So I think the answer is no. There was not consultation on this specific amendment, which was only voted on in the last day or so. Um, you know, we refer to this consultation, which occurred over an extended period of time in the lead-up to the tabling of the first draft of the bill, pre-dodgy deal, uh, pre-second reading amendments, pre-whatever it took to get this bill through the Senate. So no consultation with the Northern Territory Government, no consultation with industry. We've established that thus far, and I won't just accept can't anything, add anything to this. Uh, Madeleine King seems to be the only minister in the Australian government that actually stands up for fossil fuels and for those uh, contributors to um, the majority of energy generation sources. Uh, what consultation happened with Minister King? Minister. 
Uh, the Senator Dunningham, the position that has been brought to this chamber uh, around the safeguard mechanism occurred with, in consultation with all ministers, and that, of course, includes Minister King. Senator Dunningham. Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, and did Minister King consult with industry on this, or was it responsibility of the Environment and Water Minister? Minister. Uh, I'm not in a position to answer questions about Minister King's um, meetings or arrangements. Senator Dunningham. As part of the thank you, Chair, decision making process to determine that the government would agree to this amendment, did the Minister ask Minister King to consult? Minister. Senator Dunningham, I've already indicated that in bringing the safeguard reforms to this chamber, uh, the government worked collaboratively. Um, it's a decision of government, um, and that de those decisions are reflected in the, de in the legislation that is before the chamber at the moment. Senator Dunningham. All right. Well, look, uh, we'll move off the lack of consultation on this and anything else that happened as part of this dodgy deal. Um, but I would like to, on the broad issue of the amendment. Uh, go to some remarks from the Grattan Institute which um, on the issue of applying scope 3 to the Be Beta Lu, and they stated it's the weirdest thing we've ever come across and if the governments decide together to deal with scope 3 emissions it will have significant financial implications. Noting that sort of reflection on where things might end up, um, what modelling has been done um, relating to the financial implications uh, since that amendment was tabled and subsequently agreed to. Minister. Senator Dunningham, the government's position is to refer this matter to uh, the Ministerial Council. Now, I imagine, uh, dependent on uh, the approach that the Council takes to it, that they may request some analysis at some future point. Senator Dunningham. Okay, so uh, the government's position is to send something off to the Energy and Climate Change Ministerial Council. Um, did the government, who were elected by the people of Australia to implement policies, not specifically all of the amendments arising out of a dodgy deal with the Greens and others, did the government, as a group of supposedly responsible people, do any modelling on the financial implications of such an amendment before agreeing to it? Minister. Uh, Senator Dunningham, the financial implications of referring a matter to a ministerial council I think are quite straightforward. Uh, we would expect the ministerial council to examine this in the way that it sees fit uh, and perhaps we'll be in a position to report to the Senate about the arrangements that are put in place by the ministerial council at a future point. Senator Dunningham. So no request or um, desire to uh, even look at perhaps the outcome that might see uh, scope three emissions here. Um, we'll just accept that that is the case. I'm not going to get any further there. Was there any uh, work done to understand the economic impacts in the Northern Territory as a result of perhaps going down this path? Minister. Uh, Senator Daniam, uh, this is an interesting line of questioning. Uh, perhaps we could ask the same thing of you, although I do recognise that on this occasion uh, you are not required to answer questions, but perhaps I may ask it rhetorically. What work did your government do before agreeing to the recommendations in the PEPA review? Senator Dunningham. Um, well, I'm afraid you missed the boat by nearly a year on asking me questions, and um, I perhaps might have answered them similarly to you, um, but the tables have turned and you are required to answer questions as fulsomely as you possibly can, so I'll persist at asking these questions of you. Um, was there any economic modelling done, given we didn't talk to the Northern Territory Government about this before accepting the amendment, given we didn't talk to the industry, either through the minister relevant or the minister responsible for this portfolio? Um, and we haven't looked at the financial implications of perhaps where the work of the 
ministerial council might take us. Um, has there been even a desktop assessment of the economic impacts of uh, this in the Northern Territory? Minister. Senator Dunningham, I'm not quite sure how many times I have to step you through this, but if we can recall the sequencing, the Northern Territory commissioned uh, a, a, an inquiry, the PEPA scientific inquiry into hydraulic fracturing in the Northern Territory. Uh, the Northern Territory government accepted the recommendations in that inquiry, and at the time, your government provided support for such acceptance. Uh, the government's stated position, as reflected publicly in statements uh, and, and also here in this chamber, is that we continue that support and we intend to refer the specific questions um, in relation to recommendation 9.8 to the Energy and Climate Ministerial Council. Uh, the matters relating to scope two and three emissions are not matters that could be independently dealt with by the Commonwealth. Uh, the Energy Ministerial Council is the appropriate place for this to be considered. And you know as well as I do that the mere fact of referring a matter for consideration by a body does not have financial implications for government or for industry. We would expect that uh, the Ministerial Council will provide a response to such a referral. And that response could be any number of things. It may be in, uh, commissioning analysis of some kind. As I've indicated already, it, uh, if such a matter occurred, I'd be in a position to provide a report to the chamber at a later date. Senator Dunningham. Oh, thank you, Chair. Uh, so will the government just simply accept the advice of the ministerial council, whatever that might be? Minister. The government will work within the ministerial council, as we do on every other question. Uh, and I might make the point, Senator Dunningham, that it has been a feature of this government that we actually are capable of working with state and territory colleagues. Uh, you might recall that shortly after being sworn in, very significant challenges arose in the electricity sector as a consequence of the neglect uh, from your government towards the policy issues in the energy sector over a very long period of time. The lack of a settled climate policy and a lack of a settled energy policy led to very significant problems in terms of um, the energy sector. 22 policies, none of them landed in a decade, industry crying out for certainty, real material consequences in the physical infrastructure that supports Australian households, businesses and communities. Our approach to that was to work collaboratively with the states and territories and the market bodies through the ordinary processes to resolve that. It is a feature of the way our government works. It wasn't a feature of the way the government you were part of worked, and that was a really big problem for the country and for the Australian people. Uh, we will work within uh, the Ministerial Council in the way that we ordinarily would. Senator Dunningham. Thank you, Chair. I always love looking backward rather than forward, which seems to also be a feature of this government. For the last 10 months, all we've talked about is what's happened over the last nine years. But you got elected with a range of policies that you promised you would implement, a range of policies you said would do certain things. If we're to look forward, which is what we're supposed to be doing, I presume this legislation is mostly prospective rather than retrospective, so I don't know why we keep talking about the past. It seems to be something this government has a problem with, actually looking to the future. Just on promises, though, I mean, there was a promise in the energy space around bringing down power prices by $275, and I'm yet to hear, and maybe, Minister, you can confirm that the government intends to uh, honour that promise of bringing power prices down by $275. I did try to ask you at estimates. You wouldn't even say the number. None of your colleagues would. Not on the front bench, not the next row, not the row behind that, not in the other place. Nowhere. Because a feature of this government, if we're to talk about features, is not honouring promises, not living up to the promises you make. So while you might talk about 10 years of policy failure, 22 policies, all of the ALP talking points, one thing Australians are going to be judging this government on is whether it honours its promises to bring down power prices by $275, not just downward pressure, not just a failed gas price cap that will actually have unintended consequences yet to be realised, whether it will honour that key promise. So, if you want to talk about features, we can go toe-to-toe -to -toe all morning on those sorts of things and we'll continue to hold you to account. And I look forward to one day when Labor doesn't want to stitch up a dodgy deal with the Greens to prevent us from dealing with our private senator's bill, 
uh, perhaps debating my bill to report on power prices every quarter. But back to the bill before us. If you want to stick to the bill, I'll happily do it too, Senator McAllister. Um, is it the government's intention? Because, of course, when a government is elected uh, under the Westminster system of democracy, a government sets out policies, um, including promises at the election, and then honours them, generally speaking. Uh, is it the government's intent to eventually expand the safeguard mechanism to include scope three emissions for all projects, or will there be a guarantee provided that this will be ruled out for every project? Minister. Senator Dunningham, if we are to speak about the bill before us, then let's speak about the bill before us. It deals with scope one emissions, as indeed the safeguard mechanism did under your government. I think the most surprising thing is that a framework that was established by your government, a framework that you supported up until the election last year, is now a framework that you say you can't support. Based on the contributions from your members, uh, from your senators over the course of the debate, I uh, fully expect that you will not vote for this bill at the conclusion of the debate. It's mystifying. This is your policy, a policy established by your ministers, the parameters of which are well understood. You said no to any changes to it before you even understood what they might be. You refused to engage. It's a very surprising approach indeed, particularly for a group of people who weren't able to settle an allergy policy over the period that they were in government. And I recognise your aversion to contemplating that past, Senator Dunningham, but I might make the point that just occasionally looking at the past can prove fruitful. It might be that it's something you and your colleagues want to consider as you think about charting your path forward. Senator Dunningham. Oh, thank you, Chair. Look, I'm, I'm happy to continue to reflect on the past if we need to, um, including those promises that will never be honoured. Uh, I note that you didn't actually confirm that it was still the government's intention to honour its promise to reduce power bills for every Australian household by $275. I'll take that and bank it, and we'll talk about it at a future opportunity in this place. I note also that you didn't rule out expanding the safeguard mechanism to include scope three emissions. Um, uh, you talked about what this bill does. I suppose I've, my question was around intent. Uh, I think it's good to understand exactly what it is government seeks to do over time as uh, parliament agrees to a certain set of rules and laws. Uh, we agree to amendments. Um, and just on that, I mean, uh, uh, you talked about um, not engaging with and saying no to something before we even had the chance to look at it. Well, the problem is you tabled the blasted amendments within about three nanoseconds of debate commencing. And this was not a transparent, genuine and good faith debate. This was a stitch up between two political parties, the Australian Labor Party and the Australian Greens. We know, generally speaking, when the Greens get their hands on the levers of power, bad things happen. When they actually get close to uh, the economic powerhouse of our country, they turn the power down. They actually want the economy to tank. Their policies never generate good outcomes for households, for businesses and for the economy as a whole. So forgive us for being sceptical about your dodgy deal and saying no to the amendments that you tabled within three nanoseconds of debate beginning. Like That's not good government. And for anyone that might happen to be listening or one day reading the Hansard, this is not the standard that people require of a government, but it is the one that is now being set. And of course, just reflecting on the policy we set up in 2016, the safeguard mechanism, this is nothing like what we established. This is materially altering it, which is why we are opposing the nature of what you're putting in here. So I'll ask one more time, will the government rule out expanding the safeguard mechanism to include scope three emissions? Minister. Senator Daniam. I have pointed you to the bill before you. The bill before you, like, um, the, uh, like your mechanism, deals with scope one emissions only. The government has laid out its intentions in relation to reforms in the climate change area in the energy space very clearly in our Powering Australia plan. We are implementing that plan. 
And that plan set out arrangements to reform the safeguard mechanism, a mechanism which deals with scope one emissions. That is the focus of the government. That is where the government's intentions lie. I can't be any clearer with you than that. Senator Dillingham. Thank you, Chair. Well, look, we're not ruling out the expansion of this mechanism to include scope three. That's clear. And we also talked about the Powering Australia policy, which, of course, as far as I recall, had a promise to reduce power prices by a certain unmentionable number. If you're going to honour that, I look forward to and the policy as a whole, I look forward to that reduction in power bills. Moving off that and uh, not being able to secure any certainty for the people and the industries of Australia, we'll talk about this hard cap if we're able to. So these new requirements around the um, proposed hard cap, I understand, uh, provide that if it looks like the cap will be uh, in any way breached, the minister needs to make an amendment, or amendments plural, as needed to the safeguard rules to achieve the cap. Um, and so the legislation and the EM, as far as I can tell, failed to outline the types of amendments that could be made, but could include, as I understand it, measures uh, such as emissions decline rates that are far steeper than the government consulted with industry on. Um, and you know, obviously these limits could target all facilities or specific sectors or even specific facilities. Um, any changes of those of that nature and of, with those characteristics could change the commercial proposition for existing and of course incoming potential investments and what was once a profitable industry uh, could of course be something very different um, when, when certainty is removed in the way that it is. Um, and it's been put to the community um, in uh, the public debate that we've had on what has been proposed here as part of this cosy yet dodgy little deal, um, that there will be some tough choices needed to be made by government around which projects proceed and which ones do not. So I want to ask, how does the government expect businesses to have certainty in making any investment decisions when it's unclear what additional restrictions um, will be placed upon them and when these restrictions will come into force. I think it is important to understand uh, exactly what's being proposed here and what the impacts might be. Minister. Uh, thanks, Senator Dunningham. So I have spoken yesterday at some length about the arrangements proposed, and, and they are these. that. Uh, the, the amendments before this chamber simply propose an information sharing arrangement and regularise what already occurs between uh, departments. However, to be clear and to repeat what I've said uh, earlier in the debate, should the Minister for the Environment make a decision uh, which increases, which would result in the increase of emissions from a covered of scope one emissions from a covered facility. The minister would, for the environment, would have an obligation to communicate such a decision and the information in that person's possession about uh, the the emissions associated with the decision. They would need to communicate that with the secretary of the Department of Climate Change uh, and with the Climate Change Authority and also with the Minister for Climate Change. Um, should, uh, either the, uh, should the Minister receive advice from either the Climate Change Authority or the Secretary of the Department um, indicating that the decision taken by the Minister for the Environment uh, presented a risk to the objectives of the INGAS Act, um, the minister would then contemplate whether or not the safeguard rules needed to be amended or any other step that might be required. They would be required to, take a to undertake a consultation on that question, and in the ordinary course of events we would expect that such a consultation would involve industry. That is how we've approached this series of rule changes. That is how we would approach future series, any future rules changes. Uh, and an amendment would then take place in the ordinary way. It would be uh, 
as was the case under your mechanism, a disallowable instrument, uh, and a, again, this chamber would have an opportunity to consider such an instrument. Senator Dunningham. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, so then, obviously, it, I mentioned specifically in some of the possible responses or options available to the minister and to the government around what could be done uh, by way of additional restrictions. Um, it, has there been any contemplation of what a uh, tougher decline rate might look like? Has the government considered specific uh, rates? I mean, is it something like a 6 per cent or a 10 per cent rate that's been considered here? I'd be interested to know how far the government's looking to go or what sort of uh, limitations there are on government response to um, dealing with this issue. Minister. Senator Dunham, you asked about analysis. We don't anticipate that there will be a need for an adjustment of this kind, but the amendment makes clear what would take place in the event that uh, the objectives of the Act were not being met. Senator Dunham. Well, thanks, Chair. Um, so, ju just so there's been no analysis undertaken. Uh, around this because we con the government contemplates or d it doesn't believe it would be necessary to go down this path. It's just a tool that might be there if needed. Minister. Senator Dunningham, as I've indicated, the government has consulted widely about the legislation before the parliament and also the proposed rules that might be made under the legislation. That's been an extremely lengthy and detailed process that's involved many stakeholders, both those covered by the uh, safeguard mechanism and also other stakeholders in the community. Our assessment uh, is that the, it is unlikely um, that the circumstances contemplated, uh, that you're contemplating would arise. Um, however, we are keen to ensure that there's clarity about what would happen under these circumstances and the amendment before the chamber seeks to do that. Senator Dunningham. Thank you, Chair. So, as I understand it, in answer to some questions Senator Canavan asked last night, the government was unable to say what the size of the buffer was under the hard cap. And so, if we're not going to get clarity on that, how can we reach a conclusion that you've just outlined that we're not going to require, chances are, uh, alternative measures like this. It just doesn't seem to add up in my mind around, can't tell you what the buffer is, but we're certain or fairly certain we're not going to have to go down this path. Minister. Senator Dunningham, I appreciate your interest in understanding this, but I think that you're failing to contemplate uh, the actual amendment before you or the material that's been provided to you in the EM. In the unlikely event that um, a change of this kind was required and the minister did commence um, a, a consultation, uh, the EM sets out what would happen. And I, I'll take you to paragraph 17. It says this, if the requirement applies, the secretary would be required to advise the minister that they are so satisfied and the minister would be required to undertake public consultation as to whether the safeguard rules should be amended to ensure that they achieve that object and the content of any such amendments. And if they are satisfied that the safeguard rules need to be amended to achieve the second object of the INCA Act, amend the safeguard rules. It's really clear it would be a consultation process aligned with any other consultation process undertaken by government. It, it, the government, I think, has demonstrated our commitment to working in a really orderly and straightforward way with business. We've undertaken extended consultation. There have been papers, there have been roundtables. We would expect to work with business in the ordinary way. Now, I am surprised that you uh, want to sort of go down this path. Your government was characterised by 
and utterly chaotic approach to decision making. The material before you today reflects a very, very thorough policy process engaging a very wide range of stakeholders uh, and any future policy process would, I imagine, look quite similar. Senator Dunningham. Well, for the purposes of actually accurately reflect, reflecting the pathway to where we're at, I mean, I wouldn't exactly call this orderly and transparent and straightforward. I mean, but part of it was yeah, fairly straightforward, what you'd expect from a government, a round tables, discussion papers, consultation. But then it went into the big black box of the Labor Green government, where we started doing dodgy deals, where no one was consulted, no one was brought on the journey. And this Senate was treated with absolute contempt by handing the amendments out as the committee stage began. I mean, I'm sorry, that is not orderly. That is not thoughtful. That is not considered. That is not mature government. That is a rush, dodgy deal. So if you're telling me, Minister, we're going to see more of this down the track, you go out, consult with industry, go out and have roundtables, do your discussion papers, have this orderly discussion, and then we'll park all of that and then get back inside our black box with our friends over here, the Australian Greens, then I don't think anyone should be satisfied and provided comfort through what you're saying, because if it's going to be like what we've just seen, which is why we've had the extended debate on this bill this week, which will be voted on at one o'clock today, that is not a good outcome. So please don't be surprised at my wanting to understand this, because to the kids up there who are watching this debate, this is not what good government is. This is dodgy deals to get something done so the Prime Minister at the end of this week can say, I won, I got a bill up, and the people that are going to be paying are going to be the people of Australia, those businesses who are going to be penalised for this, and the workers in those businesses who are potentially going to lose their jobs, those people out there that are going to be paying for more power. But again, I come back to the questions I was asking. Um, if there's been no modelling done, economic modelling on growth under the hard cap and uh, what might happen within that buffer, I'm just trying to understand, putting aside your assurances of consultation, whatever that might look like, if it replicates what we've seen here, then we're in big trouble. Uh, how can you be certain or sure or whatever word you seek to use around not having to um, uh, look, consider these amendments? Minister. Uh, Senator Dunningham, uh, it, it's a fascinating analysis, isn't it? Because there's this real sliding doors moment. Uh, you'd like to talk about responsible government. I'd be interested to understand your perception of what a responsible opposition does, because you dealt yourself out of this from the very beginning. Our government indicated a willingness to work with all willing partners across the parliament, and those senators and members that were willing to engage with us, we engaged with them. Consulted them just as we consulted community organisations, just as we consulted business organisations, in response to an unequivocal call for policy certainty in the climate and energy space, a, a call which your government ignored and which we were determined to address because we understood the consequences for the Australian people if energy policy was allowed to continue to drift as it did under Mr Taylor. Now, somewhere in the long preamble was an assertion that there had been no modelling done or no consideration about the way that uh, a target would work, and that is simply wrong. Uh, there has been an extended period of consultation about that and some very explicit information in the public domain. But perhaps I can communicate this. Um, the proposed 4.9 per cent decline rate includes explicit consideration of emissions from new anticipated developments consistent with Australia's emissions projections 2022. And those projections, as you understand, include uh, information about future growth in emissions from a range of sectors arising from economic activity in those sectors. The 4.9 per cent rate also allows for average annual anticipated production growth of 0.7 per cent. The reserve that was referenced in the January consultation paper provided additional assurance in relation to 
uncertainty about production and emissions from new and existing facilities, which is to say that there was a buffer built in first for growth, second for new facilities and third for uncertainty. The quantum of the reserve was 17 megatons and following consultation with stakeholders, as I explained last night, the qualification test for trade exposed baseline adjustments for the manufacturing sector has changed. And that kind of change is the sort of thing you'd expect when we speak to stakeholders because we're not speaking to them. Um, uh, we are speaking to them and responding to the issues they're raising with us. For this reason, the overall quantum of the reserve will be recalculated for the final safeguard rule amendments, as I indicated last night. Uh, it's anticipated that that final safeguard rule will be made by the end of April 2023 and will be accompanied by an explanatory statement setting out the detail of the arrangements. Uh, sorry, Senator Roberts was on his feet. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Minister, I want to know the safeguards built into this bill against your safeguard bill. Senator Canavan last night exposed the economic underbelly of this bill, an underbelly that is sagging, that will hurt families, workers and employees who will be dragging their asses along economically because of severe impacts on cost of living and because we'll be exporting jobs to China as a result of this because they don't have this bill. I want to dive beneath the economic into the morality and the fairness to see about your awareness of those considerations and also the protections. What safeguards are there for the people? Let's go to the basics, the origins of your safeguard mechanism. Let's have a look at its pedigree. The father of global warming claims was senior UN bureaucrat and oil billionaire Maurice Strong. He then morphed global warming, which was never proven and, and, and has been disproven, into unlimited climate change, climate apocalypse, or as the Greens like to say, a climate breakdown. He was his, I'll give you some examples of his U corruption in, in the UN public, public domain and also his private corruption. He was involved in the UN food for oil scandal, corruption. He formed the United Nations Environmental Program which was responsible for banning DDT against the science, responsible for 40 to 50 million deaths, needless deaths, before DDT was brought back by the UN. He was wanted by the United States police authorities for corruption with regard to water dealings in Western United States. He later formed the UN's climate science body that is really a political body, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It has never produced any empirical scientific data nor logical scientific points to back up your claim that we need to cut our carbon dioxide. Now I'd like you to listen to this, Minister. Director, he was the director and one of the founders of the Chicago Climate Exchange that aimed to make billions of dollars trading carbon dioxide credits globally. He was joined in that by his accomplice, Al Gore, who headed up his company, 50% of his company, Generation Investment Management, on the Chicago Climate Exchange. Al Gore is known not only for corrupting the science, misrepresenting the science in a glossy propaganda movie, An Inconvenient Truth, he's also famous for coming out here at Kevin Rudd's invitation in April of 2007 as part of the 2007 campaign which saw Rudd elected based on climate fears. The whole thing is a scam designed to make billionaires richer. And it rewards other billionaires like Climate 200 carpetbagger Simon Holmes of Court, funding teals, including Senator Pocock, who votes for policies making Holmes of Court richer. People know this, but you yet you remain silent on it. Crooks, like Marie Strong, initiated the climate scam, the climate fraud. Crooks continue pushing lies that climate is changing when it's simply varying naturally, as it has always done. These carbon dioxide credits are based on a scam for which the people of Australia are paying through the nose. 
Why? To make crooks richer. I draw your attention to, an, to a comment from the Europol police that indicated somewhere around about 2012 from memory, 95% of carbon dioxide trading in Europe is subject to corruption. To this needless complexity, you now add six pages of afterthoughts and corrections in the form of an amendment. So many details to be inserted by ministers and bureaucrats. Are you aware of these facts, Minister? Minister. Uh, thanks, Senator Roberts. I, I really wouldn't accept um, the facts that you've put, uh, that you've outlined, uh, I think. Um, so you characterise them as facts. I'd probably describe them more as opinions. Um, Minister, this government accepts the science of climate change and indeed so do Australians. And Australians do that because they, unfortunately, are living with the early manifestations of a climate, changing climate. We have been through a period over the last three or four years of unprecedented fires and floods, circumstances which put many Australians in harm's way and saw immense destruction of property and continue to have ongoing impacts on our economy. I understand, because you've communicated it very regularly here and in committees, that you don't accept this science. But the world scientists are telling us that we have a problem. They're telling us that this is the critical decade to act. And the Australian people expect us to do that. I trust the science. I trust the scientific process and the scientific method that allows contestability um, in published research. I recognise that for reasons that you've never entirely explained, you consider that the method of peer review produces inaccurate information. Don't share that view. I think that the world has been well served by the propagation of the scientific method. I think we've been well served by the many scientists, including eminent Australian scientists, who have devoted their lives to understanding the challenges that confront us, many of them devoting their lives to communicating properly with Australians about the impacts that will come about with a warming planet. The IPCC is telling us that human activities, principally through emissions of greenhouse gases, have unequivocally caused global warming, with global surface temperatures reaching 1.1 degrees Celsius above 1850 to 1900 in 2011 and 2020 year. Global greenhouse gas emissions have continued to increase with unequal historical and ongoing contributions arising from unsustainable energy use, land use and land use change, lifestyle and patterns of consumption and production across regions between and within countries and among individuals, and they tell us that with high confidence. These changes have real costs. I accept that you don't believe this. And as I've said to you before, I'm not sure that anything I can say in this forum will change your mind, Senator Roberts. We've spent quite a bit of time together. I don't see you changing your views. Senator Roberts. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. We can come back to the science in a few minutes. For now, though, when people buy carbon dioxide credits, what's being purchased? To have a market, to have something that's, that's being, going to be given, someone's going to give money for, what need is being met? What is being purchased? This corruption that I've just talked about is because there is no such need being met. So could you tell me the need that you think is being met and what should buyers buy? Minister. I think it's a good question, Senator Roberts, because it goes to a fundamental difference in our views. I believe, and the government believes, that 
The world must reduce its emissions if we are to avoid dangerous climate change. And so the need is to reduce our emissions. Senator Roberts. Thank you. Yet never has anyone anywhere in the world, including yourself, produced a specific quantified effect of carbon dioxide from human activity on any aspect of climate, whether it be temperature, snowfall, droughts, floods, frequency, severity, storms, nothing at all. Sea levels, sea temperatures, sea ocean salinity, ocean alkalinity, never. So how the hell can you track progress toward achieving the, your goals? Minister. Senator Roberts, this is simply an incorrect statement. Um, there are many, many, many peer-reviewed studies which establish the relationship between increasing concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere and changes in the climate. And there are many, many, many peer-reviewed studies which uh, establish the observed changes as a consequence of uh, increasing concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere. I again quote perhaps from the most recent IPCC report, which tells us this with high, high confidence. Widespread and rapid changes in the atmosphere, ocean, cryosphere and biosphere have occurred. Human-caused climate change is already affecting many weather and climate extremes in every region across the globe. This has led to widespread adverse impacts and related losses and damages to nature and people. Senator, the report goes on to say it is unequivocal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, ocean and land. And the way that the IPCC does its work is by contemplating the peer-reviewed research. You don't accept that research. I understand that. But I do, and the government does, and I'd venture that the Australian people trust our scientists and the nature of the scientific process. You are quite welcome to continue to put your objections to science. Um, this government accepts the science. Senator Roberts. Minister, thank you for confirming that no one has produced the specific quantified effect of carbon dioxide from human activity on any aspect of climate. The UN has never done that. You've just spoken in generalities. I'll accept that. Thank you very much. I want to, we've talked, I've talked about the corruption, the lack of specific quantified effect that anyone has produced. And Minister, you implicitly smear and denigrate me because I challenge you on the science. Yet when I asked you for the, for the science, you gave me 25 papers, not one of which pr produces the the logical scientific points showing the carbon dioxide from human activity affects climate. You gave me papers that included the impacts of climate change, not the cause. Minister, you have no clue what the hell you're talking about. So let's, let's continue with this, this uh, theme. Your safeguard speech, your safeguard speech, or rather your safeguard bill, doesn't even define what a safeguard mechanism credit is. It's not in the bill. If the parliament passes this bill, we'll just have to trust the minister or some bureaucrat to tell us later. The biggest producers of goods in this country will be told to cut their production of carbon dioxide with the amount not defined in the bill. It may be 4.9 per cent. That's what the rumours say. A year. And if they don't, they'll be forced to buy undefined carbon dioxide credits. Companies will be forced to buy carbon dioxide credits. Forced. And add the bill to their prices, which the people of Australia will pay through increased cost of living. Let's continue with the undefined components of your bill. We do know that the safeguard mechanism credits will be defined as eligible international emissions units, meaning they will be able to be traded overseas. If Murray Strong was still alive, he'd be, he'd be rubbing his hands together with glee. Al Gore is still alive and he will be rubbing his hands together with glee. Let's look at um, Australian National University environmental law expert, Professor Andrew McIntosh. He said 
that the Australia's carbon dioxide market is a fraud on the environment, suffers from a distinct lack of integrity, and is potentially wasting billions of dollars in taxpayer money. He goes on and talks about the review. On the 9th of January, he said, quote, the review panel acknowledged the scientific basis criticising the carbon dioxide, the carbon credit scheme, but says it was also provided with certainty, with evidence to the contrary. Yet the review panel did not disclose what that evidence was or what it relates to. The public is simply expected to trust that the evidence exists." End of quote. What are they hiding from the people of Australia? Then we go on. The Chubb Review was a complete sham designed to give a scam-filled industry, and I've talked about the fraud already, a green tick of health to pave the way for this bill. With Ian Chubb's whitewashed review conveniently in place, Labor has given itself permission to rush this bill through, while the scientists who originally raised the integrity issues scream that none of the policies, none of the problems have been addressed. Ian Chubb has repeatedly taken money from both Liberal National and Labor Greens federal governments to peddle unfounded, false and scary claims. He's a paid gun for hire to push the government line. That's who you got to do your review. The bill places huge power in the minister, with out-of-touch bureaucrats in the Canberra bubble left to later fill in the detail. It's another ministerial power to decide the details. This is a bill to give the minister a blank cheque on who this policy will apply to. He will or she will decide that. How much they will be forced to cut, how quickly they will be forced to do it, and much more. Almost all of this policy will be made via legislative instrument an executive dictate from the minister. Power corrupts and cor absolute power corrupts absolutely. The Senate, in granting this wide power, wide open power over some of the most significant changes to our economy is unconscionable, just as Senator Canavan highlighted brilliantly last night. The design of this bill, based on a product that is rife with cor corruption internationally, unfounded, the design of this bill is to minimise parliamentary scrutiny. It's a spit in the face of the parliament, a spit in the face of democracy, and a spit in the faces of Australian people who are meant to serve, that you are meant to serve in this, in this chamber. Let's go to Labor's talking about consultation. To consult means actually listening, Minister. Labor obviously had no intention of listening. Numerous stakeholders noted the staggered release of the draft bill, the legislative instruments, and Chubb review. Combined, these steps limited the ability to consider the implications of the proposed reforms. How the hell can Labor claim to have consulted when many of the detailed operational elements and details of this entire policy are contained in legislative instruments which do not yet exist? Minister, I'd like to discuss briefly the pedigree of this bill because to this needless complexity that I've discussed, this hiding away of details, giving the minister huge powers, I would like to know what safeguards the people of Australia have in your safeguard bill. Uh, minister. Thanks, Senator Roberts. Um, perhaps I can deal first with uh, some of the opinions you've offered around the Chubb Review, and I think it's unfortunate um, that you've chosen to impugn the integrity of Professor Chubb in the way that you did in your contribution. But I can talk a little bit about the um, independent review of Australian carbon credit units, um, because you raised that and you raised a, a set of questions around the reasoning for that review. So, the Australian Carbon Credit Unit Scheme plays an important role in our pathway towards net zero emissions by 2050. Um, in particular, it does that by incentivising reductions and sequestration that wouldn't otherwise occur. Um, and the independent review of Australian Carbon Credit Union Units was commissioned to ensure that ACUs, which is the shorthand term for the units, uh, and the carbon crediting framework maintain a strong and credible reputation. Um, 
And it's important. It needs to be supported by participants. It needs to be supported by purchasers, and the broader community need to understand that the scheme is strong and credible as well. Uh, Professor Chubb um, undertook that review uh, along with a panel and concluded that the ACQ scheme arrangements are sound and that there are appropriate checks and balances at the scheme, method and project level to protect the integrity of the scheme and the credits that are created under it. The panel did make some recommendations and we're grateful to them for that. Uh, their recommendations are sensible changes and they seek to ensure that the scheme is aligned with evolving best practice and will increase public confidence in the scheme, supporting more participation and increased abatement. And the key recommendations include separating the functions of integrity assurance, regulation and administration, maximising transparency of scheme information to increase trust, fostering innovation in methods and project implementation, and supporting greater participation, including by First Nations communities. And so when we received that report, uh, we, we released it on the 9th of January 2023 and accepted in principle all of those 16 recommendations. Um, it was a, a thorough process, um, Senator Roberts. Um, there was a public discussion paper. Uh, in response to that, there were over 200 written public submissions. They were all online. Um, except for the people who requested that their submission be confidential. Uh, the panel also met with technical and carbon industry experts, government agencies, regional councils, First Nations people, native title representative groups, academics, carbon service providers and scheme participants, industry bodies, environment, non-government organisations and current and former scheme administrators. And they undertook project site visits in a range of settings to investigate methods and project implementation. They also commissioned and published advice from the Australian Academy of Science regarding the science that underpins four of the methods and the strengths and limitations of those methods. Uh, the panel was briefed by the Clean Energy Regulator on its administration of the scheme, including the compliance tools um, and the powers and processes that the Clean Energy Regulator uses to find and address any project non-compliance and ensure individual projects are delivering abatement. We're grateful to Professor Chubb for the work that he did and the work of the panel more generally. Um, I think it's unfortunate that you seek to characterise it in the way that you did in your remarks. Um, Professor Chubb is an eminent person who has contributed a great deal to the Australian community. I, I don't think it's necessary to speak about him in the way that you did, Senator Roberts. Um, but we are now moving to implementation. We're seeking to implement the recommendations, which any rec of the recommendations that don't require further consultation with stakeholders. For example, the minister, um, Mr. Bowen, has requested advice from the Emissions Reduction Assurance Committee to revoke the avoided deforestation method, which was one of the recommendations. Um, and where we are requiring further consultation, we'll work with stakeholders on the implementation of the other recommendations that have implications for a wide range of scheme and market participants, government agencies and other stakeholders. You also raised um, a set of issues, I think, about the legislation before us. So the legislation before us creates a framework um, for crediting. Um, the proposed changes include reducing safeguard mechanism baselines and enabling safeguard facilities that stay below their baselines to generate tradable credits that are known as safeguard mechanism credits or SMCs. And the purpose of the bill is to enable the crediting element of the reforms. You're right that other parts of our reform process um, will be dealt with through subordinate legislation. And uh, a draft set of rules was released for consultation back in January. Um, I'd like to step you through why we've chosen to go down that path, Senator Roberts. Um, the amended framework will rely on a large amount of technical detail to achieve its aim of reducing scope one industrial emissions in line with Australia's emission reduction targets. 
And so that detail would reflect a range of factors, including market dynamics, industry practices and available technologies. Um, as you'd appreciate, all of those things can change. Technology changes very rapidly at times. And so in order to operate as intended, it's appropriate that details, some details of the safeguard mechanism framework would be set out in delegated legislation so that changes in any of those factors, market dynamics, industry practices and available technology, can be quickly reflected and wouldn't cause unintended burdens or consequences. So, for example, um, the government defined production variables and emissions intensity values include a large, large amount of technical detail which might require updating at short notice to be appropriate for use. Um, appropriate constraints on delegated legislation are included in the bill through the requirement that the minister only make safeguard rules if the minister is satisfied that they are consistent with the proposed new second object of the INGAS Act, and that helps ensure that any safeguard rules are consistent with the intent of the primary legislation. Um, the government has carefully considered the split between primary and subordinate legislation. For example, penalty arrangements for an excess emission situation are currently contained in regulations. Uh, that was the case under the previous government. This bill changes that, updating penalty arrangements for excess emission situations, so they will now be contained in the bill itself. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Let's have a look at the history that's driven, driving your bill. That's, and that brings us to the pedigree as well. As well. We're talking about preventing, you've just talked about preventing of warming yet there's no need, specific need, being met. People are just going to buy the uh, limitation of warming of the planet. No specific evidence, no specific need. No wonder there is so much corruption in these carbon dioxide credit schemes overseas. But let's, let's have a look at the history. John Howard's government was the first party to have an emissions trading scheme as policy. Tony Abbott later correctly stated an emissions trading scheme is a carbon dioxide tax. John Howard's government also said it would not ratify, not sign the UN's Kyoto Protocol, but it would implement it. And in doing so, it had to avoid shutting down industry and so stole farmers' rights to use their own property. And farmers are still paying that price right now. Hundreds without hundreds to two hundred billion dollars in compensation for the, for the loss of the rights to use their land, which they're entitled to under section 51 clause 31 of our constitution. And the Howard government went around that to get the states to do their dirty work. And Peter Beattie is on record in writing in Queensland Parliament Hansard saying that he did his native vegetation protection, protection legislation to help John Howard comply with the UN's Kyoto Protocol. John Howard's government also brought in the renewable energy target at 2 per cent. And just recently, John Howard admitted that it's now out of control. John Howard's government implemented the UN Rio Declaration, implemented the UN's Kyoto Protocol, implemented the UN's Paris Agreement. Sorry, the Liberal, Labor, Liberal National Party have since implemented the Paris Agreement, the UN 2050 Net Zero all driven by foreign bureaucrats and corruption. I'll come back to you citing the UN IPCC in a minute. Then we see Kevin Rudd putting these initiatives from the Howard Anderson government on steroids. Kevin Rudd pushed an emissions trading scheme, but it fell over thanks to the Greens. The Greens rejected it. But Kevin Rudd dramatically, introduced, dramatically raised the renewable energy target. Julia Gillard then implemented a carbon dioxide tax and broke promises to do so. Tony Abbott, to his credit, rescinded that ghastly tax, which you're now bringing back. Then after Tony Abbott rescinded it, Malcolm Turnbull and Greg Hunt put in place, through this parliament, in 2015, the basis of your safeguard mechanism. And now you're building on that. That is the pedigree of this shabby bill you've got. 
that you've had to hide, hide the details from the people. So let me ask you a question. Why are China and India not doing what this Labor, Greens, Teal, Pocock coalition government is doing? Why is Russia not doing it? Why is Brazil not doing it? Why are we punishing Australian employers and families? Minister. Uh, Minister has the call. Actually, I was yet to seek the call, but I am now. Um, uh, thanks, Senator Roberts. I, I think your question is uh, well, you and I have a different approach to this, don't we? Because your fundamental proposition is that you don't think this is necessary at all. Um, and the government uh, certainly does. The government accepts the science, the government accepts that um, the globe must reduce emissions. And as part of that, we accept that that's a collective enterprise. It's not something that can be done exclusively by one country. It's something that may only be achieved through all of the countries of the world collaborating together. And you're right, Senator Roberts, that different countries have different degrees of ambition. <coughs> but as a responsible participant in the global community and as a government that accepts the science, we consider that our obligation is to work with the other nations of the world to build the necessary ambition to contain, global, to contain uh, greenhouse gas emissions and hence to stop dangerous climate change. And I can run you through some of the targets um, that have been adopted uh, by countries that we'd ordinarily consider peers countries that we often compare ourselves to. So, as you know, our 2030 target is 43 per cent reductions against a 2005 baseline uh, by 2030. Um, Canada uh, has a target which is 40 to 45 per cent below 2005 by 2030. Reasonably similar. Germany has a domestic target um, which is 65 per cent below 1990 levels by 2030. Japan, a domestic target of 46 per cent below 2013 by 2030. New Zealand, 50 per cent by 2005 levels by 2030. The United Kingdom, 68 per cent by 1990 levels, below 1990 levels by 2030. And the United States of America, 50 to 52 per cent below 2005 levels by 2030. Now, Senator Canavan, you're right that not all country. My apologies, Senator Canavan. I was listening to your interjection and I wasn't. Uh, and I mistakenly named you. Senator Roberts, you're right that a range of countries have. Uh, targets that are lower than ours. Some of them have targets that are more ambitious than ours. We have set a target that we believe that Australia can achieve. And we do that because we know that it's absolutely essential that the world acts on this. Um, we've re received stark warnings in recent weeks from the world scientists, and they tell us that this is the critical decade. Um, it's a decade for the kids. And we have a chance to do something serious to contribute to the global effort to tackle climate change, and we intend to do so. And the Australian people voted for that. And we know too that there are opportunities here, opportunities for many of the communities that you seek to represent, opportunities for communities that I seek to represent rural and regional communities around the country, especially in New South Wales, my home state. There are job opportunities here, jobs, op opportunities for businesses, and there are threats too if we don't act, because our trading partners 
increasingly expect us to act. And investors expect businesses to act. So, Senator Roberts, we think this is an important reform, and I recognise that the foundation of our decision is one that you don't agree with. You don't accept the climate science, and therefore, logically, you don't think we need to do anything. We simply don't agree with that. And I would put it to you that neither does the Australian public. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Chair. The minister did not answer my question as to why China and India are not doing what this Labor, Greens, Teal, Pocock coalition government is doing, nor Russia. China and India produce in a week what we produce in terms of carbon dioxide output in a year. They're continuing to skate along. And in fact, China and India buy our coal that you are trying to stop the use of here and that these people over here in the Greens are trying to stop the use of our coal. So we can ship our coal. And as, as Senator Dunningham said, this is not about cutting carbon dioxide from human activity. It's about shifting it to our major competitors and giving them the advantage of our cheap, clean, high efficiency coal. Japan is building coal-fired power stations. The United States allows gas. That's the only thing that saved the United States. You talk about jobs. For every job in the solar wind sector, solar and wind sector, there are 2.3 jobs lost in the real economy. So why can other countries have the benefit of our high quality coal and gas, yet we cannot? We're the largest exporters of gas in the world, second largest exporters of coal in the world, beaten by our neighbour right next door to us in Indonesia. We're killing our productive capacity and our children's future. We're already at net zero. We sequester, as a country, three times the carbon dioxide that we produce as humans in this country. Three times. And that's not including what the ocean absorbs around us. So the costs of the Labor Greens Teal Pocock bill are extraordinarily high. And we notice you've been driven to this by the Greens, who will take ultimate responsibility. You didn't answer my question. Why are we punishing Australian families, Australian workers and Australian employers? Why are we gutting our country? Because the, the primacy of energy has been proven since the start of the Industrial Revolution. Let's move to the science now, because there's been no justification in science for cutting carbon dioxide from human activity. No empirical scientific data, no logical scientific points that prove that, and certainly nowhere that is, proving the that is showing the specific quantified effect of carbon dioxide from human activity. That is the basis of policy. That's the only basis of policy, and you run from it. We agree in some ways because I accept the science has to be basis of policy. You're saying that, but you're not delivering it. You've had many opportunities to give us the science and you won't do it. You've distorted the science, but you finish almost every statement about me with, you'll never, you'll never agree, Senator Roberts. I will agree the moment you provide me with the specific quantified effect of carbon dioxide from human activity on any aspect of climate. I will agree immediately if, after I've assess that, that uh, science. This government, you say, accepts the science of climate change, but you cannot produce it. You've had, many, you've had six, seven years now since I first came into this Senate, and you've never produced it once, and that's because it's not available. How the hell can you have a policy about carbon dioxide from human effect if you can't measure, the, you can't specify the quantity? if you can't then assess alternative ways of, of uh, meeting the targets, if you can't track the progress, how the hell can you have a policy? You're asking the people of Australia to jump off a cliff. How will you know how to continue, how to stop? You talk about peer-reviewed papers. That's not my only gripe. Peer-reviewed is false right now. We know that. The Lancet Journal in Britain, Britain had a, had a peer-reviewed paper that said 50%, up to 50% of peer-reviewed papers are crap. You trust the science, Senator, yet Senator you cannot produce Roberts, it. I just ask you to use language that's parliamentary while you make your points. Thank you. Minister, there's conclusive, overwhelming evidence from two global experiments 
that have overwhelmingly proven that cutting carbon dioxide from human activity can have no effect on the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. In 2009, after the global financial crisis, the world endured a recession everywhere around the world except for, except for Australia because we were rapidly punching out exports to China of coal and iron ore. But the rest of the world suffered a dramatic downturn. That led to the dramatic downturn in the use of, carbon, of hydrocarbon fuels. That led to a reduction, a dramatic reduction in 2009 of the carbon dioxide from human activity. And yet the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere continued increasing. In 2020, we had another severe recession, almost a depression around the world due to government COVID restrictions. And again, we saw the use of hydrocarbon fuels, coal, oil and natural gas plummet as it does in most recessions. That meant the production of carbon dioxide from human activity plummeted. And yet the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere continued increasing without inflection. That shows that twice now, massive cuts in human carbon dioxide output have not resulted in any change in the atmosphere, atmospheric levels of carbon dioxide. In fact, the levels of carbon dioxide have, contributed, have continued. It's pointless to cut carbon dioxide from human activity. Nature shows us. You don't, listen, don't have to listen to you or me. Nature's already shown us that. Nature alone determines the level of carbon dioxide. Humans have no effect. Why are you corrupting the science? You've had unmeasurable assertions. You've got the basis. You've, I've given you the basis for crime in, in these policies, the corruption in these, in these policies overseas, yet you don't blink. What I would like, Minister, is, to you, is for you now to cite the specific location in the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reports, any report, any report from the IPCC that has a specific location, page number, chapter number of the empirical scientific data as evidence within a logical scientific point. In other words, the data within the framework that proves cause and effect. Just give me the page number and the title, please, and the date. Minister. Senator Roberts, just a few weeks ago, the IPCC released its summary for policymakers, and that document um, comes at the end of a cycle of analysis which examines all of the peer reviewed literature and seeks to establish um, the foundation for understanding the uh, impact that human emissions or oh, that human induced emissions of greenhouse gases are having on the climate the impacts of such emissions and the effectiveness of the mitigation strategies and also the effectiveness of adaptation strategies um, that's a vast enterprise um, involving um, many <laughs> many 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 thousands of scientists around the world um, and it involves essentially an assessment of the peer-reviewed literature and an, ass an assigning various conclusions in that literature a degree of confidence based on the extent to which um, the literature either uh, converges or diverges on particular questions. It is an exemplar of a kind of analysis that you call for but don't accept. Um, you know where that document is. I can look it up on the internet and I can uh, provide it to you or you can Google it. Um, but fundamentally, you have already indicated that you don't accept the process of science as it is currently practised. And that's a pretty fundamental stumbling block, isn't it? Because you ask me to provide you science but when I do, you indicate that you don't accept science that's produced by the peer review process. There's not really uh, anywhere we can go. Senator Robertson, a point of order. I've asked the minister for the specific location. Sorry, your point of order? Is, is that the minister is not answering my question. That's, She's dodging it. That's not a point of order, Minister. You have the call. Senator Roberts, there's, a, there's an app that you can get that's called Let Me Google It For You. 
And um, I, I do encourage you to examine the literature produced by the IPCC over many decades, um, because it provides a summary of the many thousands of papers that are available to you should you choose to read them. Um, but Senator Roberts, it, it, it might be that you and I don't agree on the science, and as whilst you hold out the prospect for agreement, I, I, I am more pessimistic. Um, but I do think perhaps we might find more agreement around questions of business. And I know that you have a former association with the mining sector. Um, and I wondered if I could point you to the evidence that was provided by the Minerals Council of Australia um, to the Senate hearing in February. Um, Tanya Constable said, she said this, she said, the mining industry recognises that there is a very big task required to reduce emissions, and we've been on that path for a long time. The minerals industry has signed on to net zero by 2050. We have not been sitting on our hands waiting for policy change. We have been making that change over time. In 2020, the Minerals Council of Australia and its members released our first climate action plan. Since that time, we have reported on an annual rolling basis our activities across the industry. It has been measured and, as I said, it has been recorded. MCA members have around 39 separate activities that go from fuel switching, changing out of current energy sources to new energy sources, autonomous operations, renewable energy, battery storage, digitisation, a whole range of issues on site and in our headquarters. So across all of our operations, that is ongoing and will continue to be ongoing. It is a hard task, but every member is taking action. And when I read um, Ms Constable's evidence, I went and got the report that uh, she referred to, um, the progress report that they published in 2022. And it actually talks a bit about how important this work is. It talks about the fact that it makes a difference, not just here, but internationally, um, because it provides the opportunity for Australian industries to support people all around the globe, millions of people all around the globe, in their journey to decarbonisation. Um, Senator Roberts, the business sector has been calling for certainty around our climate and energy policies. And they've made the point repeatedly that that certainty, the lack of certainty in this regard, was a problem uh, under the previous government. So, uh, for example, um, BP, a company I know you would be familiar with, said this. BP reaffirms its support for reforms to the safeguard mechanism to provide incentives for large emitters to reduce their emissions in support of Australia's emissions reduction targets. We support the goals of the 2015 Paris Agreement on Climate Change and believe ambitious climate policies like the safeguard mechanism reform will be essential to enable the world and Australia to meet these goals. We look forward to working with the government as the reforms are finalised. Um, Rio a similar story. Rio Tinto said, we support the use of a reform safeguard mechanism as part of a suite of policy measures to which incentivise genuine industrial abatement. Origin said, Origin is supportive of developing a policy framework that is consistent with ensuring safeguard facilities deliver a proportionate share of national emissions reduction targets under the Paris Agreement. Woodside said a fair, robust and transparent safeguard mechanism can support a reduction in Australian emissions as well as encourage businesses and industries to further innovate and adopt smarter practices and technologies in line with our collective emissions reduction targets. APIA indeed said that if appropriately designed, the safeguard mechanism can form part of an economy-wide package of measures that encourage low-cost abatement while supporting economic growth. Uh, Senator, The business community understands that they are working in a global environment where their investors and their trading partners expect us to have a plan to reduce our emissions as a country and they expect businesses to have a plan to, remove their, to reduce their emissions. Um, we've talked about it already in this chamber, but 
80 per cent of the facilities covered in the safeguard mechanism have already adopted a net zero target by 2050, uh, or a net zero target of some kind. Some of them actually have one in advance of 2050. Um, these decisions, these changes to business practices, these prospective investments in technology are already factored in to the way that many covered businesses uh, have been thinking about their businesses, their investment plans and their pricing. What the reform we are progressing here today will do is give those businesses certainty, give them a clear understanding about the uh, expectations on, that will be placed on them by government. And I will reiterate that we are not the only entities that place expectations on these businesses. And shareholders increasingly make it clear that the provision of capital is dependent on a clear pathway being established towards decarbonisation. It's one of the reasons that so many of these businesses are already on this path. Senator Dunningham. Thank you, Chair. And um, I'm just uh, quite befuddled at the approach the government's taking to questions being asked by a member of the crossbench. I think that uh, Senator Roberts, who will say things that others will disagree with, should be respected for his views and um, not be talked to in the way that he just has. But I do want to just add something to the record that we had a quote from uh, the minister relating to Appia. I will just put on the record some um, uh, words that their CEO, Samantha McCulloch, uh, put on record as a result of the dodgy deal we've seen done here. New gas supply investments need policy and regulatory certainty, but instead the Labor Greens deal creates additional barriers to investment, further diminishing the investment environment and adding to the growing list of regulatory challenges facing the sector. So I think while cherry-picking quotes that talk up the certainty in the environment and uh, you know, how businesses welcome the opportunity to work with government. We have to look at the hard, cold facts here of what actually is happening, what industry is saying in response to a dodgy deal having been done. And I think uh, rather than misrepresenting the attitude of some of these groups, including Appia, who are very concerned about what's happened here, who haven't been, as far as I'm aware, part of any consultation on the last-minute dodgy deal done between the uh, Greens and the Australian Labor Party. I, you know, I'd love to know whether they were consulted on the way through on the Greens' demands for their agreement to this legislation. Anyway, we'll come to that, I'm sure. Yesterday I did ask a question, and uh, I wonder if overnight the government have gone and uh, checked uh, across their records whether um, they possess this information. The minister has spoken at length about um, the uh, expectation and understanding the government has that many industries, many of those captured facilities, will have in place plans to reduce emissions um, that somehow mirror or match the government's own policies. So I'll ask this same question again. How many of the 215 facilities captured by the safeguard mechanism had existing plans to reduce their emissions by 30 per cent by the year 2030? Minister. Um, Senator Dunning, I answered your question yesterday. Um, you're asking the same question. I don't have anything to add to my previous answer. Um, Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to reflect on a few things today. Um, just the level of frustration my colleagues and I have felt in this place over the last decade under a Liberal government, doing absolutely nothing about climate change. I arrived here in 2012. I arrived here in 2012. I'll get to you. I'll get to you in a minute, Senator Canavan. Uh, order, don't you worry. It's order, not all. It's not order, all just Senator, about me. Order, Senator actually, it's all. Order, actually, what I'm about no, to say is all about order, people like you. Order, Senator Wish Wilson. Please direct your comments through the chair. Chair, Thank I'll you. get to Senator Canavan soon because actually it is all about him and people like him. Um, but I, I, might, I might, if if I could have the respect of the chamber to make my contribution. Order, I, I know why Senator Chair. I know why Senator Canavan is trying to disrupt my 
contribution because it makes him deeply uncomfortable. It makes him deeply uncomfortable. I, I've been in this chamber, as uh, Senator Waters has, for, for, for over a decade. I've witnessed the clean energy package being passed into legislation, considered to be the gold standard in uh, legislation right around the world at the time, a price on carbon, uh, money for renewable energy through the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, money for higher risk uh, investments in research and development and innovation through the Australian Renewable Energy Agency, and so much more. And then we witnessed the Liberal National Party getting into government, using three-word slogans and shamelessly tearing up climate action. The, only, the period that we had the clean energy package in place is the only time emissions in this country have gone down. And it is also a source of frustration to myself and my colleagues that that great work the Greens did with the Gillard government seems to have been written out of history, both by the Labor Party and the mainstream media, totally forgotten in discussions in the lead-up to this uh, so-called safeguard mechanism debate uh, that we're having here today. And, of course, it's also frustrating that the legislation, after nine years of the Greens carrying the torch in this place for climate action and for future generations, that what we get, what we get is actually LNP Liberal Party legislation. First, first brought in by Tony Abbott, a, a climate denier, then perfected by Mr Angus Taylor from the other place. You'd also have to say a climate sceptic. Uh, and, and, and Scott Morrison, Mr Scott Morrison in, in the other place. And I swear I heard Senator Wong in the chamber just a few weeks ago in question time goading you guys for not supporting the legislation, because it's yours. In fact, she even said that the changes the Labor Party were hoping to bring in in the unamended, the unamended safeguard mechanism were signed off by your party room. How frickin' cynical is that? How cynical it is that, that the legislation the Labor Party was bringing to Parliament is actually your legislation? Order. The Australian people need to know that you can't even vote for your own crappy legislation because it's all about being in opposition, isn't it? It's all about saying no to everything. And then, Senator Dunham, you had the cheek to stand up in here and point to children. In, you had cheek to you, Chair, to point to children in the gallery and say that this legislation that is some kind of climate action is not good government. Order. How Order, outrageous. Senator Wish Wilson. I have Senator Dunham on his feet. Point of order is misleading the Senator. I didn't actually say that. I said this is bad process and a dodgy deal, and you know it. Okay, thank you for that, Senator Dunham. Senator Wish Wilson, point you of have order, the call. Senator Dunham, but I've obviously, obviously hit a raw nerve there. Um, Chair, this, the fact that this Liberal Party is in opposition is a good thing. Like, for anybody who wants action on climate change, this is a good thing. Uh, and I'm proud of my political party for getting amendments to this legislation that have improved it and has made it a lot more difficult for fossil fuel projects to proceed, because that is what the science tells us we need to do. That is what the IPCC report, which coincidentally landed last week, told us we need to do. That is what the Conservative International Energy Agency tells us we need to do. But I want to be really clear about this. This legislation we're going to pass today is not enough. It is nowhere near enough. The fight must go on. If we're going to stop new fossil fuel projects going ahead, we need to let the Labor government know at every turn that this is not acceptable. Um, and I wanted to uh, put on record today that yesterday in the parliament, in fact they've been here for three days, uh, are an alliance of ocean groups from around the country uh, who have been having many meetings with MPs calling for an end to all fossil fuel exploration in our oceans, calling for an end to the endless acreage releases 
that these fossil fuel companies get given by respective governments every year. I remember when Mr Scott Morrison phoned in from climate negotiations in Paris just three years ago. Phoned in from Senator, have some Order. respect in this chamber. I know, I know it doesn't suit your political, your political charades to let me finish Order, my contribution. Senators, You're probably squirming in your chair over there, Senator Canavan, but let me, let me continue. Mate, you're always laughing when we talk about climate action and, and the importance of this to future generations. Um, Mr Scott Morrison phoned in from a climate conference in Paris to deliver to the APIA conference in Western Australia at the time, by video link, 80,000 square kilometres of new ocean for oil and gas companies to go out there and explore. But you know what? It wasn't just the LNP chair. Um, last year, the Labor government, Labor government handed 46,000 square kilometres of oceans to oil and gas companies to go and explore as well. And while this Ocean Alliance was here yesterday, um, Zali Stegall and the other place tried to suspend standing orders to bring on a bill to ban the PEP11 project, which the LNP stopped. And we know they stopped because Scott Morrison used secret powers to stop it. That's how important the Prime Minister felt stopping an oil and gas project was because he knew it was political poison for the LNP in the last federal election. It's also, by the way, the only fossil fuel project that Anthony Albanese, our Prime Minister in the other place, has publicly opposed. And at the same time that we're negotiating the passage of this legislation in the parliament, Minister King, the Resources Minister, in the other place yesterday was talking up the future of fossil fuels in this country, talking up that she wanted to see exponential growth of oil and gas and coal in this country. So that's where the Labor Party are at. That's where the Labor Party are at, and I hope that it's noted by the Australian people. Well, I would just wanted to get on record today to thank so much the communities around this country, uh, like off King Island uh, in uh, Tasmania, off the Otways, off Western Australia, off the New South Wales coast, off South Australia and the Great Australian Bight, who are fighting to stop fossil fuel exploration. In particular, uh, Drew McPherson from the Surfrider Foundation, uh, Kate Coxall from the Surfrider Foundation, uh, Lisa Deppler from Otway Climate Action Network, uh, called Ocean, Uncle Rob Bundle from the Southern Ocean Protection Embassy Collective, SOPEC, uh, Freya Leonard from Friends of the Earth, uh, Belinda Hayden from Friends of the Earth, and uh, Craig Garland, who is well known to uh, Senator Dunham, uh, a Tasmanian fisherman who's a lot more than that, who's been an absolute champion uh, for our oceans uh, in Tasmania and elsewhere. People, people know when they're being conned. And this community alliance were in here yesterday lobbying to try and stop new oil and gas projects. By coincidence, here the week we we're going to pass the safeguard legislation the week after the IPCC report landed, and they got to see Madeleine King, Minister King in the other place talking up how Labor want to see more fossil fuel development, more gas development. So I just wanted to make it really clear today the Greens have done a really good job in really difficult conditions with this legislation to get some kind of improvement to it that will make a difference, but it will not be enough. And I call on all environment groups around the country, all communities, anyone who cares about the future of climate and climate action, to hit the streets and let this government know that every single fossil fuel project they approve is not acceptable. And then at the next election, vote for the Greens and crossbench MPs who do care about this. And at the next election, we can get the balance of power in both houses and we will stop new fossil fuel development across the board. That's my message today, uh, Chair, uh, and I look forward to listening to the contributions now of other senators in the chamber in silence and with respect. Thank you, Senator Wish. Wilson. Minister, you have precedence. Uh, it, it, look, it, it, it just perhaps in brief to respond to a couple of the contributions, uh, two things. Um, Senator Wish Wilson, uh, as you know, we were appreciative of the willingness of the crossbench, including the Australian Greens, to work with us on sensible amendments to our reforms. And we have the view that the reform package that we're bringing before the parliament um, will make an important change um, 
it will be important for Australian businesses and it will be important for the Australian climate. Um, we don't agree with you, as you know. Uh, we didn't agree and we continue to disagree on the question about whether or not uh, new coal and gas facilities should be banned, but nonetheless we do appreciate your willingness to engage constructively with us. Uh, and again, I reiterate an invitation that's really been on the table since we formed government, which is that we are willing to work with all willing partners. Uh, and it is a shame that the opposition chose to deal themselves out of this discussion, as they have on so many other questions that are before the parliament. And I just wanted to provide some additional information to Senator Roberts. Um, Senator Roberts had asked me a, a, a quite a number of about quite a number of matters uh, in particular at one point was asking me about implementation of the Chubb review or at least some of the findings of the Chubb review I wanted to add that in addition to seeking advice on revoking the avoided deforestation method um, the minister has now actually revoked the method and that wasn't clear in my remarks before Senator Dunian. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to go. I, we attempted yesterday to get some information relating to the impact on specific facilities, uh, and I don't accept that uh, the government who is foisting this upon the Australian community and the economy can sit here and say, I will not talk about specific facilities because the impact is important. I want to turn to V-Line, which is a public transport provider in the state of Victoria. I understand a captured facility. Uh, which, of course, will be required to reduce its emissions by 4.9 per cent. How much will it cost for V-Line to meet the government's emissions target? Has any work been done, any consultation, any communication? I'd be grateful to know. Minister. Well, I'll seek advice, Senator Dunningham, but there are 215 um, covered facilities and, in fact, I'm not in a position to provide detailed information about each one of those businesses. Senator Dunningham. Thank you. Look, I find it just absolutely astounding that here we are. There's been a huge amount of consultation, in-depth, genuine, good faith consultation with industry, with all state and territory governments, etc., etc., the crossbench. And we can't talk about the impact that what we knew was coming before this parliament by way of legislation mandating emissions reductions has on 215 facilities. You refused again to answer whether any of the 215 facilities captured by the safeguard mechanism had existing plans to reduce their emissions by 30 per cent by the year 2030. It was a question asked yesterday. You said perhaps the department would be in possession of the information. You today said you have nothing further to add. I can only assume the government hasn't even gone and checked with these 215 facilities. So then you don't have any information on that first question. You don't have any information on what V Line is going, whether, how much it will cost V Line to meet the government's mandated um, emissions reductions targets. You therefore, I suspect, won't be able to tell me how much more Victorian pas passengers are going to have to pay by way of fares to meet the costs associated with this safeguard mechanism. So we'll skip over asking that question. We can just take it as uh, at face value that they'll be paying more as a result of this. So. Let the record show that's what's going to happen. Um, do we know at all how much it will cost V-Line uh, to convert from diesel locomotives to electric as a measure to meet the emissions reductions baseline that this uh, legislation is going to um, establish? How many batteries are going to be required, for example? I would hope uh, the government have gone and done some work with V-Line, a massive uh, contributor to public transport in the state of Victoria. Um, and of course, as well, uh, AEMO having warned the state of Victoria uh, and the government that Victoria could face electricity rationing or blackouts in the coming years due to the government's mismanagement of uh, the grid. How much electricity in megawatt hours is going to be required to power electric locomotives in Victoria if they choose to try and comply with the uh, enforced baselines under the safeguard mechanism? Minister. Senator, Can uh, Senator Dunham, um, the purpose of consultation is to establish a framework for good policy. It is not to take responsibility or seek to otherwise manage the business decisions of individual entities. Uh, so, yes, the government, of course, has sought to consult as widely as possible. 
Uh, we've been through it before, but uh, we released a public consultation on the safeguard reforms in August and an exposure draft of the bill last October. The department has met with environment groups, with covered facilities, with industry bodies, with government agencies, with carbon market participants, other industrial businesses and other interested parties. I can seek information about the, whether or not V-Line elected to participate in that. I don't have that information with me at the moment. Um, but over 240 stakeholders made submissions on the safeguard consultation paper and over 50 made submissions on the draft bill. Many of those stakeholders um, said that they support the government taking action to deliver on our climate targets and to support reforms to the safeguard mechanism to reduce emissions from the industrial sector. Um, the government released details of the full proposed reforms to the safeguard mechanism in January for consultation. Uh, we talked about this last night. That included um, draft rules which contained quite a lot of detail um, because, as you observe, uh, whilst this bill creates the architecture for the reforms, um, for reasons that I've explained this morning to Senator Roberts, the, uh, many of the decisions are necessarily and appropriately contained in subordinate legislation and it was appropriate that the draft rules be put out for consultation as well. Consultation closed on the 24th of February 2023 and again more than 250 submissions were received. Um, and so the bill before us incorporates a number of the stakeholder suggestions from that period. A new objective has been added to the National Greenhouse Energy and Reporting Act 2007 to ensure that the net emissions of safeguard mechanism facilities must decline overall. It requires that the minister must be satisfied with any new safeguard rules, uh, that any new safeguard rules are consistent with this objective and it strengthens the compliance regime. Penalties for exceeding baselines will reflect the amount of exceedance and uh, may require that businesses make good by surrendering credits to meet their baseline. There's also an anti-avoidance provision commencing from the date of introduction that will prevent businesses structuring themselves in a way to avoid obligations under the reforms. Um, Senator Daniam, we have had, I think, a, a healthy conversation in the Senate. I've sought to answer your questions, um, but I, I, I really am not in a position to talk or speculate about the individual business decisions that will be taken by individual entities that are covered by this mechanism. Senator Dunningham. Oh, Chair, look, I find it absolutely astounding that with only 215 captured facilities, with months of consultation, and a government claiming to be interested in issues like the cost of living, driving down power prices, not offshoring jobs, making sure that legislation actually works. I find it beyond astounding that the minister can't tell me, in a general sense, how many of the 215 facilities—we're not talking about millions of entities here. We're not talking about tens of thousands. We're not even talking about thousands. We're talking about 215 specific facilities that the government haven't gone to seek to understand the material impact of these laws and then, in addition to the laws that were put on the table, the amendments that were made as part of the dodgy deal between Labor and the Greens, what impact all of those changes would have. So I just don't find it acceptable, as we are hurtling toward being forced to vote on this legislation, that we can't be told whether every single punter in Victoria that uses V-Line to get to work to go to visit their parents in aged care or whatever they might be doing, whether they're going to be paying more to catch a train because of the safeguard. You don't know. You don't know where these entities are at, yet you want us to vote. And the Greens are content, having scored their deal to support this and wave it through. You can't tell us about V-Line. You can't answer general questions about the 215 facilities uh, and where they were at with 30 by 30. Let's move to um, a couple of other specifics. Hopefully there will be some advice forthcoming. Um, so Orizon have three facilities listed under the safeguard mechanism and Pacific National have one. 
And in the uh, Australian Financial Review today, and I'm sure uh, if you're not aware of the article, others that are supporting you will be or will take this time to uh, familiarise themselves with this reporting. Uh, that Pacific National will invest hundreds of millions of dollars over the next five years to reduce emissions. It will uh, have to spend a further $12 million a year by the year 2030 on offsets to avoid being penalised under the government's uh, changed safeguard mechanism. Um, according to this article, the extra costs that are going to be imposed on rail freight will be passed on to the customer. So again, back to the point that we are not talking about millions of facilities here with some sort of blanket coverage and it, it's all very nebulous and hard to quantify. We're talking about 215 specific facilities. Can you tell me, Minister, as we hurtle towards a guillotine that Labor and the Greens have agreed should be in place to um, have this economy changing, economy destroying legislation brought into place, what are the extra costs that are going to be imposed on Australian consumers who utilise these services? Um, does the government, does the minister agree that transporting freight by rail produces less emissions than moving goods uh, by heavy trucks on the road network? Um, and perhaps you could also tell us whether uh, any modelling has been done around the extra emissions that will be generated through uh, the use of road transport to transport goods um, as opposed to rail transport, noting that uh, this is all about driving down emissions. <laughs> I argue it's about driving up power prices and driving emissions offshore, in this case it seems, based on the information being provided by rail freight companies. Uh, it's about driving up emissions here because we'll be putting goods on trucks, chances are not covered by this mechanism, uh, and there'll be more carbon emissions because people be, will not be able to put goods on trains. So let's start with them. Let's see how we go. I hazard a guess we won't get an answer, but I'll get some rhetoric, some Labor talking points, and, uh, and then we'll go to the next question. Minister. Senator Dunningham, I understand that the coalition policy position was once that Australia should reach net zero by 2050. Uh, it's unclear to me whether that is still the position. I, th I think it is. Can anyone tell me it's not? Can anyone tell me it's not? No idea. We don't know? Sure. Uh, Senator Dunningham. Uh, thank you. At the invitation of the minister, I will indicate that the coalition have a proud record of uh, dealing with these issues. We don't believe in taxing the life out of the Australian economy. We don't believe in shutting down businesses to achieve some ideological outcome. We don't believe in doing dodgy deals with the Australian Greens. No, so that's the difference between the government and the opposition. Now, the government are the government today because they conned the people of Australia into voting for them. That's why they're there because they promised the people of Australia they were going to reduce power bills by $275 for everyone. You know what? That promise made 97 times, of course, is now not one they're going to stick to. It's one they won't even mention. So the minister asks me what our position is. We care about the environment. We care about carbon emissions and dealing with them, but we're not going to tax the life out of the economy just to offshore our emissions. When it becomes unaffordable to do business here, when it becomes unaffordable to uh, manufacture cement, aluminium, steel, you know what? You know what they're going to do? They're going to start doing it overseas. They're not going to do it here, and they're going to be doing it in countries where they don't give a damn about the environment, where they don't have a mechanism like the one we're doing. This is what companies will sadly do. And so when we push the emissions out of our backyard so we can't see them, we can all feel good about our lattes on a Saturday morning, you know what we're also doing? We're sending jobs offshore from places like Georgetown in Tasmania, where smelters are going to be impacted by this. Norske Skug in the Derwent Valley, the only print mill, newsprint mill in Australia, captured by this. Now, that's the difference between us and you. We do not want to destroy the economy on the altar of Labor Green ideology. So you want to talk about our policies? We stand with consumers. We stand with households. We stand with businesses, not Labor talking points. Minister. Uh, thanks, Senator Dunningham. I note you didn't make any reference to net zero by 2050, and I'm still unclear about whether or not that's a policy that is part of your suite of policies. Senator Dunningham. Yes, it is. But 
we won't be doing it by destroying the economy. Now, if you want to talk about coalition positions because you can't answer questions about the impact of labour policy, labour legislation, we don't know how many of the 215 facilities are going to uh, be able to comply with this baseline without shedding a single job. I note no promise has been given about that. I'd love to know whether the government commits to there being not one job lost out of these 215 facilities. I'll guarantee you that I'll get an answer about extensive consultation. Mm. Working collaboratively with a very willing crossbench, very willing very indeed. Willing. Um, but there will be no promise given because uh, we can't speak about specific entities. We can't speak about specific facilities. We can't speak about Australian jobs because you know what? This is not the priority of this legislation. This is not the focus. It is a siloed, uh, myopic approach to dealing with something that they're doing a deal with the Greens on but with no regard for the impact on the economy. And the perverse outcome here in dealing with this issue this way is that not only are you not going to get the environmental outcomes you promised Australians, you're going to get worse environmental outcomes. It's all going to go offshore to countries, as I said before, where they don't care about the environment. So our global responsibility as global leaders, as responsible citizens on this planet, we, that, that is all just talk. It isn't reality, according to this government. We're going to have bad economic outcomes. So, Minister, look, uh, we remain committed to our policy on net zero, but let me tell you, I expect an answer. I expect a guarantee today that not one job will be lost because of your safeguard mechanism and the deal you've done with this mob down here, the Australian Greens. Minister. Oh, I do appreciate it. It took a while, but we got there. Um, it's an intriguing. Oh, well, Senator Daniel Mew offered it was a rhetorical question. I do accept that you don't have to answer my questions in this forum. I accept that's not how it works, but you chose to. And I was interested to hear that net zero remains your policy. But the issue was that your implementation arrangements were catastrophic in government. Uh, you didn't land an energy policy. 22 different energy policies, none of them landed. And what did business say about that? What did they say about it? Well, the Energy Supply Association said this about your government. The current uncertainty itself will drive up prices. Banks have put away their checkbook on energy projects. Policy uncertainty has rendered electricity generation projects unbankable. Unbankable. That cost has been masked because lower demand has meant we haven't needed new projects, but when new assets are needed, that risk premium will be there and it will push up prices. That's what the Energy Supply Association of Australia said. They the suppliers. What did the users say? They said there was a dysfunctional political environment dysfunctional, that had dramatically increased the risk associated with investment. And it is why, prior to us forming a government and since, organisations have lined up to call for clarity around how the safeguard mechanism could be improved to give certainty to covered facilities. Because Senator Daniam, in all of the in all of the contributions you've made, you've given no indication about whether or not you think that reform of any kind is necessary. It appears that you think the status quo is fine. And that is what the only thing that we conclude from your engagement or your failure to engage with the policy process that's been undertaken over the last eight months. It's the only thing we can conclude. One of your front benches went on television and said that you're the opposition and you don't have policies, and I suppose that that is true. I suppose that is true in relation to climate and energy. It was certainly true when you're in government, and it caused the problems that we've been discussing this morning and that we'll um, continue to have to deal with on behalf of the Australian people from government. Um, business 
is looking for us to implement these reforms. And it's a reality that you have failed to engage with over the course of the debate. The AI group talked about the approach. The treatment of new facilities appears to strike a workable balance, a workable balance, providing pro pathways for new projects that stack up to go ahead without adding to burdens on existing facilities or threatening national emissions goals. And they essentially confirmed those groups, uh, those views, uh, earlier this week, um, in response to the remarks made by Minister Bowen. The, there is a need for reform, and the government would have happily engaged with the opposition had the opposition been willing to do so. We made it clear that we would work with anyone across the government, um, across the parliament, who was willing to engage, but regrettably you chose not to do so. And that will be for you to explain. Um, Order. The decisions taken by individual businesses in response to the revisions to the, the, the revised approach to the safeguard mechanism will depend on the specific circumstances of those businesses. And as we've canvassed already, the design of the mechanism includes a whole range of flexibilities so that businesses can choose the least cost pathway for compliance. There are options, of course, for businesses to reduce their emissions on site. There are options for businesses to, that choose to make those investments um, to generate credits that may be sold if such an investment reduces their emissions below their allocated baseline. There are options for businesses to borrow credits from the future if they plan to make an investment at a future point. There are options for businesses to purchase accus from the market. These are features of the design, designed to provide business with flexibility, and they are a consequence of the consultation undertaken with business over the eight-month period that we've described. But they necessarily mean that government can't prescriptively say how an individual business will respond, that will be for an individual business to decide, and they will make their best judgments based on their assessment of the technology, their assessment of their operating environment, their, invest their assessment of their investor appetite. The question you're asking is a question for business, but we have consulted with them and engaged with them about the mechanism um, because we want to deeply understand what they think provides the necessary flexibility for them to be on the path to net zero. And as we've pointed out, there are costs and consequences for the Australian economy and for businesses if we don't get on this pathway. They arise from uncertainty. They arise from the response from the international community. They arise from responses uh, that might be made by our trading partners. They arise from decisions that might be made by investors. All of the information before us suggests that it is important that we make clear how we are going to achieve our targets. And it's why the BCA said that Australia needs a credible, durable framework to reach its climate targets and grow the economy. A credible, durable framework. It's why the investor group on climate change said the reforms will help unlock investment in the new and existing industries that will maximise Australia's competitive advantages in a net zero world. They also said this, the willingness of a diverse range to work together provides investors with greater clarity they require to deploy the billions of dollars that Australia needs to reach net zero by 2050. It's important, isn't it, because these reforms will help to unlock investment in the new and existing industries that will maximise our competitive advantage. And I don't know why the opposition wasn't interested in a conversation about how to do that, because our stakeholders wanted it, your business stakeholders wanted it, 
but it wasn't a conversation you wanted to be part of. Senator Dunningham. Thank you, Chair. Um, look, uh, uh, Chair, thank you. And I appreciate the opportunity to uh, respond to that. I mean, look, this false claim that there was an invitation to sit down and work through bad policy, I've said it already in this debate, you can't improve the unimprovable. Uh, and we said before the last election that it was all about technology, not oh, yeah. taxes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That the best way to work with yeah. the big emitters, yeah. the 215 facilities caught under the safeguard mechanism, was to work with them to incentivise investment in R&D, technology, to find ways to minimise their emissions. That is a good way to go. The minister herself has said through this debate that a number of entities caught under the safeguard mechanism had in place plans to meet targets. That's an acknowledgement that working with them to incentivise in R&D, investments in R&D and better ways to do what they do to minimise the impact on the environment, namely reduce carbon emissions, is a good way to do it. Taxing the life out of business is not a good way to do it. And I've run through uh, the impacts that that will have. I note in answer to my question, which was, can the government guarantee that not a single job will be lost as a result of taxing the life out of these entities caught under the safeguard mechanism? No guarantee was given. So Australia, in addition to not knowing how much more train tickets are going to cost in Victoria, uh, in addition to not knowing how much higher power prices are going to be, in addition to not knowing whether uh, cement manufacturing is going to be a viable industry in this country, we don't know whether people are going to lose their jobs over this, but I have a hunch, a little suspicion, that they will. Mm. That we are going to make ourselves uncompetitive through this bloody-minded approach to driving down emissions through tax, not technology, working against business, not with them. All of the quotes that the minister has read out talk about businesses being willing to work with government. I'm not so sure the feelings they have today about this brave new world we live in, where Labor and the Greens collude in a smoke-filled back room of this parliament to cook up schemes that are going to be disastrous for business, disastrous for jobs and, in fact, also bad for the environment. Bizarrely, more trucks on the road, less trains on the tracks, power prices going up and, of course, globally. As I said before, we have this global responsibility. Uh, to uh, countries across this world to help them reduce their emissions. It's something this government have talked about a lot, but instead what we're doing is we're sending our emissions over to those countries to get in the products that we depend on. I don't understand why this government thinks that this is a good way to go. Now, you know, I, I appreciate this repeated invitation for us to be a part of the solution and to work with this government. But I tell you what, when the baseline, the red line issue for this government is, well, you can come and work with us, provided you agree with taxing business more. We promised at the last election that there would be no taxes of this nature being brought in. You didn't. You did also promise that power prices would go down. $275 a pop was promised. I note no reference to that anywhere in this debate, apart from coalition senators and uh, those who have made contributions to this debate highlighted them. In fact, I uh, take the interjection from Senator Brockman, which was it's a number the government can't now say, except when it comes to a tax. Eerily enough, that promised power price reduction, $275, has materialised as the amount of tax businesses are going to have to pay per tonne of carbon emissions over the baseline. $275. So not only did they dub the Australian people by making a false promise, a promise they knew they couldn't keep and had no intention of keeping on election day, as evidenced by the fact that not one, not one Labor member, not one Labor senator has said in this building, on TV, in the papers, that it remains their promise. And I invite the minister to, at some point before one o'clock today, before the guillotine comes down on this debate, on this horrendous piece of legislation where the Labor Green Deal will be voted on, this brave new world of backroom deals where we'll have consultation and collaboration. If you agree with us, not if you don't, we'll freeze you out and you can just suck up the consequences. The minister also talked about those costs and consequences of uh, not acting. 
with no reference to the costs and consequences of doing what this bill will do. Mm. No modelling, or if there is, we're not allowed to see it. Right, we don't know of the 215 facilities captured under this legislation how they'll be impacted. As I said before, yeah. it is not yeah, beyond uh, expectation to be able to yeah. uh, go out to 215 facilities yeah. and say, hey, if we do this, if we impose on you a 4.9 per cent uh, per annum reduction in emissions reductions, how will it affect you? They haven't even done that. We don't know what the impact will be. How many jobs lost? Many. Power prices going up? Guaranteed. Order, and you know what? Senator it's the beginning, Daniel. not the end. Order. As it is 11.15 am, the committee will report to the Senate. <laughs> As it is 11.15, the committee will report to the Senate. Uh, we will now move to notices of motion. Oh, hang on. I've got it. And I believe, Senator White, you're seeking the call. Thanks, President. Uh, pursuant to notice given on the 29th of March 2023 on behalf of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegate gated legislation. I withdraw business of the Senate notice of motion number one for the next sitting day, proposing the disallowance of the telecommunications amendment disclosure of information for purpose of cyber security regulations 2022 and business of the Senate notice of motion number one for four sitting days after today, proposing the disallowance of the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission amendment code of conduct and banning orders rules at 2022. Thank you, Senator White. Is there a report from the Selection of Bills Committee? I believe there is a report from the Selection of Bills Committee. Senator Urquhart. My paperwork in order for the next session. Uh, I present the fourth report of the 2023 of the Selection of Bills Committee, and I seek leave to have the report incorporated in Hank's heart. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank I you, move Senator. that the report be adopted. So the the question is that the selection of bills uh, report is Senator McKim. Uh, thanks, President. I understood that there may be there's been an amendment circulated from the minister. I understood that too, mm. Senator McKim, and I just, waited and no one jumped, I'm just so I moved on. Oh, my happy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Senator McKim. Uh, Senator Chisholm. Um, I seek to move the following amendment. I At the end of the motion, add and the National Security Legislation Amendment, uh, Comprehensive yes. Review and Other Measures No. 2 Bill 2023, not be referred to a committee. Uh, Senator Shoebridge. Oh, thank you, President. Um, the Greens oppose this S amendment by the government. Uh, we, we believe firmly that legislation such, such as this, legislation which deals with core aspects of our national security legislation, um, need to have public scrutiny. National security laws and outcomes are far too important for them to be signed off in a private deal between the government and the opposition. Um, too, much of that, too much of that work in this space is done secretly. It's not the subject of debate. It's Order. not the subject of debate. Order. And I know not the rabbiting Order. over there of the coalition. We have had a day uh, and Senator a half debate. A day Senator and a half debate. Uh, Senator Shoebridge, resume your seat. Thank you. Order on my left. If you wish to make a contribution, seek the call. Senator Shoebridge. Thank, thank you, President. Um, um, we have had days of public scrutiny of the safeguard mechanism, but when it comes to when it comes to national security. When it comes to national security, the, the faux concerns of the coalition about public scrutiny just all disappear. They all get put into a, a dark, smoke-filled room somewhere at the back of ASIO, and it all just gets quietly put, 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 put to bed. And, and they, they've got form on this, the major parties. They've got form on this. And, and no doubt we're going to see yet more efforts of secrecy involving AUKUS. 
we are likely to see the major parties coming together again and to try and put defence expenditure and the submarines review of the nuclear submarine program under another cloak of duopoly secrecy, where the so-called parties of government, Order. which is some sort of cooked up non-constitutional um, rubbish that they bring forward to this place, the so-called parties of government can cut their secret deals on nuclear submarines, on defence expenditure, on secret powers, on more powers to ASIO, more, more covert surveillance of Australians. You know, you name a toxic increase in the surveillance state, and the coalition and the government are on board, pushing it through without public scrutiny. And that's what they're trying to do here. Order that's what they're trying it. to do here. So, President, that's why we oppose the government's amendment. Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. So the question is, the amendment is moved by Senator Chisholm be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. Division required? Ring the bells for four minutes.
Yes. I know, I am too. Lock the doors. So the question is that the amendment to the Selection of Bills Committee report as moved by Senator Chisholm be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator McKim as teller for the noes. Senator McKim. There being 27 ayes and 17 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I now intend to put the amended Selection of Bills Committee report. So the question is that the, the Selection of Bills Committee report as amended, moved by Senator Urquhart, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. I now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Senator Chisholm. I move that general business notice of motion number 211 be considered during general business today. So the question is that the motion as moved by Senator Chisholm be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. I now move to business of. Oh, did I skip you out? Oh, beg your pardon. Uh, is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? I call the clerk. President, uh, there have been no postponement notifications lodged, but committees have lodged extension notifications as shown at item seven of today's order of business. Okay. I now move to business of the Senate number one, standing in the name of Senators Mackenzie and Rustin. Is that se Senator Mackenzie? I ask the business of the Senate notice of motion one be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Rustin. I move the motion uh, standing Mackenzie, in mine sorry. and Senator Rustin's name. It's been a big week. Uh, Thank you. So the question is that business of the Senate notice of motion number one, standing in the name of Senator Mackenzie and Rustin, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. I now move to business of the Senate number two, standing in the name of Senator David Pocock and Senator Lambie. Senator Pocock. Thank you, President. I seek leave to amend uh, business of the Senate. Notice of motion number two relating to a referral um, relating to a committee referral. Is uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted, Senator Poker. I amend the motion in the term circulated in the chamber and ask that it be taken as a formal motion. So the question is that the amendment as moved by Senator David Pocock be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Senator Pocock. I move the motion as amended. So the question is that business of the Senate number two, standing in the name of Senator David Pocock and Lambie, as amended, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. 
We we'll now move to business of the Senate number three, standing in the name of Senator Colbeck. Is that you, Senator Askew? Yes. On behalf Senator of Senator, Senator Colbeck, I ask that business of the Senate notice of motion number three be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, of course, Senator Askew. I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number th business of the Senate number three, um, as moved by Senator Askew, standing in the name of Senator Colbeck, be agreed to. Those with that opinion say aye. Against, I believe. I uh, believe the ayes have it, noes have it, division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
lock the doors. So the question is, business of the Senate number three, standing in the name of Senator Colbeck, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Hmm. Order, there being 29 ayes and 32 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I now move to government business number one, standing in the name of Senator Gallagher. Senator Chisholm. Order. I ask that government business notice of motion number one relating to the hours of meeting and routine of business for budget week be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Chisholm. I move the motion. So the question is that uh, government business number one, standing in the name of Senator Gallagher and moved by Senator Chisholm, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I now move to general business notice of motion number 197, standing in the name of Senator Rice. Thank you, President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 197, proposing the introduction of a bill, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Rice. I move that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to establish the Anti-Poverty Commission and for related purposes. Uh, so the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Rice to be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Rice. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Rice to be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to establish the Anti-Poverty Commission and for related purposes. Senator Rice. I move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Rice. I table an explanatory memorandum and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into Hansard and to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Rice. I now move to general business notice of motion number 218, standing in the name of Senator Roberts. I seek leave to amend general business notice of motion number 218 relating to an order for the production of documents. Uh, is uh, leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Thank you, President. I amend the motion in the terms circulated in the chamber and ask that it be taken as formal. So the question is the motion. Is there any objection to it being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Roberts. Thank you. I move the motion as amended. So the question, 
is that the motion as amended by Senator Roberts, 218, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. Uh, I believe the noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 218, standing in the name of Senator Roberts, be agreed as amended, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, those to the left. I appoint Senator Roberts as teller for the ayes and Senator Askew as teller for the noes. <laughs> Senator Colbeck, you should have been seated already. Order. There being five ayes and 45 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative.
I now move to General Business Notice of Motion No. 219, standing in name of Senator Steelejohn. Are you seeking the call, Senator Pocock? Yes, please, um, Apologies, I, I was talking and didn't move. Please could it, a, a note just be made that I do support Senator Roberts' motion. Apologies okay. for that. Uh, yes, thank you, Senator Pocock. Senator Steelejohn. Thank you, President. I ask that uh, general business notice of motion number 219 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Steelejohn. I move the motion. So the question is that general business. Oh, beg your pardon, Senator Chisholm. Seek leave seeking to leave. Make a short statement. Uh, leave is granted for one minute. The yep. document sought is the subject of an application under the Freedom of Information Act. On the basis of damage to international relations and that certain information was communicated in confidence by a foreign government, a Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade decision maker found that some of the information in the document was exempt from release in accordance with provisions under the Act. The Administrative Appeals Tribunal is reviewing the Department's decision and, would, and it would be inappropriate to comment on matters before the Tribunal. Given this matter is still before the tribunal, the motion should not be supported by the Senate. So the question is that General Business knows of motion number 219, standing in the name of Senator Steelejohn, um, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 219, standing in the name of Senator Steele, John, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McKim as teller for the ayes and Senator Askew as teller for the noes.
order, there being 15 ayes and 32 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I now move to uh, general business, notice of motion number 220, standing in the name of Senator Brockman. Senator Askey. On behalf of Senator Brockman, I ask that general business notice of motion number 220 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Askew. I move the motion. So the, uh, Senator Chisholm. Seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? I believe leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. Senator the government Chisholm. will be opposing this motion. Material of the nature requested by Senator Brockman constitutes legal advice. Governments have a long-established practice of not disclosing such advice. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 220 standing in the name of Senator Brockman and moved by Senator Askew be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. And the noes have it. I only heard one voice. Uh, division required? Yes. Ring the bells for... Four minutes.
lock the doors. So the question is that general business, notice of motion number 220, standing in the name of Senator Brockman, is moved by Senator Askew, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the, to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order. There being 29 ayes and 32 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I now move to general business notice of motion number 222, standing in the name of Senator Birmingham. 222. 222. So I don't. Are you doing that, Senator Askew? Senator Askew. <laughs> On behalf of Senator, oh, beg your pardon, um, Senator Askew, just please resume your seat. Yeah, my mistake, Senator Shoebridge. Um, yes, please, we'll go to you. Oh, thanks, thanks, President. I ask that general business notice motion number two two one be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Shoebridge. I move the motion. So the question, uh, Senator Chisholm. Seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. The government does not support this motion. The government has complied with the Senate order. The public interest immunity claim made in respect to some material excluded from the return was made in accordance with long-standing and accepted Senate practice. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 221, standing in the name of Senator Shoebridge, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the uh, ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. One minute.
Lock the doors. So the question is that General Business Notice of Motion Number 221, standing in the name of Senator Shoebridge, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order. There being 39 ayes and 18 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. We will now move to general business notice of motion number 222, standing in the name of Senator Birmingham. Try Senator again. Askew. On behalf of Senator Birmingham, I ask that general business notice of motion number 222 be taken as a formal motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 222, standing in the name of Senator Birmingham and moved by Senator Askew, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. Uh, I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, committee memberships. The President has received letters requesting changes in memberships of committees. I call the Minister, Senator Chisholm. I seek leave to move a motion to vary the membership of committees. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Minister. I move that Senators be discharged from and appointed to committees as set out in the document available in the Chamber and listed on the dynamic red. So the question is, the motion is moved by the Minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Are there any messages? Many messages. Many messages. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence Custom Tariff Amendment, Incorporation of Proposals Bill 2023, Health Insurance Amendment, Prescribed Dental Patients and Other Measures Bill 2023. Special Recreational Vessels Amendment Bill 2023, Treasury Laws Amendment Refining and Improving Our Tax System Bill 2023, and Veterans Affairs Legislation Amendment Miscellaneous Measures Bill 2023. I call the Minister. I move that these bills may proceed without formalities, may be taken together and now be read a first time. So the question is the motion is moved by the Minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. 
Ms Tariff Amendment Incorporation of Proposals Bill 2023, Health Insurance Amendment Prescribed Dental Patients and Other Measures Bill 2023, Special Recreational Vessels Amendment Bill 2023, Treasury Laws Amendment Refining and Improving Our Tax System Bill 2023, Veterans Affairs Legislation Amendment Miscellaneous Measures Bill 2023. Minister. I move that these bills be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansa. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Oh, in accordance with Standing Order 111, further consideration of these bills is now adjourned to the 9th of May 2023. Minister. I move that the bills be listed in separate orders of the day. So the question is, the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. The president has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Social Security Administration Amendment Income Management Reform Bill of 2023 for concurrence. I call the minister. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. So the question is, the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. An act to amend the law relating to social security and for related purposes. Minister. I move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. In accordance with Standing Order 115 bracket 3, further consideration of this bill is now adjourned to the 6th of June 2023. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that the House has agreed to the amendments made by the Senate to the National Reconstruction Fund Corporation Bill of 2023. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate, informing the Senate of the appointment of Ms Templeman in place of Ms Murphy to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on the Australian Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that the House has agreed to the Workplace Gender Equality Amendment closing the Gender Pay Gap Bill 2023 without amendment. A message has been received from the House of Representatives forwarding a resolution agreed to by the House relating to the appointment of a Joint Select Committee on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Voice Referendum. I call the minister. I seek leave to have the message considered immediately. Uh, so the question is, the motion is moved by the minister. Is leave granted? Leave is granted, minister. I move that the Senate concurs with the resolution of the House of Representatives proposing the appointment of a joint select committee on the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice referendum. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Minister. Oh, that's it. So, which business? We're back. I call the clerk. Stage ready to go, Chief. <coughs> uh, government business order of the day number one safeguards mechanism crediting amendment to bill 2022. Further consideration of the bill in committee. Uh, we just need a chair for committee. Senator, yeah. oh, Senator Van, thank you. Right here. Great. Thank you. I'm here to do my job. As ever. The committee is considering the safeguard mechanism crediting Amendment Bill 2023 and Amendments 1 to 14 on sheet SK 147, moved by Senator McAllister. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. I call Senator Dunham. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good to be back. Um, I just wanted to try and seek some further information around specific entities, noting again that there are only 215 facilities caught under this mechanism. Uh, and so, in my pursuit of clarity around what impact the safeguard mechanism and the uh, dodgy deal that's been struck between the Australian Labor Party and the Australian Greens will have on the cost of living and the cost of doing business, trying to understand what is characterised as being this 
unbelievably difficult task to get to the bottom of, to go and ask these 215 facilities exactly what impact their legislation and the dodgy deal will have on these facilities and the people that do business with them or rely on their services or pay a fee for that service. I seek some further information. So I'm going to turn to the state of Western Australia now. And in particular, I'm talking about the Red Hill Waste Management Facility, which provides uh, waste disposal <laughs> services to residents in Perth's eastern region. Uh, and under the government's changes to the mechanism, this facility, like V-Line, like some of the other businesses we've talked about or facilities we've talked about, uh, this entity will be forced to reduce its emissions by 4.9 per cent per year. So I'm just wondering whether there's been any interaction between the government and uh, the Eastern Metropolitan Regional Council about how this facility will work to meet Labor's targets and any other flow-on implications out of the dodgy deal struck between Labor and the Greens. Uh, because I mean, we've heard about it. We've heard about the in-depth and extended consultation between the government and these entities affected. So I'm just wondering if we might be able to, based on this lengthy extended consultation, understand which, uh, what the impact is, how it's quantified, um, whether there indeed, as a flow on from that, will be an increase to the rates that are paid in this municipality um, as a result of this dodgy deal with the Greens. And if you can't tell us, can you at least guarantee that there won't be a rate rise as a result of increased costs uh, for the management of the Red Hill Waste Management Facility. Thanks, Senator Dunningham. Um, Senator Dunningham, we have talked at length about the consultation process, and thank you for acknowledging um, the work that went into offering stakeholders an opportunity to contribute. Um, as I've explained to you already, um, the purpose of the consultation was to understand the design parameters for the government scheme. It wasn't to elicit detailed information about businesses, from businesses about their business intentions in running their businesses, but it was to ask them how they believe such a scheme should be constructed. And as I have indicated previously, it was extensive. So stakeholders were invited to respond to a consultation paper that was released back in August 2022. Um, that paper that was released at that time uh, appropriately sought feedback from anyone who wished to provide it, including covered entities on matters including the share of the national abatement task, so the, the, the scale and rate of change in that sector, how safeguard mechanism base baselines are set. Uh, crediting and trading, the role of domestic offsets and international units, the treatment of emissions-intensive trade-exposed businesses, uh, how to take account of available and emerging technologies and indicative baseline decline rates. Uh, a public online information session was held on 31 August in that same year to outline key elements of the consultation paper. A recording of that was made available on the department's website. Uh, shortly after, and about 220 people registered for that webinar. There were five in-person roundtables uh, around the country. Invites were sent to stakeholders in safeguard-covered sectors, including transport, resources, aviation, minerals and cement, government agencies, consultancies, carbon market advisories, environmental non-government organisations, think tanks, academia, financial services, industry groups, unions and First Nation groups. And roundtables were attended by approximately 100 and 40 people. Submissions were open on that consultation until the 20th of September. The department granted extensions um, to all stakeholders who requested one, and over 240 submissions were received. And all of the non-confidential submissions were published. After that, in October, exposure draft legislation was released for public comment. Uh, Submissions were open on that until the 28th of October 2022, and again the department granted extensions until November 2022. Uh, 55 submissions were received, and again the non-confidential submissions were published. There was then a position paper in January on the proposed design um, 
and supporting exposure draft legislation. The position paper outlined the proposed design of the reforms, including the share of the national emissions target that safeguard facilities will deliver, the framework for setting baselines for existing and new facilities, including the rate of decline, arrangements for issuing credits, access to flexible compliance options, including access to credits, offsets, banking and borrowing arrangements, multi-year monitoring periods and a cost containment measure, and tailored treatment for emissions-intensive trade-exposed facilities. The draft National Greenhouse and Energy Reporting Safeguard Mechanism Amendment rules implement the, report, the, the mechanism as was set out in that paper. And key provisions include the baseline setting arrangements for existing and new facilities, declining baselines over time so that safeguard facilities contribute a proportional share of the national emissions reduction task, flexible compliance options including below baseline crediting, interactions with our Q projects and tailored treatment for trade exposed facilities. The draft carbon credit carbon farming initiative amendment number two rules prevent new government contracts for purchase of ACQs from projects that solely credit abatement of covered emissions from safeguard facilities. They also enable the proposed cost containment measure by allowing the regulator to sell ACQs. There was then a public information session on the 19th of January to outline the key elements of the consultation paper. Again, a recording was made of that and it was placed on the department's website. Around 790 people um, registered for the webinar and approximately 640 joined. There were then further in-person roundtables um, to provide a forum for discussion. And again, invites were sent to stakeholders in the covered sectors government agencies, uh, consultancies, carbon market advisories, environment and non-government organisations, think tanks and academia, financial services, industry groups, unions, First Nation groups, and these roundtables were attended by 140 people. Submissions were open on this round of consultation until the 24th of February 2023, and the department again granted extensions until the 28th of February to all stakeholders who requested one, and over 280 submissions were received, and all non-confidential submissions were published on the department's website. And I ran through that again, Senator, because the purpose of this was to gain feedback about the mechanism. It was not to uh, obtain a record of all of the decisions expected to be undertaken by businesses, but where businesses provided information, it was incorporated into the design um, of the reforms that are before us now. Um, we've canvassed a number of examples of changes that have been made over the course of um, this consultation period as a response to the feedback that was provided to us by stakeholders. Uh, you're asking for something quite different which is specific analysis about the specific impact on a specific business, it's not the case that, that the government consultation goes down that path. Our role is to establish a framework, a framework that incidentally has been called for for a long time by leading business organisations because of the certainty that is required for people to take investment decisions. That's the purpose, of, that, that, that's our role. And the purpose of the consultation was to seek feedback about the approach we proposed. And we're confident that the very detailed and extensive consultation that, was, uh, that occurred, as I've just set out to you now, was effective in obtaining the information that we wanted, but also giving stakeholders an opportunity to provide it. Senator Dunham. Thank you, uh, Chair. And um, look, uh, again, I really want to emphasise the point there are 215 facilities. It's not like we have thousands or millions of entities out there who would be subject to some blanket rule. This is a very targeted and specific program. This mechanism covers a specific set of entities. Now, I congratulate those in the community, those stakeholders you talk about that have engaged with government on the way through. That's fantastic. The round tables, the written submissions, the granted extensions from the department, all of that sounds fantastic. But, what I cannot get past is the fact that the government have not gone to the 215 facilities and said, here's what we are doing, how does it impact on you? I'm not sure that it passes any test for a government that is the custodian of our economy, the custodian of our country's economic well-being, can say, well, 
we put it out to consultation. They never told us that it might be harmful, or if they did, we sort of blended it in with everything else. That is not okay. To not be able to tell this Senate specifically uh, what might happen in result of passing this legislation with its bolted on dodgy deal from the Greens, to not be able to tell us what might happen uh, in the case of the eastern metropolitan region of Perth and for the ratepayers there. I asked you a specific question. Would you rule out that there would be rate increases? You've failed to tell the people of that municipality that they won't have rate increases as a result of your safeguard mechanism, much in the same way you failed to rule out that tickets on a V-Line train will not become more expensive as V-Line is forced to comply with your safeguard mechanism. These sorts of things are questions I'm surprised the government was not prepared to answer, much in the same way that very basic question I asked three or four times now around, of the 215 facilities, and I remind the Senate, it's 215. Not 215,000, 215 facilities, which we have had 10 months since the election to consult with. We've talked about this in-depth extended consultation that's occurred, and well done, except for the fact that you didn't go and check with them about how your laws would impact on their business, how your laws would impact on their capacity to maintain employment. You have not guaranteed that not a single job will be shed as a result of your safeguard mechanism. You couldn't tell us, in an overall sense even, whether of the 215 facilities captured by the safeguard mechanism had existing plans to reduce their emissions by 30 per cent by 2030. You've acknowledged that there were some that had plans, but you can't tell me that. I just don't understand why the government haven't gone out to properly assess the impact, to model it. Maybe you have and you just don't want to tell us. I don't know. But I think the people of Australia deserve to know whether they're going to lose their jobs, whether they're going to pay more for electricity, whether, in the case of the council area I've mentioned, they're going to pay more for rates, whether V-line ticket prices are going to go up, indeed, whether you've modelled the impact of uh, the uh, cost uh, going up of getting goods on freight trains and therefore more trucks going on the roads as business opt for road transport instead of rail, which of course has the perverse outcome of there being more emissions heading into the atmosphere. This scheme, of course, as we recall, ladies and gentlemen, has been designed to bring down emissions, we were told. It's either going to send them offshore to countries where they have no scheme like this, making us out to be very bad global citizens or increase emissions here in Australia, because these individual owner-operator truck drivers aren't going to be caught under this mechanism. This is the ridiculousness of this approach. So, um, and indeed, Senator Hughes makes the point about the increased cost of food because of increased costs for fertiliser. And we talked about the modelling that I believe it was the IMF did that uh, talked about a 1 per cent increase in the cost of the inputs to fertiliser, resulting in a 0.45 per cent increase in the cost of food, at a time when we know people are choosing between paying rent, paying power bills, which are going to go up, and putting food on the table, at a time when these cost of living pressures are becoming acute, 10 interest rate rises, rental affordability crisis, food more expensive, power more expensive, there is no attempt by the government to understand what the laws they're seeking to ram through this place mm -hmm. at one o'clock this afternoon, what impact they will have on these pressures Australians are facing. That's contempt for Australians. And that's on top of, as I said before, the complete uh, attempt to ignore the promise that was made to Australians 97 times to bring power prices down by $275. So not only have we completely erased that one out, uh, in a Stalinist, revisionist type approach to rewriting history. We will pretend it never happened, and hopefully the people of Australia, by the time 2025 rolls around, will have forgotten that promise. I tell you what, we will not be letting you forget the promise you made, yeah. Labor government. We will be making sure that everyone remembers that. And we've got a great private senator's bill, which we will debate at some point in the near future. I'll go to another entity covered under the safeguard mechanism, and that's, of course, the uh, Ampol refinery in Lytton, Queensland. Uh, which, of course, is certain to be impacted by the changes to the uh, safeguard mechanism by Labor and their good friends down here, the Australian Greens, who are big fans of business and economic activity. 
According to Ampol, the cost of Labor's safeguard policy will be passed on to Australian motorists through higher fuel prices. I'd love to know, just in terms of uh, your laws you're seeking to pass in 35, 36 minutes, how much more Australians can expect to pay for fuel as a result of your laws and your arrangement with the Australian Greens, the backroom deal that we got the amendments for as we were commencing debate, uh, no consultation, no chat with industry, no figuring out whether there would be an adverse impact. Because uh, I think, again, along with those people that could lose their jobs, along with those people that are paying more for train tickets, along with those people paying more for rates in, at a time when they can least afford it, I'd love to know, for every Australian that drives a car out there, every truck driver, every user of fuel products, how much more are fuel prices going to rise? And will the rises, do we think, if there's any modelling that's been done, will they apply evenly across all states and territories or will they be targeted to population centres? I'd be interested in that. Indeed, uh, would there be an impact on inflation with these price rises um, if they occur? I mean, you might be able to rule them out. You might be able to tell us that Australians aren't going to be paying more for fuel. I'd love it if you did. I note you have not ruled out job losses. You have not ruled out rate rises. You have not ruled out increased costs for transportation like train tickets and getting goods from A to B in trucks. Maybe you can rule out an increase in the cost of fuel as a result of your safeguard mechanism changes that you've done a dodgy deal with, with the Australian Greens. Um, and if you can't rule it out, why do you think it's OK for Australians to pay more for fuel um, on that? So, Minister, I'll ask you those questions and I'd um, be keen to examine some of the other amendments in the 35 minutes you've left for us to consider this bill. Minister. Thanks, Senator Dunningham. Um, it's a curious thing, isn't it, to be asked these questions by an opposition that in government proposed to use the safeguard reform, uh, the safeguard mechanism for exactly the purpose that we proposed to use it, which was to reduce uh, to reduce emissions. So in the National Press Club back in 2015, what did Greg Hunt say? He said the safeguard mechanism will come into effect from 1 July next year. It will generate approximately 200 million tonnes of emissions reduction by 2030. It's interesting, isn't it? It's a very similar number, very similar number to the number proposed Economic. under this reform. Well, uh, uh, Senator Dunningham, I'll take the interjection because you refer to technology, not taxes. Uh, this is, of course, not a tax. We propose to use the safeguard mechanism. And if I just take you back to the comments made by Mr Hunt at the National Press Club, he said the safeguard mechanism, the mechanism he proposed to use for emissions reduction, will come into effect and it will generate approximately 200 million tonnes of emission reduction by 2030. Your government's plan? It's not so different to the plan that's before us, is it? Um, and so the original rules that were made in 2015. Senator Hughes. We've got half an hour left because of the guillotine of this government. If you could assist the minister in answering the question, it's not a history lesson time. And Senator Dunningham asked a very sensible question around the price of fuel. Every single Australian that has a car every single truck Senator, owner, and I think the Senator minister Hughes, should give Australians the courtesy of directly answering Senator the question. Senator Hughes, uh, that's a debating point, um, not a point of order. And while I'd love to direct the uh, minister how to direct the question, that is not my role. Minister. Thanks very much. So uh, I was speaking about the commitments made by your government, Mr Hunt, at the National Press Club, and it is immediately relevant because the mechanism before us has very similar objectives and uses the same mechanism as was proposed by the government. So the original rules in 2015 set up a framework uh, to all new entrants from 2020 to be given best practice baselines. Uh, again, quite similar to what's before us now. And the explanatory statement for that rule promised to make the first tranche of best practice benchmarks by the 31st of December 2016. Now, That's right. uh, uh, Unfortunately, as was so frequently the case with the previous government, there were a lot of promises, and that promise—the promise to make the first tranche of best practice benchmarks, uh, benchmarks by 
31 December 2016 was not met when they left office last May in 2022. Um, so the suggestion that your government never intended the safeguard mechanism to reduce emissions is false, or at least doesn't reflect what the responsible ministers for the legislation promised. Uh, it might be the view of more broadly of those on your side of the chamber, and I think that was one of the challenges for the last government, wasn't it? Was that it wasn't able to obtain agreement amongst yourselves about what to do, let alone bring a coherent policy to industry or the parliament. And it brings us back to that question of engagement and consultation, because this government does want to work with stakeholders and with the parliament to establish policies that give businesses the certainty that they require. Now, Senator Dunham, over the course of the debate, you've made a series of assertions about cost, and I've indicated uh, to you the processes that the government went through to develop this mechanism in a way that minimised cost impacts and gave businesses maximum flexibility to mitigate any impacts of, of the mechanism. Um, make the point again that the mechanism we propose backs in businesses' existing commitments. Most are already planning for or pricing in the transition to net zero. Already doing it. So your assertion, your assertion about additional costs doesn't reflect the fact that these businesses were already engaged in a process. So around 170 facilities or 80 per cent of SACOD facilities are covered by corporate net zero commitments and having made those commitments we can anticipate that responsible businesses were working towards them. It was 86 per cent of scheme emissions. Um, I can point you to some of the public research. The Grattan Institute indicated that direct impacts on household electricity, gas and petrol prices are likely to be negligible. Um, and I point you again to your repeated assertion uh, that you're interested in technology, not taxes. Well, we are interested in using the mechanism that you established for the purposes you said it was established for. The proposed reforms are carefully designed to moderate and min mitigate cost impacts. The hybrid approach to setting baselines moderates initial scheme impacts while encouraging production to occur where it's least emissions intensive, lowering the overall economy-wide cost. The flexible compliance options, which I've spoken about previously, include borrowing, multi-year monitoring and the use of domestic offsets, help safeguard facilities meet their obligations at a lower cost. And as we discussed last night, assistance will be available to ensure that businesses are not competitively disadvantaged, including the Powering the Regions Fund, which will assist businesses um, by supporting decarbonisation activities. There is also tailored assistance for emissions intensive trade exposed facilities. Senator, we are at a point in the debate where government senators are asking questions that have previously been asked and answered. Uh, there is a motion before the chair. There is a motion before the chair, and at any time, um, obviously, the Senate is free to deal with it. Senator Dunham. Thank you. And uh, look, I mean, these words of false hope that uh, are espoused here around uh, uh, look, you know, given most businesses have got commitments of their own, so therefore there will be no impact. Well, then, if that is the case, Minister, if this bill is not what we are saying it is, if our concerns are unfounded, if the quotes I've read into Hansard on behalf of businesses and communities that are worried about this and the impact it's going to have, I don't understand why you can't give us a guarantee, why you can't tell us power prices won't go up, why train tickets in Victoria won't go up, why the rates in the Eastern Metropolitan Council area of Perth won't go up, why not a single job will be lost. I did find it a little odd to use this term out of some report. I think it was the Grattan Institute, that the increase to the cost in fuel will be negligible. So I don't know what negligible means. It's an indication there will be an increase in the cost of fuel, but at a time when people are scratching around to find the money to pay the bills they have, because money doesn't grow on trees as we understand. It's a finite resource. 
You can't just go down to the bank and say, I'd like to get an extension on my overdraft for the tenth time this year. You actually have to make the books balance. Households have the same responsibility that businesses do, and of course government does. So to have an increase as a result of government legislation that we are currently debating is not a good outcome. And I don't think it's acceptable for the minister to stand in here and say, you know what, we've consulted uh, and that's enough. We don't know what the impact will specifically be. We've got a range of measures that might help them uh, with the problems they will face as we force them down the path of transition faster than they were planning. Because again, I think the answer to the question I asked multiple times around how many of the 215 facilities are going to have a plan to reduce by 30 per cent of their emissions by the year 2030, which mirrors the government's commitment here under the safeguard mechanism. No answer. You'd think 215 people. I tell you what, if as a senator for Tasmania, I only had to go out and consult with 215 individuals about what it was they wanted me to do, I'd be doing it every day of the week. What a, what a walk in the park to actually go and understand what 215 facilities need from government to ensure we don't have disastrous economic impacts flowing through into our communities, through our businesses, through local government entities, through transport providers, having an impact on every aspect of life. Today, we have seen, and the day before and the day before that and every day of this debate, we've seen a refusal by this government to make commitments, to give assurances to the people of Australia that there won't be the problems that we're asking about rule out job losses as a result of this safeguard mechanism. Give Australians that assurance that we will not lose jobs, that not a single job will go because the government is bringing in laws attached to them, a dodgy deal with the Australian Greens who have some ideological problems with many of our heavy emitting industries. Give us that guarantee and then everyone will be happy. The problem is we can't. Yes, they're business decisions. No, they're not the responsibility of a specific cabinet minister. But a government as a whole has a responsibility to the people of Australia as custodians of our economy, of our economic well-being, to ensure that the laws and policies put in place in this building don't have a detrimental impact. And all I am asking is, one, Minister, do you understand the impact on these businesses of your laws? Has there been any specific work done with these 215 facilities around what the laws, as set out in your bill, state, as set out in the dodgy deal reached out with the Greens, state? Have you gone to the 215 facilities? Not a massive task, noting the huge amount of consultation which has happened in a broad and nebulous sense with stakeholder groups and communities and those who bothered to write back in, <laughs> noting most of these entities are busy doing business, Actually, refining no. fuel, running train lines, processing our waste, whatever it might be, creating fertiliser for us to be able to grow the food that we need to eat and keep costs down. The government haven't gone and done that. They don't know how many of these 215 facilities will have reduced or have plans to reduce their emissions by 30 per cent by the year 2030. I would have thought that would be the first question you'd ask specifically these entities captured by this safeguard mechanism. It's a targeted group. These laws will affect them. Then, of course, there are all the flow-ons, the people that work for these facilities, the people that engage with these facilities or depend on the services from these facilities. I think about this fuel refinery we talked about before in Queensland. Um, the yeah, two in the whole country, and here we are put bringing in uh, some laws that will have a detrimental impact on their ability to keep costs down. And of course, they're not going to absorb them themselves. And a government handout shouldn't be the answer. It'll be passed on to the consumer the consumer that's already paying through the nose for everything they use to live their lives. But the point being, there have been no assurances given around this. There's been no uh, ability to assuage the concerns that are held by and held for good reason by people in this chamber. It is not just some ideological bent. This is going to have negative impacts. And every question that we've asked about whether the government have gone specifically to these 215 entities and sought to understand what impact these changes will have, 
we're met with a, well, that's not the job of government. We've consulted and uh, we're proceeding and there'll be some flexible arrangements. That doesn't cut it. Australians want better. We're asking for better in this chamber. The amendments we received, not at the 11th hour, one second before debate started, shows the contempt and the desire, indeed, to avoid scrutiny on the changes that are being made here. Had I had more time, I was going to ask the Australian Greens about their amendments, but I want to go back to that fuel refinery because it's not just the people who work in it. It's not just the people, the millions of Australians who drive cars out there every day to get to work, to take their kids to care or school, to pick up the groceries, whatever essential item of daily life they conduct by way of a motor vehicle. It's also the contracting businesses in regional towns and communities that employ many Australians. Now, they're not directly caught up in a safeguard mechanism, but they're the people we're not even able to contemplate the impact on. What are the flow-ons? There's been no modelling about the economic impact of the flow-on consequences of this legislation. We don't know. In 20 minutes, we will be voting on disastrous laws that will have disastrous impacts that will drive up the cost of electricity, that will chill the life out of the gas exploration sector and other sources of energy generation, that will drive up the cost of fuel, that will drive up the cost of train tickets in Victoria, that will drive up rates for ratepayers in the council I mentioned earlier, that will drive up the cost of fruit and veg, that will drive up so many elements of everyday life. And the minister cannot tell us why the government haven't gone and specifically sought responses around what might happen if we go down this pathway. 215 facilities. I don't think it is a stretch of resources for the Australian government over the course of 10 months to engage directly with each of them to understand what might happen in all of the areas I've talked about. In day. all of those, it, exactly, it's Senator Scar's right. Less than one a day to go and work with and speak to about this, and I think well, we are exhausted by the debate and the lack of answers forthcoming. Answers we need to satisfy ourselves as we hurtle towards a, a, a vote being forced upon us by a deal between the Labor Party and the Australian Greens to get their dirty little agreement enshrined in law, one that the people of Australia will be paying for through the nose, through increased power prices, through more expensive fuel, through more expensive food. No assurances have been given. So what are we left to do but to assume the worst will happen? And I, I feel very sad that we actually have no uh, attempt by government to quantify that to understand that, to demonstrate to Australians that, oh, no, don't worry, these things won't happen. That's not happening. We just get the repeated answers in response to direct specific questions, which I am so flabbergasted that the government isn't prepared to answer around impact on these specific facilities. But here we are with very little time before us. and. Uh, the government will end this week having driven up power prices, having driven up the cost of fuel, having driven up the cost of food, all of these jobs going offshore and worse environmental outcomes. So I say well done, but it's a dark day for Australia and frankly they should hang their heads in shame. Minister. Uh, well, I think we have it all on display, don't we? Because this is an opposition that has entirely vacated the field when it comes to the battle of ideas. This is an opposition that when in, that when in government was so divided, so divided internally, that they were completely unable to land any kind of climate policy or any kind of energy policy. It's a government that received under them condemnation condemnation from business groups, particularly in the energy sector, for the uncertainty that you created through you, Chair, that you created through your inability to establish clear policy settings and create the policy settings that would allow businesses to invest. And now we find ourselves 
with a shadow minister who seeks to ask questions about the policy process, a policy process that, of course, they could have sought to influence. Because we were very clear from taking government that we were interested in working with the people across the parliament um, who wanted to put in place durable and sustainable policies for energy and climate. We might have expected, actually, that this opposition would have been interested in that. It might have been that this opposition, having received the verdict of voters who clearly voted for climate action, who were clearly dissatisfied with the approach taken to climate change by the previous government, it might have been an opportunity for those opposite to think about the way that they approach these policy questions. That opportunity was before them, and certainly our government would have facilitated engagement. We really publicly said, and, and these were sincere offers, that we were willing to talk with people across the parliament. But that wasn't an offer that was taken up. And regrettably, it's actually uh, characteristic of the approach taken by the opposition more generally across a whole range of policy areas, where we've got to a position where Mr Dutton is setting himself up <coughs> to be perhaps the most negative opposition leader since Tony Abbott, and that is coming off really uh, quite an impressive uh, benchmark. But it's a no, isn't it, every time? And the thing about no is that it's not a policy. No is not a policy. It's not actually even a talking point, as evidenced by the fact that, over the course of the debate, coalition senators have come in and happy to talk, take questions, but there hasn't really been any engagement with the detail of the bill before them. Uh, nor has there been any serious engagement with the policy task before the Australian people, which is to reduce emissions. Now, previously, under your government, there was an assertion that the safeguard mechanism would be the way that you, the thing that you use to reduce emissions. Didn't do it. Mr. Hunt went down to the National Press Club, and made a whole series of propositions about what was going to happen reduce emissions from the economy using the safeguarder mechanism, but that didn't happen. And so, uh, despite this having been a feature of your policy making, you reach opposition and still just say no. So the bill before us matters a great deal. It will take us a step closer to reaching net zero by 2050. And it is about emissions reduction, Senator Dunny and, and Senator Hughes, but it's also about the economy. And these two things can't actually be separated in the way that you assert that they can. Because our opportunity is to ensure that our economy is geared up to take advantage of the opportunities that will come as the world trans transforms itself and moves towards net zero. There are opportunities there for our industries, export opportunities, ex opportunities domestically, jobs in our regions, good jobs, secure jobs. And the reforms we are putting in place are designed to make sure that the Australian people can benefit from those. It's why, of course, that they, ha they have been supported by industry, including the Business Council of Australia, the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, the Australian Industry Group. These are the organisations that called for certainty. These are the organisations that expressed such disappointment about the approach taken by the previous government. Our reforms will help limit the exposure for Australian industry to carbon border tariffs or carbon border adjustment mechanisms that many countries around the world are implementing. And so the coalition, sitting over there, having learnt nothing from the last 10 years, proposes on this occasion, like so many others, to say no, just to say no to the proposition before them. They've always got fear up their sleeve. It's an oldie but a goodie for the coalition. Frighten people. That's not the approach we take. We want to work with communities. We want to work with industries. And I've heard the comments about 
the consultation. I've heard you dismiss the significance of our efforts to work with stakeholders, but it's not insignificant, Senator. <coughs> it's actually very important that we talk with the businesses in our community, and we have done so. And actually, I can't tell you how frequently since coming to government people have said to me, this is so refreshing. It is so refreshing to have a government that we can talk to, that will actually listen. And interestingly, that's not confined to any particular stakeholder group. It's right across the board, including the stakeholder groups that the coalition so frequently asserts you have a special relationship with. Plenty of businesses delighted to have the opportunity to actually talk with a government that is focused on the national interest rather than focused on squabbling amongst themselves as your government was. So, Senator Dunningham, I have sought to answer the questions that you've asked and the questions that other senators have asked. Um, you have asked them repeatedly and in different ways and I've provided you answers. I, I do think I've tried to engage in good faith. Uh, I, I gather we are shortly to, to start considering the amendments before the chair, but I invite other senators to make any final contributions. Senator Dunham. Thank you, Chair. Uh, look, um, <laughs> we are shortly to vote, as rightly pointed out by the minister. Uh, this is the guillotine that Labor and the Greens set up to confine debate to a certain period of time on what is probably going to be one of the most important pieces of legislation this parliament deals with, because the economic impact of this will be felt for a very, very long time. It was most telling, though, in the minister's last answer, her last contribution. She said this legislation is all about emissions. Now, that absolutely is the case. Clearly is that the case, because that's all we're focused on here, not the impact of the policy to deal with emissions, the flow on impact, the cost to the economy, the threat to jobs, the cost of living pressures that we're going to be seeing as a result of these laws. This is the problem. When you look at something in such a one-eyed fashion and don't reach out to industry, the 215 facilities—215. As Senator Scar said earlier on, in the time this crew have been in government, they could have gone out and spoken to one of them a day. But instead, what they've done is they've hatched up this deal. They've had what's been described as consultation. They've tabled a bill and then gone and done a deal with the Australian Greens. This is a far cry from the claims by the Climate and Energy Minister Chris Bowen, who said in December, on the 6th of December 2021, that as a result of Labor's climate policies, not one miner's job would be lost. Now, it's a bit like that promise they made before the election that $275 would be coming off your power bill. So they'll say something before the election. No, no, no miner's job will be lost as a result of these laws. But then when we ask about it here, when we're dealing with the legislation they brought in as a result of that promise, plus some dodgy deals cooked up in a back room, smoke filled with the Greens, that same promise is not there. It is missing in action. They can't promise today that not one miner's job will be lost. Because the indication, the, uh, the signal they're giving to the market is not going to secure employment, is not going to secure investment decisions, is not going to make sure that those regional communities that depend on these entities and, of course, you know, those of us who use electricity every day, uh, who will now face increased costs, you know, they, they can't make this promise around the miners' jobs being secure. What's changed? Oh, I know. They never intended to honour those promises. And I don't think it's right to characterise questions specific in nature. Uh, around the impact of speci on specific facilities as a result of Labor's laws. Labor's laws to, as they say, drive down emissions because that's all they were focused on. Not the economic impact, no. not the jobs, not the cost of living, not the cost of fuel. Economics are hard. Th these were the things that we asked to see modelling on. These are the things we sought to understand the government's thinking on. And it se seems to me that based on some of those specific facilities I referred to—fuel refineries, train operators, 
refuse disposal sites, they are going to be faced with increased costs as a result of Labor's laws. But Labor, and in partnership with the Greens, have not gone out and asked these entities what increased costs they will be facing. How will this impact on your business? How will you uh, comply with our regime to drive down emissions at 4.9 per cent per annum each year until the year 2030? Because if they'd have done that, of course, I'd have answers to these specific questions. I'd have answers to uh, those questions around uh, can you guarantee that one job will not be lost? Can you uh, outline for us what modelling on the increase of fuel uh, Australian drivers will be facing? How will it eat into their household budget, which is already under strain? But of course, as we've seen, characterised as repeated questions that are somehow irrelevant. Well, hang on, no. Uh, everything we do here has an impact on the way Australians live. And to try and dismiss our concerns on behalf of all Australians as irrelevant or climate denying is mad. And I tell you what, it's that attitude which is going to come back to haunt the Labor Party and remind people of the deal they've done and the $275 promise not honoured, the promise that not one, not one job will be lost for miners as a result of Labor's climate policies. So I look forward to interrogating that over time. I can only assume that, uh, given the broken promises, given the inability for the government to outline to us exactly what impact their policies in partnership with the Australian Greens will have on jobs, on cost of living. They just didn't go and talk to people that disagreed with them. No. They reckon there was an invitation out there to engage. But why are there so few answers when it comes to the negative impacts of this bill? Did they just go out and talk to people that said yes? Did they just go out and talk to people they knew would agree with them? I think the answer is Absolutely. Because uh, if you went out and looked anywhere else, you'd have considered these flow-on impacts. And I just as I say, I, I can't get over, Chair, the situation we find ourselves in, where a government have left a minister who is a very diligent individual, who works very hard uh, at her portfolio uh, and her responsibilities as a senator for New South Wales, to not be able to answer questions about what impact these laws will have on everyday Australians how much more they'll be paying for fuel, how much more they'll be paying for food and groceries, how much more a train ticket in Victoria will cost when V-Line is forced to comply with the safeguard mechanism. The fact that the minister has been left unable to answer these questions because the government deemed them irrelevant somehow to a long and in-depth consultation process I just find astounding because I know when I go out and talk to people, and I was pleased to hear that all these stakeholders who have come to see the government feel so refreshed by the new approach that's been taken. Uh, interesting approach, I suppose. New government in town for three years. You'd probably want to be on their right side, so you'd probably tell them what they want to hear anyway, despite the bad policies that we see tabled every other day of the week. The reality is when I go out and talk to people, they're very nervous about what this crew are going to do in partnership with the Australian Greens, mm -hmm. just like Tasmanians were before the 2010 state election when Labor did a deal with the Greens. And I tell you what, it did not end well. No. Did not end well at all. No, um, but to boot, of course, well. we have a Labor Party without the aid of the Greens on their own, an Australian Labor Party who decided, you know what, you know that little promise we made about oh. power prices? $275 off your bill. You can take it to the bank, ladies and gentlemen. Without the aid of the Greens, they decided they would not honour that. They would not honour that promise made 97 times to the Australian people. It wasn't worth honouring. And in the same way, sadly, we are seeing a promise made to miners across regional Australia, in states like Queensland and Tasmania, no doubt, Western Australia. Your jobs are safe under our climate laws till we get elected. And then, of course, everything's off the table. Because we've got to consult, uh, we're going to sort of work our way through, and I think that's right. Senator Scar and Senator Hughes make the point. It's this deal with the Greens, which no one saw coming, except those who know what happens. Labor returned to form, Labor Green power sharing agreements, Labor Green laws, which don't do anything to grow the economy. In fact, they send it in the other direction. And so, as I said at the beginning of my contributions. Uh, this is not just about emissions reductions. 
It is about the impact this will have on the economy. There are better ways to do what the government says they will do. There are better ways to treat Australians, and that is with respect and integrity of policy, rather than breaking your promises. And it, it, look, some in this chamber find it amusing, but I can tell you this now. No one will be laughing when power bills are opened and they're higher than they were before. No one will be laughing when fuel costs are higher. This will be the hallmark of Thank this you, government Senator Dunning. and Senator their Dunningham, deal with please, the Australian Greens. Please, please. We've, we've reached the appointed hour. Senator, oh. Hughes. Senator as it being 1pm, I will now put the question before the chair and then put the questions on the remaining stages of the bill. The question is that the amendments on sheet SK147 moved by Senator McAllister be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. no. I think the ayes have it. No. Is a division required? A division is required. Ring the bells.
lock the doors. The question before the chair is that the amendments on sheet SK147 moved by Senator McAllister be agreed to. Those the question passed to the right of the chair, noes to the left. I appoint as teller for the ayes Senator Grogan and, and teller for the noes Senator Scar. Honourable Senators, there being 32 ayes and 26 noes, is resolved in the affirmative. I will now deal with the amendments circulated by Senator Thorpe. The question is that the amendments on sheet 1892 be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. Against no. I think the noes have it. A division required? Ring the bells. One minute. Lock the doors. The question before the chair is that the amendments on sheet 1892 be agreed to. Those for the question passed to the right of the chair, noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Thorpe as teller for the ayes. I appoint Senator Scar as teller for the noes.
Honourable Senators, there being 12 ayes and 39 noes, it's passed in the negative. I will now deal with the amendments circulated by Senator David Pocock. The question is that the amendments on sheets 1903 revised, 1907 and 1915 be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. I think the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. The doors. The question before the chair is that the amendments on sheets 1903 revised, 1907 and 1915 be agreed to. Those for the question pass to the right of the chair, noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator David Pocock as teller for the ayes and Senator Scar as teller for the noes. Honourable Senators, the result of the division is 13 ayes and 38 noes. It's passed in the negative. I, I will now deal with the amendments circulated by the Australian Greens. The question is that the amendments on sheet 1920 be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring, ring the bells for one minute. Oh. 
The request has been for four minutes. Uh, division, uh, bring the bills for four minutes. Lock the doors. The question before the chair is that amendments on sheet 1920 be agreed to. Those for the question pass to the right of the chair and those to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator McKim as teller for the ayes. Oh, sorry, my apologies. We'll, we'll, we'll go with convention. Senator Krogan, I appoint you as teller for the ayes and Senator Scott, teller of the noes.
senators, there being 32 ayes and 26 noes, it's resolved in the affirmative. Pursuant to order, I shall report the bill. Honourable Senators, the committee has considered the safeguard mechanism crediting Amendment Bill 2023 and agreed to it with amendments. The question now is that the remaining stages of the bill be agreed to and the bill now be passed. Those, opinion, those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. So the question now is that the remaining stages of the bill be agreed to and the bill be now passed. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the Senator Grogan as teller for the ayes and Senator Scar as teller for the noes. Order. There being 32 ayes and 26 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend legislation relating to emissions reductions and for related purposes. Being 1.30, we'll move to uh, two-minute statements, and I call Senator Henderson. So where am I going? Yeah. So what? Uh, three senators, uh, my mistake. We have. Uh, we're now going to deal with the Royal Commission amendments enhancing engagement bill of 2023. Order. The time uh, allotted for debate has expired. The question now is that this bill be read a second time. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Royal Commission's Act 1902 and for other purposes. The question now is that the remaining stages of the bill be agreed to and this bill now be passed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Uh, I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Royal Commission's Act 1902 and for other purposes. Senators, that concludes consideration of the bills. The Senate will now return to the routine of business and its two-minute statements. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Acting Madam Deputy President. Today I wish to put on the record the clear choice the people of Aston face this Saturday in selecting their next Member of Parliament. If elected on Saturday, the Liberal Party's Rashina Campbell would be a very strong voice for the people of Aston. I had the honour of talking to local residents with Rashina at Scoresby and Roeville shopping centres in recent weeks. We heard firsthand about the local impact of our cost of living crisis driven by nine increases in interest rates and a record inflation rate, all since the election of Labor. Not only have power and gas bills gone up under Labor, they have also broken a raft of promises by changing the rules for superannuation, by claiming real wages would rise under Labor when they simply haven't, on franking credits and much more. 
just as concerning for local residents in Aston is Labor's dumping of a number of local road and rail projects in their first budget just six months ago. Labor cut funding for vital upgrades like the Wellington and Napoleon Road duplications, Dorset Road extension and the Roeville Rail project. They also removed money set aside by the former coalition government for the vital east-west link, while reports have emerged that more local road project funding is on the chopping block in the next budget. Voters in Melbourne's outer east need to send Labor and Anthony Albanese, the Prime Minister Albanese, a very clear message. This is not good enough. The Liberals of Shana Campbell knows how to get things done. She is a barrister, a councillor, a mum. She knows how to fight hard. She did it as a solicitor for the Black Saturday bushfires. She will fight hard if she is elected as the next member for Aston. Thank you. Senator Ciccone. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. And I rise today um, to talk about the UK Free Trade Agreement that Australia has uh, finally been able to seal with, uh, with the United Kingdom. And we heard uh, welcome news that royal assent uh, was given to legislation uh, to bring the Free Trade Agreement with the United Kingdom into effect. And we've been uh, speaking a lot about the deep, very deep relationship um, that exists between our two great countries, particularly through the AUKUS arrangement. But this free trade agreement is another example of, of that strong relationship between uh, our, our two great countries. We should uh, not underestimate the significance of the fact that the UK's uh, first new trade deal since Brexit with, is, is with Australia. So apart from the strong relationship this still represents, the uh, strong economic benefits that will be delivered to Australians through this deal should also be celebrated. But there are far too many benefits for me uh, to mention in my two-minute statement. But I did want to say it is good to see that there will be uh, the elimination of tariffs on a number of products, the immediate access to duty-free uh, quotas, particularly for goods from our agricultural sector and faster custom clearance uh, timeframes. These are all fantastic outcomes, particularly for Australian farmers and consumers in the United Kingdom will enjoy increased access to Australia's finest products. And I do want to put on the record my appreciation for the work uh, of, uh, I guess, one of our finest trade ministers that this country has ever seen, Senator Farrell. He's done an outstanding job, Senator Farrell. Magnificent, magnificent, as Senator Farrell would say, job in sealing the deal with our friends over in the United Kingdom. Good on you, Don. Well done, and uh, good seeing uh, more trade deals like this in the future. Senator Waters. Thanks very much. Domestic violence shelters in Queensland are at breaking point. Frontline services are struggling to find space for women and children escaping violence. With a 15 per cent rise in DV, it is only going to get worse. Crisis accommodation is a critical safety net for women and children when they leave. It provides a temporary sanctuary in the initial dangerous phase after escaping, while they seek support and start to rebuild their lives and keep themselves safe. But the housing crisis in Queensland means that many women and children cannot find somewhere to move to after that crisis phase. They're staying in refuges for months or years because there is nowhere else to go. This is putting further pressure on the drastically underfunded women's safety sector. The sector is dipping into limited funds to put women up in hotels because crisis centres are full. They're referring women to refuges and accommodation in other towns, away from work and school and their support networks. They're having to turn women away, forcing them back into unsafe relationships or to live in their car or a tent. Across Queensland, people who are barely getting by are facing rent hikes of hundreds of dollars and no option to find another home. The Queensland government's decision yesterday to restrict rent rises to once a year will make next to no difference. Women have an impossible choice – stay in an unsafe home or leave and put themselves and their kids at the mercy of a system of inadequate support, stretched DV services and housing shortages. Single mums are particularly vulnerable and they are making sacrifices every day. 
Since the Gillard government's cruel decision a decade ago, single parents lose about $100 each week in support when their youngest child turns eight. There is no logic to this. It's just an arbitrary cutoff that makes life harder for single mums and their kids. It's a change that can tip people into homelessness, and the government must act to, to fix it. Restore single parenting payment to 16 years old, raise the rate, make an investment in crisis accommodation and affordable housing to actually fix the problem and fully fund frontline services. Okay. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you very much. You can't get very far in Western Australia unless you travel on a road. So why is it that Prime Minister Anthony Albanese and Treasurer Jim Jarmers, supported by WA Labor members of the House of Representatives and the Senate, is cutting or delaying road projects yeah. in Western Australia? Yeah. The Broome to Cape Levique Road and the community access roads delayed. Got the Goldfield Highway works between Waluna and Mekathara delayed. Works at Forest Highway and the intersection of Victoria Avenue delayed. And work at the Albany, Road, uh, Albany Ring Road will now be delayed. This is outrageous from a government that won the election on the back of West Australian voters. Why does WA Labor keep insisting on turning its back on WA voters? The Caratha to Tom Price corridor upgrade, cut. The, the Great Eastern Highway upgrades, cut. The Great Northern Highway road works between Nelly Springs and Arthur Creek, cut. And when you think about that, how outrageous that the one road that connects Broome to Kununurra in the far north of Western Australia, road works are being cut. Outrageous. It gets worse. The Tanami Road upgrade, which supports regional and remote Indigenous communities, supports mining resource projects, is an important access road when there are floods and natural disasters across our far north. Eight million dollars cut. Outrageous. I'm one of the few people in this national parliament that has driven down the Tanami Road to the border of Northern Territory and back. That's why it's better described as a track and not a road. Eight million dollars that would make the track a road and better support Indigenous communities. This is an outrage. WA voters deserve better. Thank you. Senator White. Since my election in May 2022, I have had the pleasure of visiting schools around Victoria to see the new facilities and spaces funded by the government's capital grants program. The capital grants program provides money to non-government schools to fund much-needed upgrades and new facilities. My first visit was to Hillcrest Christian College out in Clyde North to officially open the new primary um, multi-purpose centre. The modern and light-filled multi-purpose centre includes a children's learning room for before and after school care and our outdoor areas for learning and play. It's a facility that the whole community has, has access to after hours and on weekends. Next I was off to Little Yarra Steiner School in the heart of the Yarra Valley. This fantastic school was not only surrounded by a, fam a fabulous landscape but had the learning spaces to match. Uh, the new buildings are a new kinder centre and a multi-purpose gymnasium centre. The architecturally designed school meets the needs of each class and creates inspiring working and learning environments. They certainly reflect the Steiner philosophy of combining purpose with form and beauty. My most recent visit to St Patrick's School in Lilydale, it was a fitting uh, visit on St Patrick's Day to see the fantastic upgrades to their learning spaces and courtyards. I even got to plant my first commemorative tree. From a muddy, a muddy and underused space. What was the tree? It was a gum. Uh, the, uh, the central courtyard has become an amphitheatre of timber benches where the students can play in and sit and chat and eat their lunch. The upgrades of their schools are making a real difference and were rightly uh, celebrated in the local community newspaper. Over the next four years, the government will be investing around $875 million on facilities at schools like Hillcrest, Little Yarra and St Patrick's, including over $42.2 million in Victoria this year. We want every Australian child, no matter how, where they grow up, uh, to have the best schooling and facilities possible. Now I've got two plaques and one tree under my belt. I can't wait to keep visiting schools that are getting much-needed funding for spaces 
that help our kids learn and grow. Thank you. Senator Shoebridge. Thanks, Acting De Deputy President. Let me give you 25 billion more reasons to legalise cannabis. Because according to data on cannabis use supplied by the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission, the currently illegal cannabis industry is worth something north of $25 billion annually, every year. That's a whole lot of cash going to the wrong people. The profits from this massive illegal industry are currently being pocketed by bikey gangs and organised crime. If the argument for justice or the enormous public support for legalisation haven't yet swayed you, let me try to appeal in terms maybe the Labor and Coalition do understand. Revenue. A regulated legal market could see $25 billion transferred from an unregulated market run by the criminal underworld to a legal market that can be taxed and oversighted. And if we tax it even very lightly, we know that there are billions every year in public revenue to be had. So the next time a politician tells you there isn't any money for your local school or hospital, tell them you've got an answer ready to go. Legalise cannabis. There's literally billions in it for good. Parliaments across the country removed the statute of limitations for child sexual abuse matters because the Royal Commission told us that victims of abuse will often need decades before they're able to say what happened to them, and often years more to stand up to their abuser in court and demand justice. Despite this, new evidence shows institutions, including churches, are using a fresh legal tactic called permanent stays to deny victims fair compensation. A recent New South Wales Court of Appeal judgment has endorsed this backward step. It's empowering the worst institutional abusers to defeat victims' claims by saying the abuser has died or they kept no records. Victims are being told by the legal system but that because their abuser is dead, their case against this institution is put on hold forever. It means the law in Australia is reviving what used to be called dead man statutes, but only doing it for survivors of historical child abuse. The same offensive reasoning is not used for other legal disputes like wills or property settlements. It's obscene to see this centuries-old discredited and unfair legal theory being used to stop victims from getting just justice. We can't let this continue, and if the High Court won't fix it, then parliaments must. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Acting Madam Deputy President. And I rise to speak today to call out the hypocrisy of the Labor and Greens Party, who are pursuing a big Australian uh, uh, policy. We've had over 600,000 immigrants in the next two, uh, next two years, and that is going to put a lot of pressure on carbon emissions, uh, household rents and, of course, the cost of living. And why should Australians have to suffer? And the people who profit from this, because 75 per cent of these immigrants are students who go to universities. Universities don't have to pay tax on their profits from foreign students, uh, and I think that's unfair given that foreign students add to the demand side of the economy. They use infrastructure paid by the taxes of, uh, taxes of working Australians. So I think the Labor and Greens need to reduce population if they are serious about reducing emissions, serious about reducing the cost of living and serious about reducing rents. Because at this stage, all they're doing is helping the universities and also the big end of town and corporations who are using immigrant labour to undercut the wage market uh, and increase a bigger market size. So, Labor, it's time to stop your hypocrisy. If you're serious about cutting emissions, today we just passed a bill that is going to stick a carbon tax on Australian industry when other countries offshore don't have a carbon tax. It's going to drive many of those industries offshore. How about you look after the people here in Australia first and the small end of town and the battlers and the Australian workers rather than the big end of town who are only transferring many of their profits offshore? Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you. Uh, last weekend, New South Wales voted for a men's Labor government. They also voted to scrap the punitive wage cap that the Liberals and Nationals forced onto essential public sector workers, including nurses, firefighters, allied health workers and teachers. Just like at the federal election last year, voters said that they are sick of the Liberals and Nationals' deliberate policies to keep wages low. And it turns out during a cost of living crisis that people support fair pay rises for essential workers. Now, who would have guessed that? Well, obviously not those opposite. We also saw reason for cautious optimism on the inflation challenge this government is dealing with. When the inflation data released yesterday showed inflation had slowed to 6.8 per cent, and as sure as light follows day, the release of the inflation data was followed by the Australian Industry Group CEO Innes Willocks calling for real wage cuts. Mr Willocks said, and I quote, we appear to be on track for further falls in inflationary pressures. The data reinforces a need for continued wage moderation 
and will add to arguments for wage restraint in the National Wage Review. End quote. Of course, this time last year, when inflation was on the rise, Mr Willock said, and I quote again, it is imperative that inflation is brought back to normal levels. Further increases in wages will only exasperate inflationary pressures. End quote. So we need wage restraint when inflation is falling, but we also need wage restraint when inflation is rising. Mr Willocks has become a parody of himself. The Liberals, Nationals and the Australian Industry Group have never seen an economic challenge that couldn't be solved by cutting wages, and working Australians have had, simply had a gutful of it. Senator Barbara Pocock. On Monday, I introduced the Right to Disconnect bill in the Senate in response to the public's call for better working time regulation in line with the recommendations of the Senate inquiry into work and care. Evidence to the inquiry told us that our constant connection with work has no limits and it has many and varied negative consequences for people's health and relationships. It affects people in insecure jobs where they're constantly waiting for the phone to vibrate, letting them know when their next shift will be or whether they'll earn enough money this week. It also affects people in full-time jobs who are expected to check for texts and emails outside of hours, often panicked that they might have missed an important piece of information long after they've knocked off for the day. Laptops taken home to enable flexibility, but which also allow and in practice demand that tasks be done at all hours. As a result, as a nation, we find ourselves inadvertently working massive amounts of unpaid overtime—93 billion worth across the economy in an average of four and a half hours a week each. This amounts to time theft. The Greens want to see a right to disconnect from work in law, and Labor has endorsed this position, which was a key recommendation of the majority work and care report. Our bill, if passed, would create a law to prevent employers from contacting employees outside work hours. Our current workplace laws were not drafted at a time when everyone had a smartphone in their back pocket. It's time to update our standards in this area, as has been done in France, in Spain, in Ireland and in Canada. Australia's workplace relations systems need to reflect our 21st century workforce. Half of them are women. 40 per cent of them have responsibility for a carer while they're at work. They need a barrier between their job and the rest of their lives, and we must introduce limits to working time with a legally protected right to disconnect. Yeah, yeah. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. This morning, the Constitution Alteration Bill for Voice was introduced in the other place. The Voice is supposedly about giving First Nations people a say in this country. Yet, this week we have seen that it is nothing but smoke and mirrors. The intention to listen to us is not real. We know that the parliament will decide which advice to take and which not. But it is now clear that the government doesn't even have the intention to let us decide on what we should actually provide advice about. The Voice proposal states, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Voice may make representations to the parliament and the executive government of the Commonwealth on matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. However, Prime Minister Albanese thinks he knows what relates to us and what doesn't. When asked if the voice could provide advice on matters like the safeguard mechanism, he said that was a strange question, that the voice was about matters that directly affect First Nations people. Well, believe it or not, climate change affects us directly and its impacts hit us often harder than others. But apparently that is not something we should get a say about. The government also thinks that AUKUS doesn't affect us, but it affects our lands and waters, which we have cared for for thousands of years. If you ask me, this is really saying that we are too dumb to provide advice on complex matters. I can't tell you how much knowledge, expertise and wisdom there are in our own communities. We as people certainly don't judge ourselves if something affects us or not. The comments from the Thank PM you. and others Senator is insulting to ourselves. I want to address what I believe to be a complete failure of this chamber yesterday. 
A motion for the reference to committee Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander representative organisations was voted down by one vote. All 30 of the no's denied vulnerable Australians who have been crying out to have their voices heard the chance for an inquiry of land councils and other Indigenous bodies. No surprises, though, that they came almost exclusively from the Labor government and the Greens. When last week I hosted a delegation of 22 Aboriginal community leaders Right here in Canberra, no Labor or Green who voted no yesterday came to meet with them, not a single one of them. Not a single Labor MP in the building came to meet with them. Not one. Not a single Green came to meet them. Not one. But one of the no votes, in fact the deciding no vote, did meet with them. I refer to the so-called independent senator for Canberra who sat with three elders in his office and nodded along while they shared their concerns, while they made their case to him directly, while they used their voices to plead for help. But he did not listen. He thinks he knows best about who should have their voices heard and who shouldn't. We were simply asking for an inquiry to see what was really happening, and he would not even support that. Why? Because he claims he doesn't want to interfere with the voice referendum. Ha! <laughs> ha! What a joke! How's this for logic? The senator from Canberra doesn't want to listen to the voices of Aboriginal Australians in case it interferes with a campaign for a body which they claim is about Aboriginal voices. Shame on every single one of you who refuse to listen to these voices and shame on every single one of you who don't want to listen to Aboriginal voices who have a differing view Senator to your Roberts. own. Thank you. Sorry, Senator Roberts. Thank you. As a servant Thanks to the many different Senator people Roberts. who... Can you just take your seat for a moment, Senator Cicconi? Yeah, sorry, just on a point of order, um, and I don't want to take too much time, but the, some of the uh, comments that were made by uh, uh, Senator Price um, I think were a personal reflection on Senator Pocock, um, and I would consider that uh, maybe review the hand side, but I would ask that maybe some of them be withdrawn. Uh, Senator Namajimpa Price, are you uh, sorry uh, on the point of order? Senator I, I, I was listening very carefully to Senator Namajimpa Price's <laughs> uh, contribution, and I do not believe there is anything in that contribution that needs to be withdrawn. Thank you for your uh, view. Senator Brockman. Uh, Senator Number Jim Price, uh, just on the uh, contribution that you made, I just want to remind senators to use the correct title uh, when referring to other senators in this place. Uh, Senator po um, David Pocock is in fact the senator for the ACT, not the senator for Canberra. Um, just taking uh, Senator Ciccone's point of order, are you happy to withdraw some of those comments that were made in a personal nature? Uh, or are you happy for us to review the hands up? I, I, I'm not happy to withdraw comments I made. I don't feel they were of a personal nature. I'm happy to correct in Hansard that he is in fact a senator for the ACT. Thank you. I will. Uh... Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Chikoni. Senator Roberts, sorry to interrupt you. Thank you. As a servant to the many different people who make up our one Queensland community, this Easter I refer to Luke 23 describing Governor of Judea Pontius Pilate's trial of Jesus. Under the custom of Paschal Pardon, Pontius Pilate offered the Jerusalem Passover crowd a choice between pardoning two people convicted of sedition, Barabbas or Judas. Barabbas was a violent revolutionary who rebelled against Rome and killed indiscriminately. Jesus, though, was convicted of sedition following his Palm Sunday arrival, which led to Pontius Pilate to fear for his own, say, own power. As history records, the crowd chose to spare Barabbas in the hope he would protect them from the Romans. The crowd shunned Jesus, who had spoken against violence and in favour of quiet endurance in the knowledge better times would come. While Luke 23 is a parable about Jesus dying for the sins of others, there is another interpretation. The crowd chose a person who they falsely hoped would protect their physical selves over someone who fought for their spiritual selves. In a de decision that mimics the Jerusalem crowd, during COVID, many Australians abandoned spiritual values of love, family and friend fellowship and to achieve what we now know was a false sense of physical safety. Australians embraced the message from the Pfizer Empire's modern-day Pontius Pilots a message broadcast in daily brainwashing sessions from politicians, health bureaucrats, ma media mouthpieces and over shopping centre public address systems, all with the same billionaire owners as Pfizer. 
Messages designed to turn society against those who stayed true to, to spiritual beliefs. This Easter, let's reflect on Pontius Pilate's fate. Emperor Caligula recalled Pilate to Rome, accused him of cruelty and oppression, and then executed him. As it turns out, washing one's hands of blame does not work. In the end, God always wins. Uh, Senator McKim. Thank you, President. Tasmania is currently facing a housing and rental crisis. There are over 4,000 people on the public housing waiting list, and Hobart is the most unaffordable city to rent in in the entire country. It is a moral and political failing of the highest order. And what is the Tasmanian government's response to this? Build a football stadium. Apparently, we can't afford to put a roof over the head of Tasmanians who are sleeping rough on the streets. But you better believe there's 750 million bucks sitting in public budgets that will put a roof over the corporate section in a brand new stadium that Tasmania doesn't actually need. Message to the, to the AFL, Tasmania will not bow to the blackmail of Gil McLaughlin. We are a heartland footy state and we deserve our own AFL men's and women's teams without having to build a stonking big stadium that we don't actually need. Invest in social and affordable housing. Do not invest in uh, building a stadium we don't need at significant cost that will be better invested in the things that Tasmanians do need, a functioning health system and putting roofs over the heads of Tasmanians who desperately need it. Thank you, Senator McKim. At now being 2 p.m., we'll move to question time, and I call Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you, President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, uh, Senator Wong. Um, Minister, how many suburbs chosen as part of your solar battery grant program are held in, in Labor-held seats? Minister Wong. Uh, I thank uh, Senator Rustin for the question and thank you, President. Uh, uh, I uh, assume that should actually be addressed to me as the Minister representing the Minister for Climate Change, but I, I will check who has responsibility for that program. Uh, and the status of that program and where, um, uh, where approvals under that program are at. I don't have personal knowledge of that and you wouldn't, I, I, frankly, expect me to. But I would make this point. Uh, today, we, today we have... Today we have... I'll take it on notice. I'll, I, uh, <laughs> I'll take it on notice uh, uh, and we will retur I'll return with some further information from the relevant minister uh, as is appropriate. But I would make this point. Uh, what we are seeing, what we saw today in the chamber, was the majority of this chamber vote uh, for a plan to get to net zero. Senator Rustin, you support net zero, don't you? Yeah. Do you? Yeah. I assume um, so. Senator I assume Wong's even the moderates chair. in the Liberal Party still um, support it. Senator Wong, I, I'm very happy Senator to give Wong, you time to talk. Please assume your seat, Senator Rustin. Yeah. Um, on direct relevance, um, President, um, if the minister um, doesn't know the answer and has taken the question on notice, um, there is, there, and, and she doesn't wish to be relevant to the question in her additional comments, I would uh, ask her to perhaps just uh, take it on notice. Uh, thank you, um, Senator Rustin. Uh, that's not a point of order. The minister has taken it on notice and she's entitled to continue her remarks. Senator Wong. Uh, thank you. Uh, certainly, uh, if um, I do recall that we, we had a, a very clear election commitment to roll out community batteries across Australia. Uh, we announced a number of batteries as election commitments. Uh, I understand that the proposals for the first 58 locations are currently being assessed by via the Government Business Grants Hub after submissions closed in January. I also am advised that commitments were made in a number of seats, coalition seats, uh, including, uh, including Leichhardt and Bowman. But I would make this point. I'd make this point. I would make this point. Uh, Senator Rustin, and I know she's got a lot on her mind, but Senator Rustin uh, has, uh, comes in here, Order. comes in here, comes Order. in here. Order. Order. Just, Order. Oh, Senator Cash. Uh, Minister, oh, please resume Senator, your seat. Minister, Senator Cash, I had just called the chamber to order. Thank you. Minister, please continue. 
Thank, thank you, President. Sen Senator Rustin, uh, it would be useful if those of you on that side who actually believed in the net zero commitment you made to South Australia thank come you, in Minister, here and tell us how you would get to it. The answering has expired. Senator Rustin, first supplementary. In all of the electorates. Um, thank you, President. My uh, second question to the Minister um, it would be keen to understand um, if you could advise the Senate on how many sites under the improving mobile coverage round of the mobile black spots program are in Labor held seats. Thank you, Senator Rustin, Minister. That, that is well. If I'm repping the PM, certainly I'll take that on notice. I think from memory uh, that would be in the uh, communications portfolio, so that should have been asked of the appropriate minister. But I, I'm happy to return now. I'm happy to return now to community batteries. The community batteries for household solar program will maximise the benefits for Australia's real rooftop solar transformation, supporting the grid and providing shared storage for up to 10,000 households. The first 48 community batteries, which were announced publicly as election commitments, will be delivered by the business grant hubs. The remaining 342 batteries with unspecified locations will be delivered by ARENA, with applications to open later this year. Uh, I, I, I would I, 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 I hesitate to take that interjection from Senator Watt. So <clears throat> uh, I think from that, Senator Rustin, you would see that yes, there are 48 which were announced as election commitments. There are also 342 which are, uh, as I've thank advised, you, Minister, subject the time to. Thank you, Minister. answering has uh, expired. Senator Rustin, second supplementary. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, on the 29th of July last year, your finance minister. Uh, tweeted, taxpayer money must be spent in the best interests of the community, not in an election outcome. Isn't this statement, along with countless others that have been made by your leader and other Labor ministers, a case of complete hypocrisy when the answer to the two previous questions is three out of every four recipients in the solar battery program or the mobile black spot program are miraculously in Labor seats? Oh, no. Thank you, Senator Rustin. Minister. That, that is incorrect. Senator Rustin. The assertion in the question, I, I, I'm addressing your question. Minister, please direct oh, your comments sorry, to through, the chair. Sorry, through the chair. Senator Rustin is uh, uh, being very loose with the truth in her, uh, her question because I told her, I told her 48 batteries announces election commitments, the remaining 342 to be delivered by ARENA with applications to open later this year. So, you know, this is the problem with draft drafting a final SUP without listening to the question. Uh, Minister Wong, please resume your seat. Senator Cash. In chair, point of order in relation to the minister should be directing her comments, as you stated, through the chair and not pointing directly at Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you, Senator Cash, and I'll remind the minister to direct her comments to the chair. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm very happy to address you, President, but I am somewhat amused at Senator Cash, who is well known for the, a lot of pointing in this chamber, telling me about pointing. But if, if, it would, if, if Senator Rustin wishes me to speak to you, I will. And the policy point I am making, Senator Cash, I'll take that interjection. The policy point I will make is that I have told you that the numbers that you have asserted are incorrect, but you persist in putting uh, misinformation before the, before, in front of the Senate because uh, you uh, want to make a political point. Well, it's not founded in fact. Has expired. Order. And I draw to the attention of honourable senators the presence in the uh, President's Gallery of the Australian Political Exchange's 24th delegation from the Socialist Republic of Vietnam. On behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to Australia and, particular, and in particular to the Senate. Senator Payman. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy, Senator Wong. In the last hour, the Senate has agreed to the government's safeguard mechanisms legislation, which is another landmark in the Albanese uh, government's proactive approach to take action on climate change. Minister, how are the Albanese government safeguard reforms a step forward for the nation's action on climate change? Minister Wong. Uh, well, I thank Senator Payman for her question, and I thank all of my colleagues on this side, uh, the Greens and members of the crossbench, who supported uh, this historic legislation. And one of the things that those opposite, and I know they are fools returning to their folly over and over again, uh, one of the things that those opposite uh, seem not to have understood is the Australian people at the last election returned a parliament, not just a government, 
but a parliament uh, supportive of action on climate change. And those opposite are still stuck in the fights of years past. And in fact, uh, I, I listened to some of the debate which Senator McAllister had it so extraordinarily well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I thought, you know, I, I remember this. I remember Senator Joyce uh, standing down there oh. asking the same questions. Uh, uh, you know, I remember uh, Senator, uh, the then Senator Macdonald. Uh, I remember a whole range of those, Senator Minchin, who said that climate change was a left-wing conspiracy to deindustrialise the Western world. I mean, these people have, 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 they have not changed. They have not changed. And what I'd say to those opposite is this. I'd say two things. The first is this legislation is one part, not the only part, but an critical and important part of ensuring Australia can thrive and prosper in a world where the world is moving to net zero by 2050. And Senator Canavan, despite your best efforts, and I know you're not going to be worried about me talking at you, Senator Canavan, despite your best efforts, despite your best efforts, uh, the coalition did oh. sign up. Oh. Senator Wong, please resume your seat. Senator Mackenzie. Um, I ask you to draw the minister to preface her comments through the chair. It's not about whether Senator uh, Canavan minds Senator or not. McKenzie. It's actually the Senator standing McKenzie. orders, and it's about being Senator respectful McKenzie. to the chair. Senator McKenzie, when you call a point of order, and I have reminded senators of this earlier in the week, please state your point of order without making a statement. I will remind the minister to direct her comments to the chair, minister. It's everybody, nobody wants to have fun anymore. Um, Mr. President, uh, as Senator Canavan, no matter how much Senator Canavan tried, those in his party still uh, signed up to net zero by 2050. At least that's what they told the Australian people. Uh, at least that's what they told the Australian people. But you know what? They have no plan to deliver it. They're not even interested in Thank a plan. Thank you, Minister. To do. The time for answering has expired. Senator Payman, first supplementary. Thank you. Uh, Senator Payman, please resume your seat. There's too much disorder in the chamber and noise. Senator Payman, please continue. Thank you, President. After a decade of policy delay, denial, and dysfunction, how will these reforms deliver overdue policy certainty? What has been the response to the Parliament's progressing these reforms? Minister. Uh, I thank the senator uh, for her question, and it's a question that goes to the heart of why this reform is needed. It goes to the heart of why this reform is good, not only uh, for uh, action on climate, but also for the Australian economy and for Australian, Australian business. And one of the, the irrationalities from those opposite has been that they have misunderstood for over uh, 15 years uh, the importance of certainty in markets, uh, and that fact. The 22 energy policies that they put in place, which ensured there was no investment certainty and that the private sector would not invest in accordance uh, with its desires much of the time, which is why we have this bizarre situation where most of the business community uh, is not where the coalition are. Now, that really must be hard for the party that thinks they're the party of business. Uh, and, and, and what I've noticed in some of the debate uh, uh, through you, President. What I've noticed in some of the debate is they seem to say that somehow uh, it's because you, Minister, business don't the time understand. It be has expired. <laughs> Senator Payman, second supplementary. Um, the Minister for Climate Change and Energy has said that these reforms aren't just a plan for the climate; they are a plan for the economy. Minister, what will these reforms mean for investment and the economy? Minister. I pick up where I, get, where I, where I left off, um, President. Uh, the, the reality is the investor community, the business community, is well, away, well ahead of those opposite. Well ahead of those, those opposite. And it says something about the delusion uh, of a party that goes to an election saying, we had 22 policies, but actually we're up to it for 2050. Uh, we, we had no investment certainty, so there was no investment in the energy sector. But guess what? We now, after the election, we know better than all of the investor community, all of the business representatives, all of the businesses in this country who are seeking certainty from the parliament and from the government. And can I say what an abrogation of responsibility it has been that a party of government has left it, left it uh, to the crossbench and the Greens, and we welcome their support. But what does it say about you? What does it say about you as a party of government that says we support 2050, the no uh, election, you, you're nowhere? 
Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Order. Order. I also draw to senators' attention the, um, members of the engagement referendum working group who are in the visitors' gallery. Um, Senator Nampajinka Price. Oh, how appropriate. Um, thank you, Madam President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. Minister, can you please outline to the Senate what mechanism the Labor Party intends to use for determining a person's Aboriginality for the purposes of voting for uh, or serving on the proposed voice to parliament body? Uh, Minister Wong. Um, can I first acknowledge uh, the leaders in the chamber? Uh, and uh, Senator Rennick. I would have hoped, Senator Rennick, that regardless of your views about the voice, you might acknowledge leadership yep. and respect leadership uh, and say to those leaders of First Nations who are here, uh, we, we have appreciated the leadership you have shown with your peoples uh, and in engagement with um, the government, the with the parliament, with the cabinet and with the prime minister. Uh, and it has been, I think, uh, a very important and frankly very moving process. Uh, of working through these issues uh, to get to the point we are, we are today. Um, Senator Price, I, I'm frankly quite disappointed in that question. Um, Minister, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Cash, I have a senator on her feet. Senator Nampajinka Price. Thank you. I'd just like to uh, correct the senator that my appropriate title is Senator Nampajinka Price. Thank you, Senator. Minister. I apologise, Senator Nampajit for price. Uh, um, I am disappointed in the question. Uh, it's a question uh, that I've heard in, uh, from those who, who seek to undermine uh, indigeneity. Um, and I, I'm not suggesting. Order! 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 Uh, but I accept you wish to put that to me, and I will answer it. Um, the, uh, I'm advised that there is a three part uh, test, which is widely accepted and has not changed. I am advised that the Australian government generally applies the following common law criteria for the Senator purpose McCarthy. of determining eligibility for First Nations specific service, services, uh, and they are that a person is Aboriginal and or, tor or of Torres Strait Islander descent, uh, identifies as an Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander and is accepted as such by the community in which they live or have previously lived. I am advised this is a widely accepted test by government agencies, by First Nations organisations and community organisations, uh, and if I may say, it would appear to be common sense. Thank you, Minister. Senator Nampajika Price, first supplementary. Thank you. Um, Will, can you please, Senator, please confirm with me, will the Albanese government follow at all the example of the South Australian government and allow people to simply make a statutory declaration of their own Aboriginality? Thank you, Senator. Minister Wong. Um, th thank you, uh, President. Uh, uh, and in, in response, I, I'd make the point that I, I, I think I have responded in... Uh, Senator Rustin. Order. Order. It is disrespectful to keep calling out across the chamber, especially when the minister is on her feet answering. Minister, please continue. Uh, thank you, um, President. Uh, I, I refer to my previous answer, which I think goes to these issues, but the senator raises what has occurred in South Australia. Uh, and uh, in South Australia, there has been, and um, uh, Thomas Mayer and, and others who are involved, uh, and, uh, and others who are involved in South Australia um, would, would attest to the importance of the announcement on Sunday, uh, which, uh, in which I think there was bipartisan support from memory. Is that right? Um, for for uh, and I should put to Aegis is here. Thank you for your, your work too. Um, uh, it points to the, the sort of unity across the community. The unity across the community uh, that um, uh, this Minister, process, when done well, has expired. Uh, can... Senator Nampajinka Price, second supplementary. 
Thank you. Is the Albanese government concerned about people taking advantage of the criteria for establishing Aboriginality? And will they consider strict requirements for those who wish to vote or serve on The Voice? Thank you, Senator Nampachinka Price. Minister. Again, I've, I've answered uh, the broader. I've answered the. Uh, Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Rustin, I called you uh, during the last question. I'm going to call you again. You are being disorderly and disrespectful. Minister, please continue. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, I've answered the approach the government takes as a matter of course in the response to the first question, but I would make this point, uh, that the proposed wording of the constitutional change makes it clear, uh, uh, amongst other things, that the structure and process associated with the voice uh, and its composition would be uh, the subject of the determination by the parliament. Uh, so obviously, uh, were the Australian people uh, to agree to uh, support the constitutional change that has been proposed, uh, members and senators will have engagement on some of those issues, including the issues uh, that Senator Nampajimpa Price ra raises today. Thank you, Minister. Senator Shoebridge. Oh, thank you, President. My question is to Minister Wong in her capacity representing the Prime Minister. Minister, I'm asking this question on behalf of millions of Australians, but also Julian Assange's father, John Shipton, who went to San Diego in mid-March hoping to hear that his son would be released. Did the Prime Minister raise the ongoing prosecution and detention of Julian Assange with President Biden during their meeting on 14 March this year? Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, and thank you to Senator Sir Shoebridge for his uh, question. Uh, I'd make a few points about Mr Assange. Uh, uh, there is, I understand that there is strong interest in the case. There is a depth of community set sentiment, and we have made clear publicly uh, before the election and since that the government's view is that Mr Assange's case has dragged on too long and should be brought to a close. Um, it is not generally my practice to give chapter and verse of everything that is said in every diplomatic communications, but in the interest of transparency on this issue, I have said uh, that I have personally expressed this view, uh, the view that is that Mr Assange's case has dragged on long enough and should be brought to a close to the governments of the United States and the government of the United Kingdom, and I will continue to do so. so, so the, the Prime Minister has also made clear in the parliament, I'd refer you to his answers, uh, that he has raised this case uh, at the appropriate levels. What I would say is this, and you would know this, Senator Shoebridge, as a lawyer. Uh, we are not able, as an Australian government, to intervene in another country's legal or court processes. That, that, well, it is true. It is true, and you know that you would Order. understand. I've, well, Senator Senator Shoebridge, there is a thing called the rule of law. There is there is a principle called the separation of powers. Well, Order. And no amount of bellowing at me from the from that end of the chamber is going to change the fact that a court has to determine the legal process. So we can raise these issues as I have and as the Prime Minister have, uh, but we are not able uh, to alter the judicial processes of another country. Order. <laughs> Minister Wong, please, please resume your seat, Senator Wong. Senator Wish Wilson, those comments are disrespectful and disorderly, and I would ask you not to call out. Senator Shoebridge. Thank you, President. Oh, uh, sorry, I thought you were on a point of order. Uh, thank you. Senator Wish Wilson, uh, how would you propose that we do that? Send the Australian Army into a court? I mean, really? Uh, Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Wish Wilson? Uh, I, seeing as I was asked a direct uh, Senator question. Senator Wish Wilson, please I'll, resume I, your I seat. I can respond. Senator Wish Wilson, please resume your seat. Senator Shoebridge, first supplementary. Um, thank you, President. Uh, Minister, the Prime Minister has said, and I think you have too, enough is enough. And the Prime Minister said he wants a resolution of this matter, but this, to use his words, requires quiet diplomacy. How could a conversation between President Biden, PM Albanese and PM Sunak, which he was in just two weeks ago, not be the most important kind of quiet diplomacy to use to free Julian Assange? And why wasn't it used? Uh, thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Minister Wong. Uh, uh, that isn't what I said, and you've made a set of assertions there 
uh, which may or may not be true. And I would again say uh, that we have, at the Prime Minister's level and uh, at Foreign Minister level, uh, been very clear uh, in our views that this matter has dragged on too long and it should be brought to a close. Uh, but I again make the point that there is a legal process uh, which is um, you know, in accordance with uh, the tradition of the separation of powers, which I regard as uh, an important part of democracy. Uh, uh, it is not something that the Australian government can Order. resolve. Having said that, it is, it is appropriate. Um, it's not Minister Wong. Not Senator Wish Wilson, I called you to order twice. I expect you to come to order. Minister, did you wish to continue? Uh, uh, what we are doing what we can between government and government, uh, but there are limits to what that diplomacy can achieve. Thank you, Minister. The time until for answering I've... has expired. Oh. Senator Shoebridge, second supplementary. Thank you, President. It is a simple question, Minister. The Julian Assange family are asking, and as Australian citizens, they deserve an answer to. Did their Prime Minister ask President Biden to drop the United States prosecution and allow Julian to come home when they met just a few short weeks ago? Please answer the question. Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Uh, the, the Prime Minister has made his views clear about this matter having been brought to, to, uh, dragged on too long. But I, I again would make this point. I would make this point uh, that whilst we are doing what we can between government and government, there are limits until Mr Assange has concluded the legal processes. Uh, and uh, I think on no, it is that there are legal processes which are still on foot. Well, Order, which cannot... Senator Rice. And, and I'd, Order. I'd also... um, Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Shoebridge. Um, thank you, President. My point of order is relevance. My question was about a meeting between the President and the Prime Minister, not about court proceedings, but about a meeting between the President and the Prime Minister. And the, minister, uh, and the minister is refusing to address it. Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. I believe the minister is being relevant to your question, Minister. I did respond to it, and I'm actually trying to be helpful. And if you perhaps listened to what I'm saying, Senator Shoebridge, what I'm saying to you is that whilst, however, there are legal proceedings on foot, it is very difficult for there to be resolution between governments. I think that is an observation of fact. Uh, well, uh, uh, minister, yeah, there are some, there minister, are some countries. Minister, there are some, please some, resume your seat. Senator Shoebridge, this is not a debate. Senator Shoebridge, order. Senator Shoebridge, Senator Shoebridge, order on my left and my right. I've called you to order. This is not an opportunity to debate. There are other opportunities during our sitting for you to make whatever comments you want. You ask the question and you listen with respect. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. I would also make the point, because Senator, uh, the Senator mentioned Mr Assange's family, I have engaged with his family. Thank you, uh, Minister Wong. Senator Stirl. Thank you, President. I've got a ripper for the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. After a decade of inaction of climate, thanks to those opposite, the Albanese government is taking decisive action to combat challenges of climate change. The passage of the safeguard mechanism legislation delivers landmark reforms that will result in the reduction of 205 million tonnes of greenhouse gas emissions to 2030. Minister, why does Australian agriculture support action on climate change? Minister Watt. Thank you, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Stirl. It's really nice to get a question about agriculture. I've had questions from Senator Stirl, Senator Coney, Senator Watt, all sorts of senators over here, but never get a question from the National Party about agriculture. It seems that they've given up. Well, due to the Senate's efforts today, Australia is one step closer to reaching net zero by 2050, not just towards meeting the target, but to ensuring our economy is geared up to take advantage of the opportunities that will come with it. The safeguard mechanism reforms passed by the Senate today will deliver 205 million tonnes of emissions reduction by 2030. 
So after 10 long years and a couple more days of delay and dysfunction, Australia now has sensible reforms to ensure Australia's largest emitters reduce their emissions while Order. remaining competitive in a decarbonising global economy. We know Senator Canavan and his mates will never accept reality. We know they'll never open their eyes to what is happening around the world. But the rest of the world is moving on. I'm telling you, it's moving on. And that, and that is fantastic news for farmers, uh, and along with everyone else in our agriculture, fisheries and forestry sectors. Because the truth is, as much as the former country party used to recognise, our farmers are on the front line of climate change in this country. Whether it's repeated flooding, more intense fires, more severe cyclones, Order. larger hail or more, more prolonged drought, the impacts of climate-induced disasters are hitting our farms and their bottom line, driving up the price of fruit and veggies for consumers. In fact, we know uh, from ABARES modelling that climate change has reduced annual average farm profits by 23 per cent, or around $29,000 per farm, due to seasonal weather changes over the last 20 years. It is well beyond time for this country to take action, and we're not telling the ag industry something they don't already agree with. Whether it's the National Farmers Federation, the Meat and Livestock Association, Dairy Australia, the Red Meat Advisory Council, they've all moved on, and one of these days the National Order. Party Thank might you, too. Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Searle, first supplementary. Oh, thank you, President. The Australian people, businesses and farmers have long been calling for action on climate change. What opportunities will the Albanese government's strong action on climate change create for Australian farmers, Minister? Minister Watt. Thanks again, Senator Stirl. I think you've asked five times as many questions about agriculture that the National Party have since the election, but you know that's, that's just the kind of guy you are. The latest ABARES figures show that on the back of good conditions for the past few seasons, farm incomes are at record highs. Order. And while obviously this isn't the case for everyone, on the whole it is a good time to be in the agriculture sector. But imagine how high those incomes could have been if action was taken on climate change 20 years ago, not today. And as I say, we know what difference it would have made. ABARES tells us uh, that farm incomes have suffer uh, suffered by 23 per cent due to seasonal climate weather, uh, and weather conditions. Uh, and we also know that climate change presents an ongoing risk. Uh, to farmers, especially given the inevitability that drought is around the corner. And that's why having a diversified income is vital for our nation's farmers, and increased activity in the carbon market will provide that opportunity, along with the activity in the nature repair market, which will be able to happen now that Labor has introduced Thank legislation you, to make it happen. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Stirl, second supplement. Thank you, President. Under the previous government, climate inaction was a deliberate policy choice, and as a result we saw increases in emissions. What risk do farmers face if we do not take action on climate change? Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President. Thank you again, Senator Stirl. Of course, there are long-term natural impacts that come with not addressing climate change, and I see them almost every day in my role as Emergency Management Minister. In fact, uh, of course, I was recently in the Gulf of Carpentaria after the floods there, and there were more media reports this morning suggesting that early estimates from Gulf flooding uh, are that tens of thousands of head of cattle could have perished. And these are the events we will see more often if we don't take action on climate change. But it's not just those economic and environmental, em, environmental impacts that farmers face as a result of climate change. Uh, it is crucial to our position as a trusted trading partner around the globe that we continue to increase our sustainability effort. Who could forget those embarrassing images of former Prime Minister Scott Morrison giving an empty speech to an empty room at COP26 in Glasgow? Anyone who knows anything about agriculture and trade knows uh, that we need to take more action on climate change uh, to shore up those international Thank markets, you, and I'm surprised the, the National Party doesn't has get it. Has expired. Senator Tyrrell. Thank you, President. My question is for the Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Senator Watt. With a $240 million proposed to be spent by your government for the Hobart Stadium, you could lift rent assistance for nearly 40,000 Tasmanians by 40 per cent. If those 40,000 people were meeting with you this week, like the stadium lobbyists were, what do you think they'd want you to do? Thank you, uh, Senator Tyrrell. Minister Watt. Thanks, uh, President, and thank you, Senator Tyrrell. I think, Senator Tyrrell, despite the very few number of questions you have the opportunity to ask, I think you've asked me more questions than the National Party has since the election as well. Uh, and it's also always a pleasure uh, to answer your questions. Um, Senator Tyrrell, obviously the issue around the Hobart Stadium has been a matter of some uh, debate 
within the Tasmanian community. And having spent some time in Tasmania, I know that there are very strong views about this on both sides of the debate. Uh, our government is working with the Tasmanian government around this proposal. Uh, of course, the Tasmanian government, I think on the whole, are, are strongly supportive of it, but we're very conscious uh, that there are a range of views uh, on this topic. Um, but, Senator Tyrrell, I guess what I'd put to you is that um, wherever we end up on the issue of the Hobart Stadium, it doesn't mean that we can't also be taking action when it comes to rental affordability uh, and the housing pressures that Tasmanians are undoubtedly under. Uh, the, I can take you through some of what we're doing about, about rental affordability, oh, yeah. but in the end, the answer to rental stress is a sustained boost to the supply of homes to rent uh, and a substantial investment in new and affordable houses. Uh, and Senator Tyrrell, you won't be surprised to hear me say then that the best thing the Senate can do is back the Housing Australia Future Fund. Uh, I'm, I'm actually not across, Senator Tyrrell, what your position is on, on that issue, uh, but I certainly know what some other Tasmanians who you're sitting right near over there, what their view is on it. Hello, Senator Wish Wilson. Uh, and it'd be a really good thing if Senator Wish Wilson, Order. Senator McKim, uh, and every other Tasmanian senator joined with the government to back the Housing Australia Future Fund so that we can have that investment uh, in affordable housing, in social housing, in housing Order. for veterans, Order. in housing for domestic violence victims uh, in Tasmania and in every other part of the country. It is odd that we have the Greens and the Coalition joining together as the new coalition in Australia uh, to you, block affordable housing thank investment. You, Watt. Um, order. Order. Senators Brown and Dunham. Senator Tyrrell, first supplementary. Thank you, President. So the Hobart Stadium's own business case says the project will lose two dollars for every dollar it makes. When the project itself is telling you it's going to lose all of your money twice over, and you think that represents good value, what's your argument against raising the rate of job seeker? Uh, Senator uh, Minister Watt. Um, thank you, President, and thanks again, Senator Tyrrell. Uh, I probably can't add a huge amount to my previous answer in terms of the uh, Hobart Stadium. Uh, as I say, it is something that our government is in negotiation with both the AFL and the Tasmanian government on, and I'm sure that in due course uh, our position will be finalised and, and then determined. Uh, but again, uh, Senator Tyrrell, uh, I do know how we can assist Order. Tasmanians who are doing it tough. Uh, through uh, the affordable housing crisis that is undoubtedly the case across the country and including in your state. Uh, and I know, Senator Tyrrell, that, um, that you are a strong supporter of greater investment in social and affordable housing, uh, and that's something that we would, of course, like to continue working with you on. Uh, all I can do is say that the best solution uh, that we have before us is a policy that the government took to the election to create this Housing Australia Future Fund and can get going as soon as the Senate passes it to build Thank that you, housing. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Tyrrell, second supplement. Thank you, President. Budgets are about priorities. You could build 2,900 homes in Tasmania with the funding slated for the government spend on the Hobart Stadium. This would be enough to give every single homeless Tasmanian a place to call home. What's your government's priority? Put in a roof on a stadium that retracts, by the way, or put in a roof over their heads? Thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Tyrrell, again. Well, of course, any, any budget that the federal government brings down uh, undertakes and provides funding for a broad range of activities. And I'm very confident uh, that when this budget is finalised, and I know Senator Gallagher in particular has been putting a huge effort into framing it, it will deal with a number of really important challenges that Australians are facing, whether it be in Tasmania or elsewhere around the country. Uh, of course, assisting people with cost of living relief will Order. be a real centrepiece of this budget, uh, and, and uh, providing more investment in housing will be as well, provided we can get that legislation passed. Uh, now, Senator Tyrrell, um, I think I'm, I'm sure you're aware, but we are already taking action on, on affordable housing in Tasmania. 48 new affordable homes being provided in Launceston in partnership with uh, Community Housing Limited, 181 new homes in North West Tasmania funded by the National Housing Finance and Investment Corporation. Uh, so there's a lot of action happening. We know there needs Thank to be you, more, and that's the what that time housing comes about. Has expired. Senator Birmingham. President, uh, President, my question is to the Minister for Trade, Senator Farrell. Inpex is one of the most important foreign investors in Australia. 
Shortly before question time today, NPEX's global CEO, Takeyuki Ueda, spoke in an event hosted by Resources Minister Madeleine King. Ueda San said in his speech, and I quote, about the government's gas market policies that we are concerned that market intervention will only compound the situation of price challenges. Price intervention is likely to discourage investment in exploration and production while simultaneously driving up demand. The energy policy environment in Australia today appears to be driven almost by ideology and domestic concerns that the investment climate in Australia appears to be deteriorating. I asked Senator Farrell, as the minister responsible for investment, how much does the government believe its interventions will reduce investment in Australia, and does the Albanese Labor government accept responsibility for the deterioration uh, in minister. Australia's time investment for reputation? Asking. That time for asking has expired. Minister Farrell. Uh, zero. Um, zero is the... Uh, zero no, no, zero, zero impact on our... Um, uh, Relations, relations with, uh, yeah, zero, yeah, zero. There, seriously, zero, zero is the answer. It won't have any impact on our um, uh, international reputation or our reliability or our stability as a supplier of, amongst other things, uh, gas. Um, I've, uh, I've followed the, <coughs> I followed the impacts, uh, the impact story in Australia very closely for a, a long period of time since my great friend, um, Mr Paul Henderson, uh, shook hands with uh, Mr Kita Mura all those years ago to start the process of building one of the great Japanese, J great Japanese investments uh, in this uh, country. To sit, to, sit and watch, to sit and watch those uh, uh, gas ships uh, uh, go out of uh, Darwin Harbour uh, on their way to supplying something like 10 per cent of Japan's uh, gas needs um, is, a, is a wonderful sight, and I can recommend it to, uh, to anybody. Um, I met uh, with the gentleman that uh, you, you referred to, and I have met with Mr Kitamura. In fact, I had Order. the privilege, I had the privilege uh, late, yeah, late last year of awarding Mr Kitamura uh, an Order of Australia at the uh, the uh, Australian Embassy uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Tokyo. Um, we're, a we're, a democracy. we're a democracy just like Japan, and companies in Japan can express points of view that don't always agree with, uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the government of the day or, in fact, uh, other business... Uh, Thank you, Minister. Business... The time for answering has expired. Senator Birmingham, first supplementary. Oida San also said that, quote, Australia is competing for global investment and the changes we are seeing to Australian policy settings will choke investment and strangle the expansion of LNG projects in this country. The consequences of these well-intentioned policies will be the increasing energy demand in our region will be met by coal and not by natural gas. Senator Farrell, will Labor's gas market intervention increase demand for coal and, as Uida Sands says, make net zero by 2050 an impossible task? Uh, thank you, Senator Birmingham. Minister. Thank you, President. Thank you, Senator uh, Birmingham. No uh, is the answer to that. Uh, no is the answer to that question. Um, we are making sensible decisions in the interests of Australian yeah, consumers. Yeah, yeah. Now, now, after 10 years of doing nothing about these sorts of issues, you left, you left the electricity system in a complete uh, Minister mess. Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Order on my left. Calling out, shouting out is disorderly, and I'd ask you to stop. Uh, Minister, please continue. President, and Senator Canavan knows what I'm saying is exactly correct. Uh, uh, thank you, Senator Farrell. Um, Senator McKenzie. Uh, point of order, Chair. Going to Odger's explanation to the rules of debate around Standing Order 193, ministers are to direct their uh, comments through the chair, and Senator. Farrell was yelling and pointing at Senator Canavan rather than respectfully answering uh, the question you, through you. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Let me first of all remind all senators that shouting out across the chamber, Senator Canavan, Senator Canavan, 
shouting out across the chamber is incredibly disorderly. That's the first point I'd make. The second point I'd make is that Senator Farrell was directing his comments to me, except for a slight deviation, and I will remind him I will remind him to direct his comments to the chair, but I'd also remind other senators not to keep calling out to a minister on their feet who's answering a question. Minister Farrell. Thank you, President, and thank you for that protection from uh, Senator uh, Canavan. Um, look, we were left with a situation where um, the potential was that as a result of those ten years of neglect in the electricity sector by the former government. Uh, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator Birmingham. Point of order on direct relevance. The question actually related to the gas market interventions, and particularly the question went to the observation by one of the largest foreign investors in this country as to whether those interventions would increase demand for coal. I ask you to draw the minister to the question. Uh, Senator Birmingham, the minister answered the question when he first stood. That's my understanding. He has answered your question directly. Minister Farrell. Thank, thank, thank you, uh, President. And th my first comment was a direct answer to the question. And I don't, with all due respect to um, uh, IMPEX, I don't agree with their assessment of the situation. Now, thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Birmingham, second supplementary. Minister Sam also said, quote, on the geopolitical front, Australia's quiet quitting of the LNG business has potentially very sinister consequences. The question of who will replace Australian supply in the market is front and centre. Alarmingly, the inconvenient truth is most likely that Russia, China and Iran will fill the void." End quote. Will Labor's interventions create new market opportunities for Russia, China and Iran? And why should Australians take the word of Senator Farrell ahead of one of our largest foreign investors and experts uh, thank in this you, Minister. field? Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Your time has expired. Minister Farrell. Well, <coughs> Senator, Se Senator Ciccone. Uh, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. I'm going to wait for silence. Minister Farrell. Thank you, President, uh, and thank Senator Birmingham for his question. Well, you, you can uh, rely on my word. I'm a minister, minister in a uh, fantastic yeah. Labor government. And we are all about providing a stable political environment in which to continue to supply reliably uh, Japan uh, gas, uh, gas supplies. Uh, in the case of IMPEX, that's um, well. Look, in all due respect, I had a very long meeting with the gentleman that you're, con you're talking about before uh, that lunch. Uh, it was an extremely a a amicable uh, meeting, at which, at which. At which, at, at which I made it very clear that this country continues to be a stable, reliable supplier of gas into the uh, Japanese uh, market. Of course, Japan is not the only place we're supplying gas. Thank you, uh, gas Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Babette. Thank you, President. Um, my question is for the Minister representing the Treasurer, Minister Gallagher. Minister Gallagher, we meet again. Your October 2022 budget included a figure of $77 million that was in the Services Australia Portfolio Budget Statement. This figure is the allowance for the COVID-19 vaccine claim scheme payouts for 2022-2023. At that time, at the time, this represented an 80-fold increase in allocation from the previous federal budget of just 937000 my office is contacted every single day by people who, in good faith, trusted their government but are now paying for this decision with injury. They are suffering, and some in this place mock them to this day. Can you please update the Senate on the total amount that has been paid out by the COVID-19 vaccine claim scheme this current financial year? Please. Thank you, Senator Bebet. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. I thank Senator Babbitt for the question and for um, his advice um, ahead of time that he was going to answer, ask a question on this. It, it greatly assists him being able to provide the information that uh, the senator is, is seeking. Uh, as the senator outlined, the COVID-19 vaccine claims assist, uh, scheme was put in place uh, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, and after the announcement of uh, the approval of 
uh, the vaccines in the vaccine um, program across Australia. The scheme have, was established as a fit-for-purpose, time-limited scheme claim scheme to respond to the unprecedented circumstances of COVID-19. It was designed to ensure that people who have suffered a recognised adverse event as a direct result of the vaccine, COVID vaccine that is, have faster access to compensation than a costly and complex court process. Uh, it is for, uh, there are seven recognised clinical conditions which are eligible under the scheme. Uh, which I can go through, but in, in specifically in relation to Senator Babbitt's question, it's right there was a provision of um, $77 million uh, made. Um, total expenditure as of the 28th of March 2023 is in the order of $7.2 million. That uh, Services Australia, who administer the scheme, has received 3,374 claims under the scheme, and as uh, at the moment, 126 claims have been approved for that total figure of just around 7.2 million. Thank you, Minister. Senator Babette, first supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Now, the TGA's most recent report shows that they've received 137,970 reported adverse events following COVID vaccination. That's the equivalent of two and a half packed Marvel sports stadiums in Melbourne, big stadium. It appears that, that the number of claims will continue to grow. Minister, uh, what amount will your government be allocating to this scheme in the next budget, in the upcoming thank, budget? Thank you, Senator Babette. Minister. Uh, thank you, um, uh, President. I thank Senator Babette for the supplementary. Um, my, my understanding of the TGA's uh, adverse events report is that they report against a range of um, possible um, so, you know, serious side effects, from lesser serious to more serious, uh, as listed under the adverse events, and not all of those would necessarily be eligible for a claim through this scheme. But in the event uh, that um, there was increased demand, it is a demand-driven scheme. Um, that is, you can make certain provisions, but if there were, um, you know, we would meet the costs of the applications, the successful applications that met the terms of the scheme and those seven conditions, the seven recognised clinical t conditions which are eligible under the scheme. So it isn't really a question of whether we have enough money. It's a demand-driven scheme, and those that compensation would be paid. Thank you, Minister. Senator Babette, second supplementary. Thank you, Minister. So obviously we've paid billions to pharmaceutical companies, and in return, Australians have been slogged with a huge compensation bill to pay for uh, vax injured people. What options does the government have to make these companies responsible and pay for the in pay for the injuries that they created with a crappy product? Thank you, Senator Babette, Minister. Uh, thank you, um, thank you, President. Thank you, Senator Babette, for the supplementary. Well, I don't agree um, with the characterisation of the COVID-19 as a crappy product. Um, it has successfully vaccinated um, millions and millions of Australians and significantly uh, decreased the chance of serious disease, uh, particularly on vulnerable um, individuals. So I don't accept that. Uh, as to the commercial arrangements with the pharmaceutical companies, I think if people remember at the time because the vaccine was developed in a relatively short period compared to others, um, there were commercial discussions about how to manage um, schemes and claims like this, uh, but I can't go into those details. They are commercial in confidence. Senator Babette, second supplementary. Oh, done that. Sorry. Uh, Senator Mariel Smith. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for, Woman, for Women, Senator Gallagher. Earlier today, the government's workplace gender equality amendment closing the gender pay gap bill was passed with wide support across our parliament. Can the minister update the parliament on how the government is advancing women's economic equality? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. Thanks, uh, thank uh, Senator Smith for uh, the question and again for all the work she does in relation to um, uh, gender equality um, and right. women's right. policy in general. I really do appreciate it. It's so fantastic to work with such a, a great bunch of people um, and have such a great bunch of women across the Labor caucus. Um, and this, this um, 
this piece of legislation, which I accept and, and in fact I thank everybody in this chamber because this is a piece of legislation where the chamber came together as one and agreed uh, that this should be a priority to get this bill passed. Uh, it's passed the House of Representatives now and, again, it was work that was built upon by um, the former government, um, those opposite who had uh, started the review and agreed to the recommendations. So it is really good at the end of a long and at sometimes scratchy sitting fortnight to, uh, to be in a position where we have and can demonstrate to the women of Australia that the parliament has agreed that ending or accelerating um, action on the gender pay gap is such a critical and important national reform. The bill that passed the House this morning uh, is going to change things. It is going to ensure that at a business level um, where their gender pay gap exists, that that will be reported and people will be able to see that. It's important from a transparency and accountability um, reason, but it's also about driving the reform that's needed to close the gender pay gap. There is absolutely no reason why uh, men and women uh, performing the work, the jobs that they do in, in, similar, in businesses should be paid uh, differently uh, for the same type of work. And we know that this has an, a huge impact on gender equality and women's economic uh, independence or women's economic equality as well. Thank you, Minister. Senator Smith, first supplementary. Thank you, Minister. While this was, bill was being debated, both in the House and in the, and the Senate, many of us observed that there was more work to do. Can the Minister provide an update on the government's plans to continue to improve gender equality? Thank you, Senator Thank you. Smith, Minister. Uh, thank you, and thanks, Senator Smith, uh, for the supplementary. Well, there is more work to do, and we are, as a government, committed to getting on with that. As a government, uh, from the, our early days with the Jobs and Skills Summit, and the platform that we took uh, to the election campaign made clear that women's uh, economic equality women's, uh, and the issue of gender equality was going to be a priority for this government. We recognised that in October, with our investments uh, that we made in, in social programs like early education and care to ensure that women can work the hours they want to work, uh, but also um, through the work we are doing now in progressing the work on a national strategy to achieve gender equality. And I would encourage everyone to get involved in that. We are wanting to hear from women from right, right across the country and all of our, the people we represent. Consultations are open. Um, to have those conversations in your communities uh, with your neighbours, your families and friends about how we can make Australia a leader in the relation to Thank gender you, equality. Thank you, Minister. Senator Smith, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Can the minister outline how we can all contribute to improving gender equality? Thank you, Senator Smith, Minister. Thank you, President. I thank Senator Smith for the supplementary. Well, Senator Smith is right. We all have a role to play in this place, in our communities, at home, in businesses, unions, schools, universities, churches, sporting groups. Uh, wherever you are, we can work together and make women's uh, economic equality and gender equality will make us a better country. In this place, we can help drive that change by getting around the table, working together, as we've done on the bill that passed the parliament today. We know that there's a lot more work to do. Uh, we've been delivering um, some of those important um, additions or investments into driving this change through cheaper childcare, through 10 days paid family and domestic violence leave, boosting paid parental leave, through our gender responsive budgeting and in the first budget in nearly a decade that casts a gender lens over the budget. We've got the national plan to end violence against women and children, a wage increase for aged care workers where 96 per cent of them are women, National Women's Health Thank Advisory Council. I could go on, President, but my expired. Thank you. Senator Cash. Thank you very much. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. Uh, last week, in your absence, Minister Farrell was asked to name anywhere in Australia where electricity prices had gone down since the Albanese government was elected. Minister Farrell did not name anywhere, but did say, I don't follow electricity prices closely enough to be able to answer that question. Minister Wong, do you follow electricity prices more closely than Minister Farrell? You wouldn't have said that. Uh, Minister. You have said that. Uh, Are you more in touch? Than Order. <laughs> uh, I, I always think it's uh, a very dangerous thing when I take the interjection from Senator Birmingham when politicians tried to 
uh, compete about these things. But what I would about being in touch that is because we're all politicians, aren't we? But uh, I think we understand very acutely the cost of living pressures facing Australian families. And uh, Senator Rustin. We understand very acutely the cost of living pressures facing Australian families. Uh, uh, obviously, inflation has driven, uh, for a whole range of reasons, has di driven increases in costs. People are feeling it uh, at the supermarket, and they're feeling it uh, in, in terms of utilities and services. Uh, and that is why, well, you know, uh, that is why uh, those of us on this side. Uh, along with the Australian Greens and others, voted, voted uh, for price relief uh, uh, for Australian families. So every time someone from the, the, the other side comes in here and tells us about energy price relief, let's remember they voted against energy price relief. That is what the coalition did. You voted against the price cap for coal and gas. You voted against uh, uh, a, a bit. But three billion in targeted bill relief for businesses and households most in need. You voted against a 12-month price cap on uncontracted gas at $12 a gigajoule, and a 12-month price ceiling on domestic coal for New South Wales and Queensland. Senator and then you have the gall to come in here and talk That's about who's out of touch. Well, no one who was in touch with Australian families and what is happening on cost of living out there would have had the temerity to come into this chamber and vote against price relief right. for Australian families. Order. So if you want to talk Order. about who's not in touch, have a look in the Order. mirror, Senator Cash. Um, Senator Cash, first supplementary. Uh, thank you very much. And Minister, can you name anywhere in Australia where electricity prices have gone down since the Albanese government was elected. Minister. Well, I know that everywhere in Australia is probably going to have, would have had higher prices were you right. in government. Exactly. Uh, that's what we do know. Uh, uh, and we know that prices would have risen by less than they would have as a result of the government's policy, which you voted against. Order. Uh, and Order. You know, those opposite not only Senator not Wallace. only did they vote Order. against price relief, Order. not only did they vote against price Senator relief, Wong. they also think that the way you deal with energy Senator price. Wong. Order. It is not appropriate for the noise levels to go. Senator Birmingham, I've called the chamber to order. It is not appropriate for the noise level in here to get so loud that the senator can't hear me calling her to order. It is not appropriate to shout across the chamber on both sides. I would ask senators to listen respectfully. Minister, please continue. Uh, thank you. Not, not only do they think uh, those opposite uh, president think that an answer to rising prices is to vote against price relief, yeah. they think an answer to rising prices is to hide them. Yeah. Hide them. Before the last election, their response Order. to rising energy Order. prices was Senator just not this. Let's, let's change what the DMO actually uh, is disclosed to be. Uh, that's what Mr Taylor did. Well, we on this, th we on this side Order. understand what families are facing. We're trying to do something Thank you, about it. Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Cash, first supplementary. Final supplementary. Why hasn't, Minister, the Prime Minister delivered on his promise to reduce electricity bills by $275, a promise that he made 97 times prior to the election? Why does everything always cost more under Labor. Order. Order. Before I order. Order. Before Minister, I haven't called you. Before I call the Minister. Senator Polly. Senator Polly. I'm calling you to order. It doesn't require a response. Minister, please uh, Minister, please re Minister, please continue. Uh, let's Let's talk about the default market offer that the Australian Energy Regulator published, the, the draft DMO for 23 uh, And what that showed, and this, this, this is what's happening to energy prices, uh, that the DMO will rise up to 22 per cent for households, up to 25 4 per cent for businesses. That is a substantial increase. But what it also showed is without coal and gas price caps that you voted against, the price increase would have been 51 per cent and 53 per cent. 51 per cent 
and 53 percent. And Minister that's what Wong, they would please resume your seat. It is, as Senator Cash, it is not appropriate to interject in such a loud voice as to try and outcompete the minister. She's been asked a question. She's entitled to answer it, and she's entitled to it to uh, senators listening respectfully and silently. Minister, please continue. I'll just repeat that, that without the coal and gas price caps that those opposite voted against, the price increases that Australians would have faced, households and businesses would have been 51 per cent and 53 per cent, respectively. So uh, if anybody wants to come in here and suggest they're out of touch, I suggest they ought to, those opposite should look in a mirror and I Thank ask you, the President that further questions be placed on notice. Order. Order. Senators, I was, asked, I was asked to review the tape in relation to a matter that occurred on Tuesday. I have been asked to review the Hansard of a series of exchanges during a speech by Senator Thorpe on the Safeguard Mechanisms Crediting Amendment Bill on 28 March 2023. In effect, the chair had conflicting points of order before her but was unable to deal with either of them because the chamber descended into disorder. This included Senator Hughes disregarding the chair by persistently interjecting and Senator Thorpe repeating an accusation before the chair had been able to rule on it. It is unacceptable that senators continue to disregard the authority of the chair while points of orders are raised and determined. This is happening far too often. The Deputy President and I will be looking to all senators in this place, and particularly senators in leadership positions, to assist in reversing this trend. Consistent with this, I intend to take a firmer line in calling the Chamber to order, particularly in question time. In order to preserve the dignity of the Chamber, I remind all senators of the behaviour codes and your endorsement of these codes in this chamber and the other place. It was appropriate in the circumstances for the chair to refer the matter to me for review. At the outset, I would like to praise the way Senator Reynolds managed the disorder in the chamber. She did so in a dignified and calm way that sought to take the heat out of the situation when she was regrettably placed in a very difficult position. The Hansard records Senator Hughes commenting about Senator Thorpe acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land she was discussing. In response, Senator Thorpe asked the chair, is that racism? Can I just call out racism in the chamber right now? Senator Hughes, on a point of order, said, we've just had an accusation made in this chamber and I would like Senator Thorpe to withdraw. The matter involves the interpretation of Standing Order 193. Standing Order 1933 prohibits offensive words, imputations of improper motives and personal reflections against senators and members. It revolves around the idea that there should be constraints on language directed to other senators or members. This is in intended to ensure that political debate is conducted in the privileged forum of Parliament without personally offensive language. This raises the question of what constitutes personally offensive language. Odges says, and I quote, it is for the chair to determine what constitutes offensive words, imputations of improper motives and personal reflections under this standing order. In doing so, the chair has regard to the connotations of expressions and the context in which they are used. In other words, the rule isn't necessarily about particular words or expressions. It's about the use of such words in context. It is for the chair to determine whether, in all circumstances, the language amounts to offensive words, imputations of improper motives or personal reflections directed to a senator. I now turn to Tuesday. First, a statement directed to a senator accusing them of being racist breaches Standing Order 1933. Any such personal reflection upon another senator or a member of the House is highly disorderly and, if made, should be withdrawn. 
I am not sure that a senator asking, is this racism, in response to an interjection, necessarily breaches that standing order. It would depend on circumstances. However, Senator Thorpe subsequently made a direct personal reflection upon Senator Hughes, which should be withdrawn. Senator Thorpe asked the chair to consider whether particular language used was racist. As the chair indicated, it is not generally the role of a chair to judge the character of language used by senators unless it breaches some rule of the Senate. In discussing Standing Order 1933, Odgers says the chair um, does not normally require the withdrawal of words unless the chair has determined they are contrary to the standing order. But if a senator finds a remark personally offensive and considers himself or herself personally aggrieved, the chair may require its withdrawal to preserve the dignity of debate. In making these judgments, it is relevant for chairs to consider whether words may be particularly offensive to another senator because of their personal attributes or experience. However, it is incumbent on every senator to demonstrate a level of respect for their colleagues, which ensures that chairs are not required to adjudicate such matters. In relation to the interjection from Senator Hughes, the Hansard records what appears to be a derogatory comment about the practice of acknowledging country at the same time as Senator, Hawke, Senator Thorpe was acknowledging the custodians of particular land. As Senator Thorpe clearly found that to be personally offensive, I consider there would have been grounds for the chair to seek to have Senator Hughes clarify or withdraw her remarks. However, because of the subsequent disorder, that was not possible. In those circumstances, I think it would be appropriate for Senator Hughes to either withdraw or clarify her remarks. For absolute clarity, I am asking that Senator withhook, with, beg your pardon, I am asking that Senator Thorpe withdrew, withdraw her comments to Senator Hughes and for Senator Hughes to either withdraw her comments to Senator Thorpe or clarify those comments. Finally, I endorse the comments of former President Ryan who said, the standing orders and rules of this place are limits, not guides. Just because something can be said or done does not mean it should be. Common decency cannot be codified. It depends on all of us considering the impact of our behaviour on others. While this workplace isn't like a normal one, it is still a place where we must all work together, even across issues of profound disagreement. Thank you, Senator. Senator Hughes. Senator. Uh, if I can, I would just like to acknowledge and thank you for looking at this matter and for coming back to the, House, to the Senate with that statement. And in order to maintain the dignity of the chamber, I withdraw. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Um, Senator Watt. Uh, thank you, President. In question time on Tuesday, the 28th of March, I took elements of a question asked by Senator Lambie to me on notice. I've written to Senator Lambie to provide a complete answer, and I now table that answer for the information of the Senate. Thank you, Senator Watt. Senator Brockman. To take notice of answers given by Labor ministers to all coalition questions. Well, I mean, I'm not sure if the jury was out before uh, Shadow Minister Birmingham's question to Minister Farrell about whether he was the worst trade minister ever, but now the jury is certainly in. I mean. The fact that he can say, when you have the global chair, Uida Sun, of INPEX, talking in this place, talking in the Australian Parliament about the damage the Labor government has done to our trade relationship with Japan, and he just blows it off. He just acts as though that speech 
never happened. I mean, that is an extraordinary performance of a minister who is meant to be championing and, and defending the trading relationships of this country. And this is not just one of our most important trade relationships with the nation of Japan. It's one of our most important relationships in a geopolitical sense. We have the global chair of a major corporation coming to this place and saying, and I quote, certainty in policy direction and a stable regulatory framework will continue to encourage strong investment in Australia. Unfortunately, the investment climate in Australia appears to be deteriorating. Now, I think everyone in this place would agree that the Japanese, in cultural terms, when they're speaking diplomatically, consider every single word they say extraordinarily carefully. Every single word they say. And for a global chair of a Japanese corporation, which is a major investor in this country, to say that it shows how far this government has deteriorated a key trading relationship in just a few short months of being in government. Heaven help us. Heaven help us after they've had the reins for a couple more years. What damage is this government going to do with our international trading relationships? And this isn't a minor industry. This is a key industry for Australia. The gas industry is a key industry for my home state of Western Australia. And foreign investment is a key driver of that industry. We need foreign investment to underpin the, the economic development of this country. Back, we go back to the 1970s when uh, particularly Japanese investment into Western Australia saw the development of our great gas industry. And we've seen this government in 10 short months, 10 short months, destroy 50 years of relationship building, of being a reliable, a stable, a, a, a a key trading partner in the gas space with these major international corporations. And it's not just about the dollars that flow, though it is a great export earner for this country. It's a great employer in Western Australia and the Northern Territory. Uh, it, you know, it's just a wonderful industry. But it's also about energy security for one of our key strategic partners. Japan is one of our key and most enduring strategic partners, certainly in this region. Uh, and for the government to trash that relationship, trash that relationship to the point where you have a global CEO speaking in this place, talking about the damage that's been done. Let me quote a little bit more from the speech. Let me quote a little bit more. In Japan, we say, don't cheat at rock, paper, scissors. This translates to don't move the goalposts after the game has started. Here we have one of our key trading partners saying that we, Australia, is cheating at rock, paper, scissors. And the trade minister stands up in this place and denies, just oblivious, He's oblivious to reality. He denies the fact that this government, this Labor government, is having a negative impact on our key trading relationships. And they've got form. They're damaging key trading relationships in the Middle East through their decision to ban the live export sheep trade. They're damaging our relationship with Japan, Taiwan, South Korea. These are key relationships. Senator Craighead. Um, well, I am delighted to rise and take note of uh, some of the questions and responses that we heard in question time today, particularly having an opportunity to talk about how the Labor government is powering Australian communities with batteries, and not just individual batteries, but a community, community batteries, where we can actually, you, we can actually power support powering so many homes, 100,000 homes will benefit from this 
uh, from this initiative. There are uh, 400 batteries to roll out, and they will power entire communities. They will help entire communities to lower their electricity prices, which I'm very, very proud of. One in three Australian households have solar panels, but very few have batteries. This community approach to powering our homes is going to make a big difference out there. Um, and these things will help us get to net zero. Now, there were a number of questions in question time today that went to the issue of net zero. It was mentioned on a number of occasions. And when I look around this chamber, we know that the majority of people in this chamber, in the Australian Senate, are right behind the idea of net zero. And although it would be difficult to, uh, to have seen on the face of it, following the last couple of days of debate around the safeguard mechanism, there are even some people on the coalition benches that believe in net zero. But you wouldn't have thought it if you'd been listening to the conversation in here over the last number of days. But that is where we need to get to, and the safeguard mechanism is another element that is going to help us get there. The safeguard mechanism that passed this chamber earlier today, after 10 long years, 10 long years of having so much uncertainty, so much uncertainty, and the safeguard mechanism when put in by the coalition when they were in government, did nothing to reduce emissions. And its entire intent is to reduce emissions. But it did not. Emissions went up. And you'd have to ask yourself, why was that? And I think it was probably because <laughs> um, there was no intention to do it in the first place. Set up a mechanism and then set your baseline so high, so high, that nobody's coming down which totally goes against the grain, totally goes against the intent. So I'm delighted that today this parliament has passed that bill and the safeguard mechanism will kick in on the 1st of July. And as we saw last year when the 43 per cent target was legislated in this parliament, we saw investment go up. We have seen organisation after organisation come and, and talk about how much the certainty matters, the importance of certainty. So the whole thing about moving the goalposts, well, let's put the goalposts in the ground first, shall we? And the goalposts in the ground about where we're going and how we're getting there has seen a tick up in investment. So, we know that with the safeguard mechanism, 80 per cent of the organisations that are captured, <clears throat> 80 per cent of those, are actually already committed to net zero. So they've made that commitment. You know, over 80 per cent of them made that commitment, along with the majority of people in this parliament. So for the last couple of days and through question time, listening to all of the puff and waffle, the facts are the Australian public placed Labor in government. And these are the things that we will pursue. We will pursue renewable energy. We will pursue reducing emissions. We will pursue stronger relationships internationally. We will pursue that investment. And that is exactly where we're going, with a broad vision that will make a fundamental difference to the people in this country, while you just keep bleating on about Senator small Krogan. issues. Senator Chandler. Small issues. Goodness gracious me, um, Deputy President. I, I, I honestly thought I'd heard it all um, this week and, and over this last sitting fortnight, but for Labor senators to be um, describing the cost of living crisis as just a small issue um, really does take the cake at almost 3:30 on the last Thursday on the last Thursday of the sitting fortnight um, 
And look, I think um, many Australians listening into Parliament over the last fortnight wouldn't have been particularly impressed by some of what we're hearing. Um, it's been another another week, another sitting day, more broken promises from the government, more dirty deals to get their legislation through this place, um, because we have a government that is just unable to deliver on the commitments that they made during the election. Um, they promised to cut electricity bills by $275. They promised Australians cheaper mortgages. They promised there would be no changes to superannuation, and they promised that Australians could expect to see their cost of living expenses go down. But um, since then, we have just seen the complete opposite of all of those things, um, things occurring. It's just rank hypocrisy from the government. And, and this week, and, and I note um, in Senator Rustin's first question um, in question time today, this week we've seen yet another one. This was a government that promised uh, transparency and accountability and integrity and all of these things, um, the, these commitments that they made to the Australian people um, in the lead up to the election last year, they, they promised to be a, a government of integrity. And yet we now have a situation where it has come to light that the uh, mobile black spot program, um, which has been used to great effect previously to um, support local communities with necessary communications infrastructure, um, is now being used to direct funding to um, a number of seats that are all Labor-held seats. 27 out of 27 grants in New South Wales under this funding stream went to Labor seats. Um, there were only three locations selected in Victoria. They went to Labor seats. Um, the minister has directed that 40 out of the 54 chosen sites in the most recent uh, mobile black spot program, $40 million round, are going to locations in Labor seats. This was a government that promised that it was going to do better. This was a government that promised integrity and transparency and accountability. And quite frankly, Deputy President, I just don't think that that is what um, transparency and accountability and integrity looks like. But like I said, um, this is just another one in the long list of broken promises from this government that is just piling up and piling up and piling up. Um, it is amazing how fast the Prime Minister Anthony Albanese changed his tune from when he was telling Australians that their lives would be easier under a Labor government during the election campaign to then being in government and systematically going back on key election commitments he made. At one point he even stated, and I quote, if you make a promise and a commitment, you do have to stick to it. That sounds like stating the, the very obvious. Um, but the Prime Minister hasn't really stuck to his word, has he? It doesn't stop there. This week we have seen more scheming and broken promises from this government. In doing their deal with the Greens to push through their safeguard mechanism reforms, Labor will inflict further pain on Australians. Instead of working to make life easier for Australians, which I'm sure is something they're probably committed to do during the election campaign as well, Labor has again put the Australian people last. They've capitulated to the demands of the Greens in putting the safeguard mechanism through this place this week and sown the seeds for not only the next energy crisis in this country but the next economic crisis in this country. And we know the impact that that is going to have on hardworking Australians and their families. This Labor Green deal is a hard cap on economic growth. It is a hard cap on new industries. It is a hard cap on existing industries, and it is a hard cap on hard cap on jobs. It will cast doubt over new mining and gas projects, which are going to which have the potential, rather, to provide energy security. These projects are necessary for the production of renewable technologies and projects that will help drive down energy prices. And yet, Labor in bed with the Greens are doing everything they can to completely run these projects off the road. Apparently lowering the cost of electricity isn't that much of a concern for Labor anymore. All this deal is going to accomplish is irreparable damage to the energy market and it will penalise consumers because apparently consumers haven't suffered enough already under this government. If only they'd found it within themselves to pass on the $275 decrease to our power bills, maybe we wouldn't be in this position. Senator White. How good is the community battery grant scheme? It is absolutely fantastic, and it is being rolled out across this country uh, in, in communities. It is, it is the Albanese government uh, delivering on an election commitment. 
commitment to, to roll out 400 batteries in neighbourhoods across the country, delivering more affordable and secure solar power to more Australians. It is a fantastic program which will allow ordinary Australians to store affordable solar energy for use during peak times and to share excess power with other households in their area. Areas like Aston in outer Melbourne, uh, a, typical, uh, work, a typical area uh, in outer Melbourne which is facing an election this Saturday where they'll be weighing up the sort of programs and the, the way in which the Albanese government runs programs like the Community Battery Grant. Programs where you can clearly see what the what the uh, the uh, what you need to do to get a community battery. We're on a website. We're on websites. It talks about how you apply, what the criteria are, and how how you uh, you could be successful. Uh, the people of Aston would appreciate that, I am sure, because in the past. You know, they've had a, a member of parliament who was involved in a significant uh, robo-debt scheme, partially an architect of that, uh, and they've also seen sports rorts where the, the grant schemes were administered through colour-coded uh, spreadsheets. So the, I'm sure in Aston, it, the families of Aston will be weighing those sort of thing, those things up. Of course, it's, it, it is a, a difficult to win. Uh, a by-election as a government, but I'm, and in fact there hasn't been a, a, a winning uh, by-election by a government for about 100 years since 1920. But I'm sure the, the provision of the community battery uh, grant and the way it's being administered by this government will be something that's weighing on the minds of Aston residents as they think about. What they had, pre what the government that they had previously, how grants had been previously administered, and they compare that to this fantastic community battery grant scheme that has already seen 58 community batteries uh, in, uh, grants uh, awarded, uh, and where clear guidelines have been available, and well, they will know that it's possible for their community to have these batteries, uh, the, these battery grants. They know that they, they, they will be offered by an, a group, the Australian Renewable Energy Agency, Arena, and you know, there will be a program to deliver the rest of those batteries. The three other, the 342 other batteries uh, that the government has committed to, uh, at which will be done with stakeholder uh, consultation and will be done with clear guidelines that people can follow and they can see tra the transparency of uh, how they are delivered. As uh, my colleague Senator Grogan said, you know, one in every three Australian ho households have solar panels. That is one of the highest rates in the world. And there are lots of solar panels, can I tell you, in Aston. I've been out there many times. And there are lots of people who have taken up solar panels and they will be looking forward to and are looking forward to things like the Community Battery Grant Scheme and, and whether they can apply for them and whether they can be successful. And really, community batteries uh, are, are going to allow the storage of energy and sharing with others, so your neighbours, and you can also install roof. You know, it's not just rooftop solar. So what this program is doing uh, transparently is putting downward pressure on household electricity costs. It's going to contribute to lower emissions. It's going to provide a benefit to the electricity network. Store solar energy for later use, using or sharing, and uh, support further uh, solar institutions. Uh, installations, it's going to, and it's going to allow households like those in Aston that cannot install solar panels to enjoy the benefits of renewable energy through shared community storage. That's what's going to be one of the things that's going to be weighing on the minds of the good voters of Aston this weekend. Um, not, not only what the government has already delivered, what we will deliver, and also that they have got a fantastic candidate in Mary Doyle uh, in Aston who will be able to prosecute um, their, their needs and represent them. And it's my great hope that uh, on this weekend she gets elected to the members of Aston. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Uh, I want to address two of the questions that were asked today, and they were both directed at uh, Senator Wong, Minister Wong. Uh, first one was from 
coalition Senator Senator Rustin, and the second one was from Senator Cash. Now, uh, I, I got to say, I, I think most of us on this side really rate the question time performance of Minister Wong when she comes in here. She's uh, um, very good at uh, at uh, standing up and uh, delivering uh, a response to uh, to questions that are given. I wouldn't say they are necessarily answers because we are, we ask questions, and they're obviously sometimes they're. Uh, uh, darted and, and, and moving around, and there, there's a bit, bit uh, not, not, not too much direct uh, response to, to the questions that are asked. But uh, the, the first question went to a very serious issue that's emerged, something that's been revealed uh, recently, which is in relation to the Black Spot program. And Senator Wong was asked about that. And uh, sadly, from her response, uh, what I'm getting is flashbacks of what. Uh, Labor is traditionally known for. Uh, the, the, what, they've, what we've got here is a situation where Labor uh, have already conceded that 27 out of the 27 black spot program allocations in New South Wales are all in Labor-held seats. And we've seen previous governments, previous administrations of the Labor kind, uh, have this in their history, this in their pattern, where they deliver programs essentially pork barrelling into their, into their own seats in order to get an electoral gain come election day. Now, the minister admitted, the minister admitted uh, that, uh, that, that, that the minister involved with this program, that they, she personally selected every spot. Now, I imagine she has a map of Liberal and National electorates uh, in, uh, in, in front as she ensured that the uh, constituents of those electorates would not benefit from that program. Now, it so happens that a lot of black spot areas are actually in Liberal and national seats because they're often in rural and regional areas where you know, we, we tend to get a good, get a good vote there uh, by, with a Liberal and national vote. And so no doubt that's what's happened. And uh, this mob over here, they, they like to point the finger, but I remind those opposite that they are and always have been the worst kind of offenders. They just do it particularly artfully, I've got to say. Now, the mobile black spot program is designed to provide funding to improve mobile coverage in areas outside of the metropolitan area. In this round, the communications minister personally selected all 54 locations to receive funding. None of the locations were chosen based on departmental advice. None! of them were chosen. Of the 54 locations chosen by Minister Rowland, three quarters were in Labor electorates, despite Labor holding just a third of the regional seats in New South Wales. 100 per cent, 100 per cent of the 27 locations chosen by the minister were in Labor electorates. In Victoria, three selected locations were in ALP seats. This program, this selection, uh, with the round six of the mobile blocks, black spot program is dodgy. It is dodgy. It is dodgy. It, I must point out the, the sheer hypocrisy of, uh, of this government. Now, I want to read you a quote, and I'll, give you, I'll, I'll see if you can guess who might have said it, uh, uh, Senator Scar and uh, Senator, Senator Cash in here. And, uh, the taxpayer funds, taxpayer funds are ones that are paid for by hard workers they deserve better than to have their taxpayer funds from their hard work funneled into marginal electorates, uh, than to have, sorry, than, the, better than to have their taxpayer funds from their hard funneled into marginal electorates on the basis of a political whim. We need governments to be held to account for their actions. Sounds like Prime Minister Albanese. Prime Minister Albanese, that is right. Prime Minister Albanese said that when he was the opposition leader. When he was the opposition leader, the Prime Minister said this in 2021. 2021. Now, the other point I did say I wanted to touch on Senator Cash's uh, question, uh, which went to the electricity prices. Now, Minister Wong was asked if she was in touch with the cost of, of electricity, and her answer demonstrated that she actually doesn't. They, they point every time we're asking these questions to their, uh, their, their, their policy they rushed through the parliament just before Christmas. Just before Christmas. Now, they, if it was so successful, Labor, if it was so successful, then why don't you explain to the Australian people why their electricity prices have actually gone up? And why don't you explain how it's not doing anything to actually deliver on the reduction of price that you said you would deliver 97 times before the election, that it would go down by $275. I put the question to the motion 
Moved by Senator Brockman. Those for the question say aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. Senator Wish Wilson. Note of uh, Senator Wong's uh, answers to questions asked by Senator Shoebridge. Today, Senator Shoebridge, on behalf of the Australian Greens, asked a very important question. Also, on behalf of millions of Australians and even more people around the world, did our Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, raise the political persecution and freeing of Julian Assange with the American President and the UK Prime Minister? when he met with them two weeks ago. And the answer we had from Senator Wong was that somehow we can't intervene in the extradition of Julian Assange because there are legal processes underway. I wanted to deal with two things here. Firstly, Senator Wong didn't want to answer the question. She didn't want to say yes or no where the Prime Minister raised it. I'll draw my own conclusions from that, as will the Australian people. The answer is almost certainly it wasn't raised with the American President or the UK Prime Minister. The two men, in fact the three men together, who can make a decision to free Julian Assange. Secondly, what Senator Wong said in here was rubbish. It is patently false that for some legal process underway prevents a political intervention on behalf of Julian Assange. Let me make this really clear to the Australian Senate. Julian Assange is a political prisoner, and only a political intervention will free him. Our Prime Minister could ask the US President to drop the extradition charges, even while they're underway, and that's it. Mr Assange will finally walk free. We also know in the UK that once a court makes its decision, the final decision on extradition lies with the Prime Minister and the Attorney-General. Once again, a political decision. So why didn't Mr Albanese raise this with the UK Prime Minister or the US President? He could have ended it two weeks ago for Mr Assange, who's sitting in a maximum security prison, Belmarsh Prison in the UK, for telling the truth. For senators who aren't aware, he is being extradited to the US on espionage charges. The first foreign journalist conducting an activity on foreign soil to ever be extradited to the US. This is not only a massive breach of the US First Amendment, pro politically persecuting a journalist for doing their job. This is an attack on press freedoms all around the planet. The stakes couldn't be higher around the extradition of Julian Assange. And once again, the Australian Greens will stand up in the Australian Parliament for Julian Assange, for his family, Mr John Shipton, who continually comes into Parliament and tries to get meetings with members of Parliament, who works with the Parliamentary Friends of Assange Group. And I'd, not, I'd like to acknowledge the work that the Parliamentary Friends of Assange Group do on behalf of Mr Assange, right across the political spectrum, not just here in Australia but in parliaments uh, all around the world, these groups are forming. And as Senator Wong did acknowledge in her question today, there is a very strong public sentiment in this country to free Mr Assange, an Australian citizen, a publisher who was just doing his job. Senators, we can't let this stand on our watch that an Australian citizen is seeking his freedom for doing his job, and our government does nothing. Mr Albanese said he agrees enough is enough and wants to see Mr Assange released. Senator Wong has expressed similar sentiments, and they've called for quiet diplomacy. And as my colleague Senator Shoebridge asked so well in here today, why are we not putting the question when the three men are together behind closed doors that couldn't be, there couldn't be a better example of quiet diplomacy than those three men discussing the freedom of Julian Assange. So Australians will be very disappointed if Prime Minister Anthony Albanese didn't raise this. And unfortunately, it appears from Senator Wong's non-answer to Senator Shoebridge's question today that this issue wasn't clearly enough of a priority for the Prime Minister. So the campaign goes on to keep putting pressure on the Prime Minister and President Biden in the US and the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. 
Prime Minister Sunak to free Julian Assange. And I call on all Australian people who care about democracy and press freedoms to, to continue to push their MPs to bring Julian Assange home. I put to the question that the motion moved by Senator Wish Wilson be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Pursuant to the order agreed to earlier today concerning the Freedom of Information Commissioner, I call the Minister representing the Attorney General, Senator Watt. Thank you, Deputy President. On the 27th of March this year, the government complied with the order for production of documents relating to the resignation of the Freedom of Information Commissioner and some related matters agreed between the Greens Party and the Liberal National Coalition. On behalf of the Attorney General, I tabled dozens of, doc of pages of documents in response to the order. Material irrelevant to the order was not produced. I also made a public interest immunity claim on behalf of the Attorney General over parts of those documents and other documents. That claim, related to Cabinet deliberations and privacy, was consistent with long-standing and accepted Senate practice. I commend my letter to the President for the details of that claim, including the harm that would result from disclosure. I note in particular it is, it is totally obvious that questions about resourcing of agencies go to the heart of the budget process and therefore the heart of the Cabinet process. It's perhaps not surprising that the Greens Party struggles to recognise that, uh, not being a party of government, but the Liberal and National Party coalition, including failed ministers from the former government, understand it all too well. The coalition's support for the original order and its support for the motion today are acts of wanton opportunism. During their nine years in office, the coalition had absolutely no respect for this chamber. The former government routinely ignored orders to produce documents. The former government routinely refused to answer questions from committees and senators. And relevantly, it treated the freedom of information system with utter contempt. It left the position of FOI commissioner unfilled for seven years. It was filled on the eve of the last election without a merit-based selection process. The former Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, created a sham cabinet committee to hide documents from scrutiny. He declared without any basis that National Cabinet was a committee of the Federal Cabinet. Mr Morrison also created a bespoke exemption when responding to FOI requests. His office used to tell applicants he was above the law. The former Prime Minister refused to answer questions from the Parliament and the press about his attempt to invite Brian Houston to the White House and his QAnon House guests, guests at the official residences. The former government turned scandal into an art form, whether it be sports rorts, car park rorts and the Leppington Triangle affair. Senator Cash famously hid behind a whiteboard so she didn't have to take questions about how her refusal to make a police statement regarding her office leaking details of a police raid on a Senator union Scar, office. Senator a point of order. Point of order, Deputy President. Uh, there's a personal reflection on Senator Cash impugning her motives, saying she hid behind a whiteboard to hide questions. It impugns her motive. It's a personal reflection on Senator Cash, and it should be withdrawn, especially in light of the statement we heard earlier today from the President. To give the Chamber order, Lee, Senator White, I'd ask you to withdraw to keep the to withdraw. The, chamber. Uh, the now Shadow Treasurer, Mr Taylor, uh, of course, was caught up in the incident involving fake documents to attack the Lord Mayor of Sydney and never explained or apologised his, for his role in the grassland scandal involving his appropriately named company Jamland. The now Assistant tre Shadow Treasurer, Mr Robert, attracts oh, more Senator controversy Scar, by— Another point of order, I assume. Another point of order. I, I think it's good that the minister withdrew his previous remark, but now he's just moved on to cast personal reflections on another, on another previous member and a member of this place. And again, he should withdraw and take note of the president's statement. Well, it's not, I, don't, I don't believe it reached that, that, that level of uh, requiring withdrawal. So I, I'll call the minister and just ask him to be cautious with his with his uh, statement to the House. Thank you for that ruling, Deputy President. In fact, I uh, revised the words of what I'd been provided with to take note of your earlier ruling. Uh, but it is true uh, that in addition to Mr Taylor, Senator Cash and many other ministers, the now Assistant tra tra Shadow Treasurer, Mr Robert, attracts more controversy by the day, sometimes by the hour. And let's not forget Mr Morrison's secret ministries. They were in fact so secret that he didn't even tell his co-portfolio ministers, let alone the Parliament. 
Deputy President, on behalf of the Attorney General, I maintain my public interest immunity claim. I also note the misunderstanding present in the motion presented by Senator Shoebridge with the unflinching support of his new Friends in Transparency, the Coalition. The order for production did not seek a resignation letter from the FOI Commissioner. Further, I refer the Senate to one of the documents tabled by the government, the FOI Commissioner's message to staff on 6 March 2023. That message begins, Dear colleagues, I am writing to let you know that I have written to the Governor-General to resign my appointment. Deputy President, as I outlined to my letter, in my letter to the President on 27 March uh, this year, in the 2022-23 financial year, the government provided the uh, OAIC with $29.6 million in funding. The government will, act, will continue to work closely with the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner to understanding resourcing, understand resourcing requirements to ensure its effective operation. Unlike the former government, the position of FOI Commissioner will be filled, and it will be filled with a candidate selected through a merit-based selection process. I thank the Senate. Senator Shoebridge, do you wish to move to take note? Uh, I do. Uh, I move to take note of the Minister's answer. Um, uh, Deputy President, rarely have I heard such tosh. The, uh, the minister stands up here and has the gall to say that the, that the order for papers did not include the resignation letter of the commissioner, a commissioner who could barely spend 12 months in the job with this government, refusing to fund his office, refusing to fund freedom of information, and less than 12 months into the job basically resigned in disgust. And the, the, the call for papers, the order for the production of documents, um, included this to produce all briefing, file notes, etc., held by the Attorney General and his office um, in relation to the resignation of Mr. Leo Hardiman. Um, or any, or get this, um, um, any correspondence between the Attorney General's Department and the Freedom of Information Commission in relation to the Commissioner's resignation. So did, did the Commissioner not resign via correspondence? Was it a smoke signal that was sent from the Commissioner? Did he do, did he do it by, sort of, by pigeon um, or some sort of weird hand signal from place to place? Well, of course it covered the letter of resignation. And, and the specious nonsense we just heard from the government then, from the government then, if that is really the quality of the legal advice coming out of the AG's office, that that isn't covered by the order for papers, well, it's an embarrassment to the office. And it's an embarrassment to the minister to come and repeat that rubbish in the Senate. Of course it was covered. And the fact that they, they, they may have some, some ridiculously, patently false legal argument that it's not covered, give them credit that they've tried to come up with some creative legal argument in the office about why it's not covered. Assume they did that. They spent a week coming up with that rubbish. Assume they did that. If they did do that, well, then less credit on them too. If they did that, then less credit, because obviously the resignation letter was being sought in this. And if they've come up with some specious legal nonsense that satisfied for them when they got around the water cooler and tried to come up with ways of defeating transparency, well, that's even less credit on the attorney. And I say again, it won't end here. To the minister, produce the resignation letter. To the attorney, live up to the rhetoric. Live up to the rhetoric and you won't be embarrassed like this. We've heard a lot of rhetoric about wanting to fix the freedom of, the information, of, freedom of information. And, 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 and I want to be clear, it fell into deep disrepute under the previous government, a gross lack of funding. Um, contempt by ministers and departments about the system. But this government came in promising it would be different. And we had all the rhetoric from the attorney in, as a shadow. And I've got to tell you, as soon as the shadow disappeared, there sure as hell wasn't any sunshine. It, 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 we haven't come from a shadow AG into one that wants to put sunshine on, on the workings of government. We've come from a shadow AG into an even deeper shadow in government. Into an even deeper shadow in government. And, and, and this was a chance to try and do the right thing, to actually show us why the Commissioner resigned. Because the public needs to know why the Commissioner resigned, less than 12 months into a five-year appointment. And we're asking to show some shine, shine some sunshine into the resignation of the FOI Commissioner. And you couldn't have a greater example of political irony 
than the new Attorney General responding to a call for papers about the resignation of the FOI Commissioner with a specious rubbish legal argument about why it wasn't covered, and then pages and pages and pages of blacked out documents. It was like high level political irony, this return. But I have to say, if the Attorney General and the Minister thinks we'll be satisfied with a nonsense explanation and pages and pages of blacked out documents on something as critical as why did the Freedom of Information Commissioner resign and why won't you show us the resignation papers, then I think there's going to be a surprise coming because it won't end here. And it won't end with that, with that ridiculous non-explanation uh, from the minister. The Senate deserves answers. The, the thousands and thousands of Australians who are waiting years to get their FOI reviews uh, resolved deserve answers. And the people of Australia deserve answers, not that tosh we just got served up. Senator Cash, and then I will give the call if Labor wishes it, and then back. To, then we'll go back to the Greens. And then Thank we'll... you very much, uh, Deputy President. And I think uh, it'll be fair to say that it is not often that Senator Shoebridge and I are going to ever agree in this chamber. Uh, but Senator Shoebridge, in relation to in relation to the response that has just been provided to the chamber by Senator Watt, um, I heartily agree with your comments. That was absolute tosh, nothing more and nothing less. Clearly, Senator Watt, on behalf of the Attorney General of Australia, doesn't actually get the irony of what he was responding to. An order for production of documents in relation to the resignation of the Freedom of Information Commissioner. One would think the mere fact that it was the Freedom of Information Commissioner would actually trigger to them, perhaps as a government that allegedly believes in transparency and integrity, we might be a little freer with the information that we provide. But instead, all we got from Senator Watt, on behalf of the Attorney-General, uh, was personal reflections uh, in relation to ministers in the previous government. And I often say, if you actually can't address the policy, uh, why not just go for the person? Uh, well, guess what? That does not work when you are providing an explanation to the Australian Senate. But I do note that the explanation was provided on behalf of the Attorney-General of right. Australia. Now, the Attorney-General is someone who does talk a very, very, very big game. But when it comes to actually practising what the Attorney-General himself loves to preach uh, to all Australians, not just to the legal fraternity, but to all Australians, he fails in every regard, mm. and in particular in relation to the dismal response to the order for production of documents. I just want to quote the Attorney General from a speech that he gave as we marked International Universal Access to Information Day, also known as Right to Know Day. Now, this is the Attorney General of Australia setting out the Albanese government's principles when it comes to access for information. And he says this. This global event recognises the importance of the community's right to know and to access to government-held information. It also reinforces the role of government in promoting transparency and accountability. He then makes a comment in relation to the previous government. He says, regrettably, the previous government did not believe that Australians have a right to know. But it's the next few words by which the Attorney General will unfortunately stand damned, because he says this. In contrast, the Albanese government is committed to restoring public trust and strengthening standards of integrity in our federal government. Well, he's certainly preaching. <laughs> Open access to information is essential for good decision making, genuine engagement in democratic government and combating corruption. Again, the bad news is he's only preaching here. And then he says this. In fact, in saying this, I'd almost believe that I would have got something better than what was provided to the Senate. Citizens need this access to know how they are being government, governed. He also says, today we acknowledge the importance of the Freedom of Information Act. 
The proactive disclosure of government-held information promotes colleagues, wait for it, open government and advances our system of representative democracy. Well, the bad news for the Attorney General of Australia is again, he loves to preach, he's well known for it, especially in legal circles around Australia, but he's also known for the fact that he fails to practice. And what was on display today was a justification by the minister representing the Attorney General of Australia in relation to his failure to practice the standards that he so eloquently preaches to others around Australia when it comes to access to information, but not only that, the standards that he continues to tell Australians the Albanese government will be judged by. And this is how he concluded the speech. I want to conclude by assuring you all that the Albanese government is firmly committed to transparency and accountability to ensure we have better government for all Australians. What an absolute load of tosh, as Senator Shrewbridge so eloquently said. Uh, just wait, Senator Carr. I was going to give the call to Labor, but um, in the absence of someone seeking the call, uh, is anyone from the Greens seeking the call? Well, Senator Scar, but I point out if another Labor member later, after Senator Scar seeks the call, I'll give the call to Labor. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. And I note that there has been a reference made to the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee, uh, of which I'm the chair in relation to the position with respect to Australia's FOI laws. Uh, and I congratulate Senator Shoebridge with respect to being part of that reference. And like Senator Shoebridge, I must say, this is just bizarre. This is absolutely bizarre. I'm actually in the process of rereading Franz Kafka's book, The Trial, and this is Kafkaesque. This is Kafkaesque. This, exactly. This, this order for production of documents, this is what the order for production of documents says. And there are people in the gallery listening to this. So I just want to read this out. This is what this Senate ordered and provided to the Attorney-General with respect to this order for production of documents. Any correspondence between the Attorney-General and or his office and the Attorney-General's department in relation to the resignation of Mr Leo Hardiman, PSM, KC, as Freedom of Information Commissioner dated 5 March 2023. Any correspondence, any correspondence. And we hear that the letter of resignation, the actual letter of resignation, isn't captured on the basis of the attorney's interpretation, the order for, for production of documents. He didn't consider the letter of resignation being captured by the order for production of documents. This is absolutely bizarre. And in agreement with Senator Shoebridge, it baffles me. It baffles me that someone could look at the words in that order for production of documents, which so clearly if one was to look at substance over form, you don't even have to do that. But if you look at the clear intention of that document, provide us all the documents in relation to the resignation of the Freedom of Information Commissioner, well, would that include the letter of resignation? Yeah, I think it might. I think it might. I think that might be relevant. I think that might be a relevant document in relation to the documents pertaining to the resignation of the Freedom of Information Commissioner. It might be directly relevant. It might go to the heart of the issue and to actually, actually have this debate in relation to the failure of the attorney to meet the order for production of documents in accordance with its clear terms, to have this debate with respect to the suppression of information in relation to the Freedom of Information Commissioner himself. It's even more bizarre and more Kafkaesque. Extraordinary stuff. Just extraordinary stuff. And I, I, I feel I actually feel, I feel sympathetic to uh, Senator Watt from Queensland that he actually had to come in and read that statement. I, I, it must have been embarrassing for him. And it's not the first time he's been uh, forced to come into this chamber and read a statement on behalf of another minister, causing, which no doubt caused him embarrassment. I can remember the time he had to come into this chamber and read the statement with respect to Nauru not being uh, the continued as a regional processing country because it had been overlooked by the Minister for Home Affairs and he had to come and explain that situation. And now he's had to come and explain this. Just, just reflect on how silly this is. 
that the resignation letter of the Freedom of Information Act Commissioner was not considered relevant for an order for production of documents or documents relating to the resignation of the Freedom of Information Act Commissioner. It is just bizarre. It is bizarre. It is Kafkaesque. And, and seriously, the attorney needs to reflect on this. This is an embarrassment. The attorney is the first law officer of the Australian uh, of the Commonwealth of Australia. He is the first law officer. He needs to reflect yes. on this because this is an embarrassment, an absolute embarrassment. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator McKenzie. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy Chair. Well, I also rise uh, to support Senator Shoebridge not only seeking documents from executive government, as is the right of all senators in this chamber and has always been, uh, but also the comments of Senator Cash and Senator Scar. What we have sadly seen from this government over 10 months is the decline in transparency, decline in accountability and indeed a decline in integrity and a decline in respect for this chamber. We have seen it this week in guillotine motions over significant legislation. Uh, we have seen it with the way they treat uh, senators not in the executive or not in government, uh, with the speaking time and the, question, the lack of answers on significant um, questions. And I, just listening to Senator Watt's contribution, where he freelanced from uh, Senator Minister Dreyfus's um, comments, severely reflecting not only on former ministers of the government, uh, current senators and indeed former prime ministers, as if that is the only reason that they haven't complied with a very sensible um, order for production of documents from Senator Shoebridge. But we shouldn't be surprised because indeed it was Senator Watt who, whilst in here earlier this week, and had realised he'd actually forgotten uh, another essential document to him actually complying with the order of production of documents around Organic Australia. He just had slipped his mind that the letter from Organics Australia uh, to him as Agriculture Minister in December wasn't part of the documents requested. Um, and he only once they, that organisation themselves had publicly released the document, that private correspondence, did he suddenly rush in here and table it. It was just incredible, along with another 13 documents he'd actually forgotten uh, to lodge the first time. The casual disregard that these ministers, who are senators, should know better and that they are not spending their time assisting ministers from the other place to take this chamber seriously because this is a powerful house of examination. This is the place where the diversity of Australia's um, voting public is expressed in a unique way. And so there are requests from this chamber uh, that will be made periodically that will never happen over in the other place, because this is the only place we can hold the executive to account. This is our role. Um, and it's one that we, uh, I think, should take very, very seriously. In terms of um, Odgers, I'd just like to quote from page seven. Um, the most dangerous of all sinister interests is that of the executive government, because it is the most powerful. And therefore, the Senate has a unique and special role to play. And executive government in this place needs to do their part by treating senators and this chamber with respect. And I would have thought that the Attorney General, who talks a lot about transparency, accountability, integrity, well, they're not just words. They're actually character traits. They're actually behaviours that you must exhibit, not just as uh, a citizen um, and in your personal life, but clearly and essentially and uh, desperately as someone that is in a position of power. Minister Dr the AG, we were 
quoting him on the 28th of September 22. We are serious about restoring trust and integrity to government. Well, if you're serious about restoring trust and integrity to executive government, guess what? Table the documents that are ordered by the Senate. Absolutely. Um, you know, again, on the 1st of December last year, concerned about breaches of the principles of parliamentary responsibility and accountability. Attorney General, you can't just go and on ABC Radio Melbourne uh, and make contributions in the parliament on Hansard, throwing these words around so casually. You must live by it. You must actually table the documents and treat this Senate with the respect it deserves. If there are no further speakers, I'll put the question that the Senate take note of answers. Now, pursuant to the order agreed to earlier today concerning the national minimum wage, I now call the minister representing the minister for him. Shouting from your seat, waving hands around to me means nothing. Is there a point of order? Well, first of all, I wasn't waving my hands, and secondly, I wasn't shouting. You were shouting the at point me, of order. Was a hand waving. Don't argue. Have you got a point of order? I wasn't waving my hands, and I wasn't shouting. The, you, you, you're have you got a point of order? inappropriately from the chair on a member. Do you have a point of order? I have a point of order. What is it? You failed to put the last question. I'm just put, I just put the question. Were you not listening? I put the question, and I'll do it again. Point of order? I, I just ask for courtesy from the chair. You did not put the question. I put the question and, I'd ask and for I'll do from it the again. Chair. I'd ask Resume for courtesy. your seat. As I said earlier, the question is before the motion before the Senate that the, that the Senate take note of answers. You want the question reread again? Those of that opinion say aye. Against no. No. Aye. Thank you. Ayes ever. Now. As I was saying, pursuant to the order agreed to earlier today concerning the national minimum wage, I now call the minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations. Senator draw your Chief. attention to the state of the chamber. Quorum, ring the bells. Minister. Hello. Hello. Acting Deputy, acting Deputy President. Uh, our government is acting to boost wages and close the gender pay gap to help workers with cost of living pressures, with no thanks at all to the opposition. Our values have not changed, and the Albanese government will always stand up for workers. 
Uh, let's just take for a minute uh, pause and remember the coalition's legacy when it comes to wages, which is of course the subject of this debate. The coalition, while in power, refused to make a submission to the aged care work value case. Senator Cash, uh, as the then minister, and all of her colleagues never met workers who they thought had any value whatsoever, let alone in the aged care sector. The former government refused to argue that wages of low-paid workers shouldn't even go backwards in their annual wage review submission. This was a major issue heading into the last election, uh, and we repeatedly called on the government of the day to make a submission to the annual wage review that at least said that workers' wages shouldn't go backwards. But they wouldn't even do that, uh, because, of course, we all remember that one of the, the key policies of the former government was that a deliberate design feature of their economic architecture was low-wage growth. For the coalition, there never seems to be a good time for a wage increase for workers. Under the coalition, Australian workers were told to wait for low unemployment and then they'd get a pay rise, told to wait for productivity increases and then they'd get a pay rise. But of course it never happened. We had falling unemployment no pay rises, no real wage growth. We had productivity increases, no real wage growth. And under their watch, workers saw the slowest sustained pace of wages growth in Australia's post-war history, averaging just 2.1 per cent in nominal wages growth over almost 10 years of their government. The coalition voted no on the Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill. They opposed it before they'd even read the bill. The coalition said no before they even read a bill that was about delivering secure jobs and better pay to Australian workers. And you know why they, they were willing to do so before they'd even read the bill? Because they were scared off by the name of the bill. Secure jobs, better pay. Are there two things that are more anathema to the coalition parties of this, uh, of this country than those two concepts? As soon as they read those, those words, secure jobs, better pay, the coalition ran a mile and said they wouldn't even support the bill. Uh, and of course, if we look back at the various statements made uh, by uh, members of the coalition, it just shows where they stand on these issues around wages uh, and the annual wage review, because those opposite have a track record of saying no to anything that will push up workers' wages. As I say, the former finance minister, the former leader of the government of the day in the Senate, uh, Matthias Cormann described low wage growth as a deliberate design feature of our economic architecture. Uh, when uh, the now Prime Minister, Mr Albanese, declared his support for an increase to the minimum wage, uh, Mr Morrison, the then Prime Minister, labelled Mr Albanese reckless and dangerous. And I think it's all, way, all been recorded uh, that that was a pretty decisive moment in the election campaign when Australians saw what the coalition were about and they saw that there was only one party that was serious about delivering the wage rises that Australian workers deserve. Mr Taylor, Angus Taylor, uh, his, his statements in September last year on multi-employer bargaining. He opposed it because, quote, it pushes up wages and pushes up prices. This is a bad place to go. What we saw coming out of the job summit was fuel on the inflationary fire. Of course it's not true to say um, that there has to be a connection between increasing wages and inflation. And in fact, I see the most recent figures show that inflation is beginning to come down a little bit, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, but yet, yet again, we see uh, opposition from the coalition to the concept of wage rises. And of course, their leader, Mr Dutton, who said in response uh, to the Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill, I'm deeply concerned that this bill, quote, is going to result in higher wages. That was their objection to the Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill, was that it might, after 10 years of workers being denied real wage growth, do something about wage growth. Uh, we make no apologies as a Labor government for standing up for the interests of workers and standing up for their need to get a fair, a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. Uh, and that's why our government is acting to get wages moving and close the gender pay gap. In the first six months, the Albanese government delivered the strongest jobs growth for any new Australian government on record. Gender equality and women's economic security is at the heart of the government's agenda. We amended the Fair Work Act to put gender equality at the centre of the Fair Work Commission's decision making. We have asked the Fair Work Commission to ensure that it considers the impact of its annual wage decision on these objectives. 
Unlike the opposition, who had a decade to get wages moving while in government, the Labor government, under Prime Minister Albanese, has not wasted a day in standing up for workers. In our first week in government, we made a submission to the annual wage review to argue that low-paid workers should not go backwards. We've used existing structures to back workers and their wages, structures that were already in place under the former government and never used by them to this effect. We made a submission to the annual wage review submission, uh, which of course delivered a 5.2 per cent pay rise for the low paid last year. And this year we will again argue that low paid workers should not go backwards. Our governments, have not, our governments' values have not changed. We will always stand up for the needs of working people in this country. And of course, we, as I've already said, with the aged care case, we made a submission arguing that aged care workers are undervalued on gender grounds. And as a result of that and the decisions that have followed, on 1 July, 250,000 aged care workers will get a pay rise of 15 per cent, meaning $3.40 more per hour for the lowest paid direct care workers. These are good things for workers and these are good things for the economy because people who have more money in their pocket can actually spend more and, uh, and pay for the bills that they, they face every day and every week. Uh, we've changed the law in a range of other ways to back workers and their wages. Stronger gender pay equity laws, better access to flexible working arrangements, gender equality and job security as objects of the Fair Work Act, improving our bargaining system for workers and employers, and these laws are already working. The most recent Fair Work Commission data shows that there were 476 agreements, workplace agreements lodged in December 2022, 50 per cent more than July 2022. There are employers who are now back at the bargaining table who haven't bargained in years, and that's delivering certainty for employers and better pay for workers. We're now moving on to changing the law uh, to, to close a range of loopholes that were left by the former government. We're now gov consulting on our election commitment to deliver same job, same pay, particularly for, for labour hire workers, uh, to, to address the situation faced by employee-like workers, to deliver fair minimum standards for gig economy workers, and also we're tackling wage theft. We're acting to close loop loopholes, we're boosting wages, we're closing the gender pay gap and easing cost of living pressures. And to each one of these things, the opposition just says no. Thank you, Minister. Just before I call anyone, Senator Shoebridge, I have reflected and I apologise. I did read the question, but I forgot to call the vote. My sincere apologies, and I won't blame late sitting nights. I slipped up. Sorry, Senator Shoebridge. Uh, Acting Deputy President, what I was truly offended by were your comments given to me, directed to me while I was seeking the advice of the Deputy Clerk, and I'd ask you to uncategorically apologise for those comments. You've got an uncategorically, uncategorically apologetic um, wording from me. Apologies, yes. Okay? And I mean that. I apologise. Is there anything else you want to add, Senator Shoebridge? It is, uh, I, it is, I, can, uh, I can indicate I've never had that level of discourtesy um, before from a chair in my previous time in the Legislative Council, and I hope to never see it again from you as a deputy chair in this, in this chamber. I felt unsafe in the workplace, and I felt it coming from the chair, and I'd ask you to reflect seriously on your conduct, because it was totally out of order, but I otherwise accept what I understand to be your apology. I have reflected, Senator Shoebridge. Thank you for that. Um, Senator Sheldon. Good. Thank you very much. And you know, isn't it a great deal of amazement that we have the people that brought the lowest wage increases in the history of this country? Sorry, Senator, sorry, Senator, sorry, Senator Sheldon. You just need to move the tape, mate, please, right? No, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Well, isn't it amazing to see that we've got this situation where we've got the, those opposite raising the issue of the minimum wage? Because these are the same people that had a design feature of keeping the wages down in this country. And they went to the extent, in the case of workers in the, receiving a $1 an hour wage increase, the minimum wage. They opposed it. When it came to job security and secure jobs and pay, the arrangement to turn around and make sure that we got wages moving in this country, they opposed it. Because they've always been about making sure they can keep wages as low as they possibly can. And what we've seen on a case after case, how it's inherently part of their makeup. 
It's in their DNA, right across the opposition. Even more recently, when I was in the Cost of Living Committee hearing, and Senator Hume, the Shadow Finance Minister, turning around and saying on the 1st of March at that hearing, when I asked questions of the major supermarkets who have had major price uh, profit, uh, soaring pr uh, profit during this period of inflation, we have seen Woolworths posted a 25 per cent rise in profits. Coles posted a net profit grew by 11 per cent. And she said that the issue of raising issues with those particular retailers and retailers like them was inappropriate when you start talking about cost of living and wages in the context of those retailers. Well, quite clearly, when you're looking at wages in this country, you need to be looking at all the effects that these, the previous government's legislation had on the cost of living. And that's why we've turned around and made so many important changes. As I said, we supported the $1 increase in the minimum wage, an increase that supported both men and women in low-paid roles, but 55 per cent of those workers in low-paid roles are women, that they opposed, was opposed by those opposite. Now, you seem to, in the case of the various issues that have been brought up during the cost of living inquiry, as I touched on before, that we've seen where they've turned around, those opposite, and have said their view that the wages factor in cost of living is irrelevant. That it was inappropriate to ask some of the most profit-taking corporations in this country about what was happening with their wages and the cost of living of their workforce and those workers across the economy. They were saying it was inappropriate because they don't think people's wages has anything to do with cost of living. It's all about profit taking. In actual fact, did they ask questions of profit taking? No, they actually asked questions about the price of eggs and barn eggs in comparison with caged eggs, uh, free ranged eggs, and how this was an inappropriate way of pushing up cost of living. My goodness, I was in an inquiry about cost of living. And we were talking the difference between barn egg prices and caged egg prices and prices for eggs out in the free range, rather than talking about the issue of that's actually at the heart of the biggest problem that we have across this country, one of the biggest problems, and that is the cost of living pressures that are on our uh, family uh, budgets. Now, I just want to go to what the history of those opposite has been, because during the election campaign, the then opposition leader was asked by the Prime Minister, the now Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, was asked of the then Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, if all workers deserved to be paid the minimum wage. And the Prime Minister refused to say yes. When asked a question about the pay rates and the minimum wage being paid to gig workers, food delivery workers, the workers had turned around and actually were, the, some, were some of the heroes of the pandemic were delivering to households that were isolated, putting themselves at high risk, what are, and some of the lowest paid workers and underpaid workers in this country, he could not say that he supported the minimum wage being paid, because that's in their DNA. We've got the Minister, Shadow Minister for Finance saying that cost of living isn't a wage-based issue either. We've got them opposing the $1 wage an hour increase in the minimum wage. We've got them opposing legislation to get wages moving again through the Secure Jobs Package. We've got the previous Prime Minister saying that the minimum wage being paid to food delivery workers and gig workers is inappropriate. And of course, Senator as I talk Sheldon, about. Senator your time gig... has expired. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. And I also rise to take note of the Minister's statement. And isn't it interesting? that despite all of the rhetoric which we heard from the minister on behalf of uh, the Minister for uh, Workplace Relations, the bad news for Australians is their wages are still going backwards. And despite all the political rhetoric we heard in relation to cost of living, Australians, when it comes to cost of living, are still struggling. You see, the Labor Party made a number of promises to the Australian people prior to the election. 
And you'd actually think, based on the statement that was given by the minister, and even I have to say the taking note that Senator Sheldon himself did in response, that everything was okay. That electricity prices weren't going up, interest rates weren't going up, inflation uh, hadn't soared too. In fact, you'd almost believe that they were getting wages moving, as they promised the Australian people prior to the election. But as we know, Labor are very, very good at spinning the narrative. And sometimes just spinning the narrative, people forget to check behind what's really going on. Well, let's have a look at what's really going on. Because we saw with the wage price index figures last month, the promises that Labor make, but worse than that, the political rhetoric that has just been given in this chamber does not stack up, A, with the promises that were made by the Albanese government prior to the election, but also to the statement that's just been made in the Senate. Because you see, this is the reality. Australians are seeing a real wage cut under the Albanese Labor government. So despite what they said before the election, how they would get wages moving, they would make sure that Australians were not going backwards. Let's now talk about, in the cold light of day, let's shine some sunlight on the reality that Australians are experiencing. Their wages are going backwards. Here are the statistics. The level of wage growth in the economy is far below the level of inflation. Australians will tell you that because guess what? Every time they walk into a supermarket, they buy the exact same basket of goods as they did the previous week and the previous month. And yet what they know when the person at the checkout says, this is your bill, is that it is getting higher. They also know that when they've received their energy bill, despite the promise prior to the election, that your energy bill would be reduced by $275, they know, forget about $275, their energy bills are now far in excess of what they used to be. The level of wage growth in our economy, despite all of the rhetoric, despite all of the promises by those in the Albanese government, is now far below the level of inflation. Well, guess what? That's because of the policy decisions that the Albanese government are making. They want everybody to see the headline. We will promise to get wages moving. We'll make sure Australians don't go backwards. And yet what do the December quarter figures show? Well, they show the wage price index was 3.3 per cent versus CPI of 7.8 per cent. That is not getting wages moving. That is not ensuring that Australians go back, don't go backwards. In fact, what the reality is versus the rhetoric is the December figure showed the largest real wage decline in a 12-month period on record. And again, Contrast that, because again, despite the rhetoric, despite what you heard from those on the other side, under the previous coalition government, we saw real wage increases. Why? Because of the decisions that we made. We backed in employers to prosper, to grow, to create more jobs for Australians, and in doing that, they could provide wage rises to Australians. Despite the rhetoric, Labor are failing, and based on their decisions, they'll continue to fail. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. I'd just like to contribute to this debate uh, as well. And I deeply respect Senator Sheldon and everything he's done in the industrial relations space, but I say to Senator Sheldon through you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, that the reality, the reality does not reflect Senator Sheldon's rhetoric. The reality does not reflect Senator Sheldon's rhetoric with respect to real wages growth. And I want to refer to an article written by Shane Wright, an outstanding economic 
uh, economics journalist in the Sydney Morning Herald, uh, and dated 22 February 2023, entitled Australians Hit by Largest Fall in Real Wages on Record. That's what it says. That's what it says. Australians hit by largest fall in real wages on record. And I want to give a quote from that article from someone who I suspect cares very deeply about this issue and whose words should be carefully reflected on. And this is what this person said, quoted in this article, on the reality of real wages growth under a Labor Albanese government. And this is what they said. And this is, bear in mind, this is 22 March 2023, some nine months after the federal election. So nine months after there was a change in government, this is what this person with an intense interest in real wages said. I quote, this is the greatest drop in workers' real pay in recorded history, end quote. And who was this person? Sally McManus, the ACTU secretary. That's what she said. Nine months after a Labor government came in with promises of real wage growth, this is what she said. This is the greatest drop in workers' real pay in recorded history, end quote. How's that? How's that for not meeting a promise? This is the greatest drop in workers' real pay in recorded history, end quote. And then I want to quote to you from Callum Pickering, who's also quoted in the same article. Not a politician. This is an Asia-Pacific economist with the job website Indeed. And this is what this person says, Mr Callum Pickering. Not a politician, no rhetoric here, just facts. Adjusted for inflation, Australian wages have fallen by 4.2 per cent over the past year and by 6.8 per cent since their peak, he said. More than a decade, and that would be the decade under the coalition government, more than a decade of hard-won wage gains, our blood, sweat and tears, lost over the course of just one year. Lost over the course of just one year. And, and nine of the 12 months of that one year were under the Labor Albanese government, which promised real wage growth. So those opposite can come in with the re rhetoric. The Australian workers understand what the real position is with respect to real wages. And again, I'll quote from Sally McManus, Secretary of the ACTU. This is what she said in March 2023. This is the greatest drop in workers' real pay in recorded history, end quote. End quote. The large, greatest drop in workers' real pay in recorded history from the Secretary of the ACTU, nine months after an Albanese Labor government. I can't put it in any better words. Senator McGrath. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. What we know about Labor is that when they enter the room, the truth leaves the room at the same time. And no more, no more so when it comes to election promises, no more so when it comes to telling the truth to the Australian people about the cost of living, but also when it comes to your wages. And what we've seen with the Labor government since the election has been a consistent streak of breaking promises. And, and the, greatest, the, the greatest bing bong, the greatest blunder of this Labor government was their promise prior to the election that they would cut your power bills by $275. And, and acting Deputy President, how many times do you think they made that promise before the last election? Tell us. Oh, ten times. Oh, look, I'm going to take some bids here, ladies and gentlemen. So I've, got, I've got a ten from Senator Cash. Do I have any higher bids? Any higher bids? High bids? Thirty-five, thirty-five from Senator Scar. Anyone? Anyone higher? Take your bids. Senator Cox. Senator Cox can't hear you. Interjections are always disorderly. But um, but I did hear someone say 90, 97 times. Sold. 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 Senator Askew wins. Wins by guessing correctly that the Labor government promised 97 times before the last election they would cut your power bills. Now, what is interesting about, about this chamber often is not what is said in the chamber, as interesting as that can be sometimes. What is more interesting is what is not said in this chamber. And you know what is not, there, is, there are three numbers. 
when you put them together, they become one large number. There are three numbers that have not been said in this chamber since the election by a member of the Labor Party. It's like they've taken a secret blood oath, or you know, maybe a spit oath. I don't know what type of oath they take in the Labor Party, where they've all agreed in their caucus meeting uh, that they've all held hands and, and they've, they've done a little dance and said, we will not say these three figures in the chamber. Now, for the respect and the decorum of this chamber, I will not run an auction on what people might think those figures are, but I am going to say those figures. You will not hear a member of the Labor Party say the number two. You will not hear a member of the Labor Party say the number seven. And you won't hear a member of the Labor Party say the number five. And you certainly, and I will bet, I will bet um, a year's worth of eggs from my, my, my chooks and my farm that they will never, ever, ever say 275 together. <laughs> They're not all roosters. Um, uh, there are no roosters on my farm. Roosters cause you trouble, by the uh, way. You know, order, they, 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 they get them pregnant. Um, and uh, we're on the eggs. So the issue here is that the Labor senators will not say 275. And you know why? Thank you, Senator Cash. They, they broke a promise. And, and, and this is where I, where, I, where I lower my voice, which I know people like, and I get very serious, and it's like telling a bedtime story. And the reason, the reason, the reason why is because the Labor Party are embarrassed. They are embarrassed because they know that they misled the Australian people at the last election. They misled them about so many issues. But the clunker, the massive one, is to do with the cost of living and the cost of your power bills. And then when they come in here and they've been asked questions by now, I think nearly everybody on the front bench, uh, the middle bench and, and, the, and the back bench, all the benches on this side of the chamber, we've all asked questions to the Labor ministers about, about the 275 figure and none of them say anything. And it's really fascinating actually. It's an exercise in, in, in human nature that when we ask a question about the power bills and the, the relevant minister gets up and starts fumbling, fumbling away like Inspector Clouseau on steroids, and what do you see? is that the Labor backbenchers immediately pick up their phones and become really interested in watching cat videos um, and things like that. It is fascinating. Uh, they, all their heads go down like this, like they're doing a giant prayer towards all of us, which is brilliant, like, um, like we're, we're minor deities. Uh, but we are compared to these people when it comes to keeping our election promises, because we keep our election promises because we're on the side of the Australian people, whereas the Labor Party are only on the side of themselves. The Labor Party are only on the side of themselves, making sure that they scutter around, around the blue carpet like Dyson vacuum cleaners, very, very excited around, around this building. But where are they when it comes to your wages? Where are they when it comes to standing up on your, on your side? They're not. They just have forgotten about Australian families and Australian workers Thank and shame you. Your on time them. Has expired. So the question. Uh, thank you, Senator McGrath. Order. The question is that the Senate take note of answers. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Uh, we're now going to proceed to the tabling and consideration of committee reports. I call Senator Ciccone. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Just quite a few here. Just want to make sure I'm reading out the right ones. Um, Acting Deputy President, I present uh, Delegated Legislation Monitor Number Four of 2023 of the Senate Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Ledge, together with the Ministerial Correspondence relating to the report. Uh, and I move that the Senate take note of the report. Thank you, uh, Senator Smith. No, Senator Scar. Uh, I present uh, Scrutiny Digest 4 of 2023 of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills, and I move that the Senate take note of the report. And I seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, Senator Ciccone. I should have also, um, Deputy President, uh, mentioned that I also seek leave to continue my remarks about that uh, report that I just tabled. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Moving on to Senator Ciccone. Thank you again. Uh, now, I also like to present the following reports and documents from a number of committees, Deputy President. 
Number one, additional estimates, information that's received by the Committee Affairs Legislation Committee. Two, Human Rights Scrutiny Report number four, 2023, for the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights. Three, additional information received by the Economics Legislation Committee on its inquiry into the, into the provisions of the Housing Australia Future Fund Bill 2023 and related bills. Four, an advisory report of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security on its review of item number 250 of Schedule 1 of the National Anti-Corruption Commission Consequential and Transitional Provisions Bill 2022. 5. The Joint Select Committee on Northern Australia's first report on the Cyclone Reinsurance Pool, together with accompanying documents. 6. The 494th report of the Joint Committee of Public Accounts and Audit, together with executive minutes relating to several reports of the committee. And lastly, the 208th report of the Joint Standing Committee on treaties. And I'd also like to seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Is that it? <sighs> Which one are we up to now? Yeah. Sorry, Senator Macdonald. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise, rise to uh, take note of the Joint Select Committee on Northern Australia first report on the cyclone reinsurance pool. Am I right to do that now? Yes. Thank you. you have the call. Thank you. Uh, this is a terrifically important body of work that the Joint Select Committee on Northern Australia has undertaken with uh, inquiring onto the ongoing work of the cyclone reinsurance pool. It's important in the first instance that there be a Joint Select Committee on Northern Australia. And it was devastating to see that one of the first acts of this incoming government was, of course, to abolish the Joint Standing Committee on Northern Australia, a committee that has done a huge power of work on inquiries into the under- and non-insurance in Northern Australia, uh, the activities in Duke and Gorge, uh, amongst other planning and uh, bodies of work for Northern Australia. And so I was very pleased uh, to lead the charge uh, to have that committee, uh, a, a joint select committee, re-established and uh, that committee is made up of the chair uh, from the Northern Territory, uh, Marion Scrimger from Lingiari, uh, and the deputy chair, Warren Inch from Leichhardt, uh, both uh, terrific Northern Australianers. Uh, and we have a range of other uh, great committee members, uh, including yourself, Senator Orman Payne. Now, this inquiry is important. And I want to encourage the work, uh, acknowledge the important work that Warren Ench from the seat of Leichhardt, Phil Thompson from Herbert and Andrew Wilcox from Dawson have done in continuing to advocate for uh, the need for there to be an intervention in the market uh, because we know that in Northern Australia people were either not able to acquire insurance or if they were, they were underinsuring their properties in order to afford the premiums. Uh, we know that this is true because the ACCC uh, did a, a full inquiry um, into the insurance impacts and the final report of the ACCC was tabled on the 28th of December uh, uh, 2020 and that identified the serious impacts uh, that this underinsurance and lack of, ava lack of uh, availability of insurance was having, not just uh, on businesses, and of course, if you don't have insurance, you can't get finance. Uh, but businesses uh, were uh, incredibly uh, adversely affected. But on families and individuals right across Northern Australia, uh, the the one that continues to break my heart is people who have retired and bought a unit, bought a unit on the Strand, uh, in Townsville, on the Lagoon, in Cairns. Uh, somewhere where they intended to see out the rest of their, uh, their retirement years. Uh, but it, what has happened is the, the escalating cost of insurance and the state government's inflexible position on how they have to uh, meet premium payments, how the body corporate has to uh, uh, find insurance, was meaning that it was driving, driving these people out of their homes. Uh, it has driven people uh, away from home ownership in North Queensland, uh, and it is a very serious issue. Now, what was important about this inquiry is that this is the first um, 
uh, examination of what has happened since the uh, intervention of the previous government, the coalition government, in the $10 billion cyclone reinsurance pool. This was a terrific policy announcement, but it is incredibly important that we continue to hold uh, the insurers uh, to account to understand that the work of the government, the reinsurance pool, and the interaction with the insurers means that Northern Australians are getting the outcome that the government has intended with the uh, introduction of that pool. Um, what we did here was a range of different uh, pieces of evidence um, around uh, still the problems for marine insurance, uh, about the challenges of getting flood insurance, um, as well as the challenges for people like the Townsville uh, Racing Club because it has a, a, um, a capital rate that is higher than the $5 million set by the reinsurance pool. So these are all things we heard about. However, at this point, uh, there is only two insurers have signed up to the reinsurance pool. This is in line with the expectations uh, that there would be uh, another six insurers sign up over the next six months, uh, and then an additional four by the end of this year, which should bring uh, the majority of insurers t signed up to the reinsurance pool by the end of, of this uh, calendar year of 2023, which will allow us, the committee that is, uh, to hold another hearing uh, sometime in the early part of next year to continue assessing uh, these impacts on, uh, on insurance premiums and availability of insurance, access to insurance because it was always the intention that what this policy intervention would do would be to provide parity. Parity of access to insurance uh, through cost and offerings that should be expected uh, right across Australia. So that's the outcome that we're searching for. Um, I have to tell you that having seen a number of councils from southwest Queensland uh, just this week, we know that this challenge of insurance is now creeping right across Australia. And there are uh, regions that are not being offered flood insurance, despite having a significant levy bank around towns like Charleville and Gundawindi. So I can see that there is going to be a requirement for there to be further inquiries into what's happening with uh, it, what products are being offered to insurance companies and, uh, and how we're going to address that going forward. But I do commend the work of this report. I want to thank uh, the Chair, Marion Scrimgeard, the Deputy Chair, Warren Inch, uh, and the remainder of the members, uh, as I've already mentioned, Senator Orman Payne um, and uh, uh, Senator Dean Smith, um, and of course, um, uh, Mr Luke Gosling, also from the Northern Territory, Shane Newman from Blair in Queensland, uh, Andrew Wilcox, uh, the member for Dawson, Senator Patrick Dodson uh, from Western Australia and Senator Nita Green from Queensland. It has been a very collegiate committee uh, on this very important topic and I want to thank all of the members of the committee for the work that they've done, the interest that they continue to show and look forward to uh, ongoing work in this regard. Thank you. Uh, Senator Macdonald, do you seek leave to continue your remarks? I do, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy Chair. I seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Kakoni, I have a few speakers coming. I'm going to work my way around the chamber. Thanks a lot, Acting Deputy President. I'll be very quick. Um, I also wanted to take note of a number of documents that were listed in the, um, in the uh, notice paper on page 7. Aren't we? We're not there yet. We're on 18 or on 19. 17? Still on, right. Sorry, still I'm on 17. <laughs> Wishing to speak to a document that's been tabled? I rise, I rise to speak to the tabling of the Senate Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislations, Delegated Legislation Monitor 4 of 2023. Uh, the monitor reports on the committee's consideration of 91 legislative instruments registered between 21st of February and 15th of March 2023. It also details the committee's ongoing consideration of instruments registered yeah, in previous periods and concludes its engagement with the relevant minister in relation to three instruments. I would firstly like to draw the chamber's attention 
to the committee's comments on three instruments in the Treasury portfolio, which create exemptions to primary legislation. The committee's long-standing view is that modifications to or exemptions from primary legislation should be set out in the primary legislation itself. However, when these measures are in delegated legislation, they should be time-limited in order to, fil to facilitate regular parliamentary scrutiny and so that they do not operate as a de facto amendment to primary legislation. This is a significant and ongoing scrutiny concern for the committee more broadly, and accordingly it continues to closely engage with the Assistant Treasurer in relation to this issue. The first two of these instruments are the Corporations Amendment Litigation Funding Regulations 2022 and Treasury Laws Amendment Rationalising ASIC Instruments Regulations 2022, which I mentioned in my tabling statement on the 8th of March. Both instruments introduce exemptions to primary legislation which appear to be ongoing as they are inserted into regulations that are exempt from sunsetting. Further, the rationalising ASIC re regulations have the effect of moving exemptions that were previously time limited or are, less, are at least subject to sunset sunsetting into principal regulations which have no such time limits. For this reason, the committee sought the Assistant Treasurer's advice about the appropriateness of including such exemptions in delegated legislation that is exempt from sunsetting and whether they could instead be included in primary legislation. The Assistant Treasurer's advice and response was that placing the exemptions in delegated legislation is necessary for reasons of certainty to create consistency, consistency with similar exemptions which would assist with clarity and navigability. Sorry. Thursday afternoon. He also indicated that the rationalising ASIC regulations are part of the Treasury's law, impro law improvement program, which will incorporate matters in ASIC made legislative instruments into the corporation's regulations and primary law. Unfortunately, these responses did not address the committee's scrutiny concerns, and the committee continues to its engagement, including to seek further advice about the location of the exemptions, the appropriateness of time limiting some exemptions to the Corporations Act, but not others, and further details about the law improvement program. Finally, in this de delegated legislation monitor, the committee has commented on the Corporations Amendment Design and Distribution Obligations Income Management Regimes Regulations 2023. This instrument similarly inserts ongoing exemptions to certain obligations in the Corporation Act, Corporations Act for issuers of income management accounts. The committee notes that the explanatory statement indicates that the exemptions it introduces are consistent with those in ASIC Corporations Design and Distribution Obligations Interim Measures Instrument 2021-784. However, while the ASIC instrument appears to be both subject, subject to sunsetting and to self-repeal in October 2023, it was unclear to the committee why the instrument does not appear to be similarly time limited. Accordingly, the committee is seeking the Assistant Treasurer's advice as to the appropriateness of including the exemptions in delegated legislation that is, that is exempt from sunsetting and the inconsistency with the ASIC instrument. The committee will continue its engagement with the Assistant Treasurer on this issue and carefully scrutinise de delegated legislation which contains ongoing measures that mo modify or create exemptions to primary legislation. Parliamentary oversight and the duration of such instruments are key considerations for the committee under the Senate standing orders. I would, not, uh, would next like to draw the Chamber's attention to the three instruments of which the committee has concluded its examination. This includes the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission Amendment, Code of Conduct and Banning Orders Rules 2022. While this instrument grants a broad discretionary power to the Aged Care Commissioner in response to the committee's request, the Minister for Aged Care undertook to make further legislative amendments to reflect the limitations provided under the re relevant Act and rules and undertook to prepare an explanatory statement to reflect these limits. We thank the Minister for her helpful engagement in this issue. I'm also pleased to report that the committee has concluded its examination of the Data Availability and Transparency Code 2022 following constructive engagement with the Minister for Finance and, and the Data Commissioner. In response to the committee's request, the Minister provided advice about the meaning of a number of discretionary terms in the Code and undertook to include this information in the explanatory statement. With the inclusion of this information in the explanatory statement, the committee has resolved to conclude its examination of this instrument. Finally, I would like to mention the Telecommunications Amendment Disclosure of Information for the Purpose of Cybersecurity Regulations 2022. 
The committee initially raised concerns about this instrument because it had the effect of enabling the minister to, to expand by a notifiable instrument the type of personal information which could be disclosed to financial services entities and government agencies. The committee's view is that classifying instruments as notifiable rather than legislative instruments significantly limits parliament's scrutiny function as these instruments are not subject to processes including tabling, disallowance and sunsetting. These concerns are heightened when the subject matter is significant, such as where it relates to privacy. However, the committee resolved to conclude its examination of this instrument in the light of, minister, uh, of advice provided by the Minister for Communications that the measures will self-repeal in October 2023. Further, in acknowledgement of the potential limits notifiable instruments have on parliamentary scrutiny, the minister indicated that if similar measures were introduced in future, they would be included in primary legislation where possible, and with regard to the Attorney General's Privacy Act review. I thank the Minister for her constructive engagement on these issues and welcome her undertakings. With these comments, I commend the Committee's Delegated Legislation Monitor 4 of 2023 to the Senate. Uh, the question is that the Senate take note. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Uh, just for the benefit of the Chamber, we're still on item 17, committee reports. Senator Scar. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. And uh, just before I uh, take note of a document, I'd just like to compliment Senator White in relation to uh, her chairing of the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation Committee. Uh, as a member of that committee, I think uh, uh, Senator White is doing a, a very, very commendable job uh, in terms of leading that committee on a nonpartisan manner, and I compliment her on it, as I compliment my friend Senator Dean Smith with respect to the chairing of the Scrutiny of Legislation Committee. Uh, I rise to take note of the Economics Legislation Committee additional information in relation to the Housing Australia Future Fund Bill 2023 and related bills, and uh, I seek leave to continue my remarks. Uh, is, uh, oh, leave granted. I think leave is granted. Senator Reynolds. Acting uh, Deputy President, uh, I rise to take note of the report of the Joint Committee of Public Accounts and Audits, Report Number 494, which has just been tabled uh, on the inquiry into the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade Crisis Management Arrangements. Um, in this inquiry, the committee reviewed the Auditor General's report on the effectiveness of DFAT's crisis management arrangements during the COVID-19 pandemic. This framework was implemented to facilitate the return of overseas Australians who were stranded due to travel restrictions and border closures. At the outset, I would like to note that we in the committee warmly commended officers of the Department of Foreign Affairs for their dedicated work in assisting Australians stranded offshore during the pandemic and, indeed, the help they continue to provide to any Australians across the globe who require it. Uh, also, as a member of Cabinet at the time, and involved in the response. I also acknowledge uh, my Cabinet colleagues and also the Prime Minister for their leadership uh, in this response. Uh, the committee itself supported the areas for improvement identified by the Auditor-General and uh, noted that DFAT objected to two recommendations. But uh, can I also um, note what we said in the Coalition members' additional comments? And it was important for us as a committee to remember that this was a once-in-a-generation pandemic. The circumstances of the COVID-19 pandemic were extraordinary and uh, the response was unprecedented, but there are certainly lessons to be learnt from a response of that magnitude. Uh, the Morrison government declared the COVID-19 pandemic on 27 February 2020, before the World Health Organisation declared it on 11 March 2020. This early acknowledgement and the action in closing international borders meant the government could put health and economic measures in place to protect lives and livelihoods, remembering that at that time there was no sight of any vaccine uh, for this new uh, virus. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade established crisis, a crisis framework that enabled it to successfully assist uh, 61,755 Australians to return and on facilitated flights, of which there were 227, uh, which again is unprecedented in its scale, scope and time frame and challenges, given that the global airline industry had pretty much shut down. 
The response to the pandemic was tough, but it did allow Australia to be one of the few countries to come out of the pandemic stronger, with over 95 per cent of Australians vaccinated, which also saved at least 40,000 Australian lives. As of February 2023, more than 64 million vaccine doses had been administered here in Australia. And, uh, that's despite misinformation and also the undermining efforts of some in the community. But the Department of Health's uh, Is It True portal opened on the 14th of March and provided information on the safety and effectiveness of the vaccine rollout in more than 63 languages uh, for multicultural communities across Australia. In Australia, from the 3rd of January 2020 to the 21st of March 2023, there have uh, been 11,380,700 confirmed cases of COVID-19, with 19,447 deaths reported to the World Health Organisation, meaning Australia has contributed 0.28 per cent of the world's fatalities due to COVID-19 and 1.5 per cent of reported cases. Other large economies, comparable economies, such as the United States, China and India, who did not implement the measures that Australia did, had significantly higher cases and also, sadly, deaths. The United States, for example, had confirmed more than 102 million cases which was 13.5 per cent of global cases, and more than one million Americans died of COVID-19, which was over 16 per cent of global deaths. Uh, with, uh, so the Americans uh, have achieved 69 per cent of the population fully vaccinated, whereas here in Australia, as I said, we had over 90 per cent, in fact, 96 per cent. So there is no doubt that the JobKeeper payment and other federal government financial supports that the Morrison government implemented played a key role in supporting the nation's economy throughout the pandemic and also ensured that businesses could keep employees connected to them uh, during these terrible times. The Reserve Bank estimated that this payment alone, the JobKeeper payment, reduced total job losses by 700,000 between April and July 2020. And Treasury estimates that the unemployment rate would have been at least 5 per cent higher than it turned out to be because of JobKeeper. The Morrison's government's $314 billion in direct economic support included payments to individuals and support to businesses, also contributed to Australia keeping its AAA credit rating, one of only nine countries, only one of nine countries in the world to achieve this. So they were extraordinary times, and as the committee uh, reported, DFAT certainly did a sterling job in dealing with Australians who were stranded overseas and repatriating them to Australia. So in conclusion, uh, Mr Deputy President, I thank all of the contributors to this inquiry, particularly the DFAT officers who appeared at the public hearing and also facilitated a site inspection of the department's crisis management facilities. I also thank all fellow members of the JCPAA who participated in this inquiry, They con continuing the bipartisan tradition of this committee. And finally, can I give a huge thanks to the amazing committee secretariat for, for their support and their professionalism uh, throughout this inquiry. And I seek leave to continue my remarks. Uh, leave, leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Reynolds. <coughs> No further contributions. Oh, uh, sorry, our minister. Uh, uh, <laughs> the president has received letters requesting changes in the membership of committees. Minister, thank you. I seek leave to move a motion to vary the membership of committees. Uh, leave is granted. Thank minister. you, minister. I move that senators be discharged from and appointed to committees as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed in the dynamic red. Brilliant. So we will now move to um, item 18, which is consideration of documents uh, which are listed on pages 7 and 8 of the notice paper. A reminder that any document to which no senator arises will be taken to be discharged from the notice paper. And I call Senator Walsh. 
Deputy President, I take note of documents 1, 6, 7 and 12 on page 7 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Uh, leave, is, leave is granted. Thank you. Senator, I'll go to Senator Scar, then I'll go to you, Senator Shoebridge. I, I, thank you, and thank you for your indulgence, Senator Shoebridge. Uh, I am uh, taking note of documents 2, 3, 4, 5, 8, 9, 10, 11, 15, and 16, and seek leave to continue my remark. And I think uh, leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Scar. And I'll call you Senator Shoebridge. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I seek leave to table a non-conforming petition in relation to the plans for the redevelopment of the Randwick barracks site. Um, I don't know if this is the correct. Okay, and I just, and I'm just checking around. I think. Looking at the appropriate it's people. It's been circulated. Okay. With so it looks like leave is granted, Senator Shoebridge. Yes. Um, I table the petition seeking to stop the plans for the redevelopment of the Randwick Barracks site with a total of 660 signatures. Excellent. Thank you, Senator Shoebridge, for, for that. Uh, I'm looking around the chamber in relation to no one else wishes to speak to on, on documents. Uh, so we'll now move to item 19. The Senate will now proceed to the consideration of committee reports, government responses and order generals reports which are listed at pages 8 to 9 of the notice paper. Uh, any report or response to which no Senator rises will be taken to be discharged from the notice paper. Senator Walsh. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I take note of reports 2, 3 and 4 on page 8 and seek leave to continue my remarks. I think uh, leave is granted. Uh, Senator Scar, and then I'll come to you, Senator Cox. Sorry. Oh, thank you. Senator Cox, we'll see if any are left. <laughs> um, I rise to take note of, uh, I think we've number done, we've four done. was already done. Four has been done, yeah. Yeah, so I rise to take note of um, uh, the Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport References Committee Fisheries Quota System report and seek leave to continue my I think leave was granted and I'm going to Senator Cox. Thank you, Acting Deputy Chair. I rise to speak to document one, uh, listed the examination of the Australian Federal Police annual reports of 2021-21-22 uh, by the Law Enforcement Joint Statutory Committee. Senator um, Cox, you have the call. Thank you. In 2020, the AFP announced the establishment of a First Nations unit. The purpose of this unit was to promote uh, full and unhindered Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander participation in the AFP's workforce and inform the provision of culturally aware policing services in the Australian community. In 2020, uh, 2021's annual report, it states that this unit will have three initial priorities, and they were embedding cultural awareness, strengthening cultural competency and supporting its First Nations members. In the 2021-22 report, it states that the AFP will continue to work closely, enhancing partnerships and supporting the front line, which includes the establishment of the AFP's First Nations Advisory Board. This board would have the responsibility for informing its strategic agenda and specific inclusion initiatives relating to First Nations matters for the AFP. As a former police officer and a First Nations woman, I'm glad to see that the AFP is taking some action. However, I know firsthand that we, in fact, have a long way to go, not only in the police's dealings with First Nations people, but also the inclusions of First Nations people in police forces around this country. First Nations people have historically been disproportionately targeted by police. We are arrested more, we are more likely to be sentenced, we have longer sentences, and once we're in custody, as we discussed earlier this week, we're more likely to die in custody. This is in fact shameful, and there are many stories about the injustices that face First Nations people within our so-called justice system. The New Zealand, uh, Australian New Zealand Police Advisory Agency has three anti-racism and culturally diverse principles that are aimed to ensure co both countries fulfil their obligations under the international treaties, such as the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination and the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples anti-discrimination legislation. So I would like to highlight some of those to you, one being to understand and respond to the historical context and ongoing lived experiences of First Nations people, um, to actively take steps to ensure uh, 
people from diverse backgrounds are recruited, promoted and, in fact, retained within police forces, provide police with awareness, skills and knowledge to enable them to identify and address how their own biases are both learned and unconscious and impact on their decision-making and, in fact, on their behaviour. All eight of these principles are vitally important in having a diverse police force that understands, respects cultural differences. And particularly for First Nations people, I urge the AFP and all of the state and territory police forces in this country to fully adopt all these principles. However, time and time again, we read about First Nations people being shot, tackled, thrown to the ground and otherwise subjected to very, very brutal treatment. And in fact, I had a phone call very similar to this to my electoral office um, uh, last night, in fact, about this type of behaviour. In my home state of Western Australia, just last year, the, the WA police released police dogs uh, onto a 13-year-old boy, which left him hospitalised and needing surgery. Police dogs are, as, with, as has been covered in a Triple C report in Western Australia by the chief. Uh, John McKechnie, saying that the present policies are not racist in intent, but in fact are racist by the way that they are carried out. Now, dis police dogs are disproportionately used against First Nations people, some of those people in Western Australia as young as nine years old. So this is not a training office, uh, issue for the dogs, as my, uh, some people have uh, alluded to that myth. This is about police officers and handlers having control of those dogs. And I urge both the AFP and other law enforcement agencies in, in this country to urgently make sure that they are enforcing and implementing those ANSPAR principles to address some of these systemic issues that are happening across police forces uh, in Australia. We clearly have an exceptionally long way to go before First Nations people feel safe and have their own wellbeing being looked after in this country. Thank you. Senator Cox, just checking. I, I, I'm assuming you might want leave to continue your remarks. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, leave is granted. Uh, thank you for that. And we have no f further business, so uh, we'll move on to ministerial statements. And I call the minister. Thank you. I table documents relating to orders for the production of documents concerning the goods and services tax, discretionary payments to the Australian Labor Party, costs relating to parliamentary sittings, superannuation balances and alcohol and drug related incidents in Sedruna. Thank you, Minister. One more. Hey. And on behalf of the Minister for Resources. Um, Ms Madeline King, I table a ministerial statement on resources. Uh, Senator Macdonald. I rise to take note of the ministerial statement on resources. Okay. Senator Macdonald, you have the, the call. Thank you. Australia may have ridden on the sheep's back, but it was the pursuit of minerals that has accelerated our development as a modern nation. And it is the strength of our resources sector that continues to underpin our economic growth in the 21st century. The resources sector employs over 1.1 million Australians, a sector that has paid over $37.2 billion in wages and salaries last year straight into Australian households which is set to deliver $459 billion in export earnings over 2022-23, strengthening our budget and delivering funding for roads, for schools, for hospitals right across the country, a sector that makes up 14.5 per cent of our gross domestic profit, that paid over a product, I'm sorry, that paid over 40 per cent of the $68.6 billion in company tax and $16.7 billion in royalties to the states and territories in Australia in 2020-21, which underpinned our COVID-19 recovery and a sector the government acknowledges is propping up the budget bottom line. A sector that was strongly supported by the coalition has greatly benefited all Australians and it has the potential to remain an exciting and prosperous industry for Australia. Now, Australia is blessed with bountiful resource deposits from coal and iron ore to gas and oil and vast pockets of critical minerals and rare earths, many of which are found in our everyday lives. 
Critical minerals are found in our phones, our cars and banknotes. They play a crucial role in defence technology and are even found in fertilisers that help feed the nation. Coal, gas and other traditional energy commodities are vital in manufacturing and continue to underpin our electricity grid, providing secure, reliable and affordable energy for households and businesses across the country. And on a human level, the resources sector invests heavily in regional Australia. It is one of the highest paying sectors in Australia. In fact, mining jobs are among the highest paid jobs in Australia. Many of these jobs are found across regional Australia, providing a lifeline to these communities. And Australia's high quality coal and gas will also play an important role, not only domestically, but in other countries around the world. Australia's coal is one of the highest quality in the world, and we produce it more efficiently than most, meaning more energy and less emissions. As China and India increase their demand for coal, both for steel creation and energy generation, and Japan and Korea demand more gas to fuel their transition, it is in everyone's interest that our high-quality resources are the first choice for our partners around the world. And were we to shut down our coal and gas production or refuse to step up to meet demand around the world, those countries that need our resources would have no choice but to turn to lower quality, higher emitting resources from other countries. Moral grandstanding about Australia's coal and gas resources may make some in this parliament feel better, like the Australian Greens, the Teal Greens and the Independent Greens, but shutting down our industries will have the opposite effect that they have hoped for. If Australia with withdraws from exporting our high quality coal and gas, global emissions will rise. Nearly everything that allows us to enjoy a first world lifestyle would not exist without mining, from high tech manufacturing to the food on our plates, from energy generation to the steel frames that hold up our home. Yet those who attack our resources sector cannot tell us where they would source those vital inputs that support our way of life. Gas plays a pivotal role in the production of fertilisers like ammonia or urea, which in turn sustains the food security of billions of people around the world. And coal is vital in many non-energy industries, including steel and cement production, as well as coal to chemical processes, rare earth extractions and carbon fibre production, to name just a few. 780 kilograms of metallurgical coal is required to make a single tonne of steel and over 200 kilograms is needed to produce a tonne of cement. Whilst many in this chamber tout the end of coal, it would appear that they have forgotten that wind turbines require hundreds of tonnes of steel in the production of every turbine, as well as cement for the base. Additionally, thousands of different products have coal or coal byproducts as components, such as soap, aspirin, solvents, dyes, plastics and fibres, including rayon and nylon. This just shows how disconnected from the reality some in this par parliament truly are. The coalition has a strong record on delivering for the resources sector. On gas, our strategic, bands plan, our strategic basins plan program was bringing on new supply by unlocking new gas potential and accelerating development in key gas basins. The Beedaloo sub-basin is one of the largest undeveloped onshore gas resources in the world and could supply Australia's electricity markets for the next 200 years. So it begs the question why the government made concessions to the Greens to hamper the development of the Beedaloo when the Northern Territory Labor government explicitly supports its development. Who is being told what and what promises were made? Bringing on more gas supply and investing in pipelines, storages and infrastructure has remained a key issue the ACCC has raised to secure our future domestic demand. But the latest report by the energy market operator, AEMO, confirms fears that we are being driven headlong into a gas and energy crisis. Despite the strength of the resources sector, poor legislation, coupled with interventionist policies, are creating an uncertain investment environment. In a world where capital can be fluid and investment decisions are global, a stable and attractive regulatory environment is vital to keeping a future pipeline of development. 
Direct market intervention is driving Australia's resource investment landscape towards a dangerous setting, whereby companies and international investors are faced with increasingly difficult decisions regarding their future investments in Australia. Despite Australia's stringent environmental approvals processes and regulatory checks and balances, the funding of the Environmental Defenders Office, the creation of a Commonwealth Environmental Protection Agency and unachievable consultation requirements and review processes are causing more harm to our investment environment. With newly legislated emissions targets, the risk of environmental activists and bad faith actors purposely tying up projects in the courts on vexatious grounds until they fall over will increase, as we've seen in other jurisdictions around the world. At a time when the pain of skill shortage has been felt across all industries, irresponsible industrial relations legislation puts the benefits that Australian workers reap from this sector at risk despite the high wages and good working conditions they receive in the resources sector. And with worsening economic forecasts, the risk of tax grabs to plug holes in budgets is ever-present. In Queensland, the state government made a sudden tax grab last year by introducing a top royalty rate for coal of 40 per cent, making it the highest taxing mining jurisdiction in the world. In one fell swoop, the Queensland government put doubt in the minds of investors, including some of our closest international allies. Australia should not make the mistake of assuming that because this sector has always been there to support us, they will continue to be there, no matter the burdens that are heaped upon them. This industry, this industry matters to every single person in Australia. The government plays a key role in sending signals to business, society, schools and the media, both positive and negative, about the importance of mining in all of our lives. So it is disappointing to see the very week we stand here talking about the importance of the mining sector. A new carbon tax that will hurt the sector is being rammed through the Senate with the help of the Greens. What signal does that send? The coalition will always back the resources sector. The jobs they create, the wealth they generate, the building blocks for a modern society that they provide, the communities they strengthen, the environmental work that they support. The coalition understands mining is part of the national fabric and it is crucial to Australia's future, both now and into the future. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Senator MacDonald. Is this on the, the same item, Senator Cox? Yes, it is. Okay, Senator yeah. Cox. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to take note of the uh, a ministerial statement by the Resources Minister also. The Minister opened this statement by saying there are very few um, bigger uh, global challenges than addressing climate change um, and that we will not meet our commitment of net zero without the resources sector. Whilst this is partly true, there are a very significant proportion of the resources sector that have contributed to climate change and are continuing to do so, and that's in fact the fossil fuel industry. The fossil fuel industry is holding this government and this country back from achieving real change and real climate action that is in line with the science. I'd like to draw your attention again to the IPCC report that was released last week. I've already spoken about it this week and there are some key findings that I think the government needs to be reminded of, and that is that this report made it very clear that there is to be no more new coal and gas opened up and that we must stop giving public money to fossil fuel projects. And in fact, the report stated removing fossil fuel subsidies would reduce emissions, improve, improve public revenue and macroeconomic performance and yield uh, other environmental and sustainable uh, development benefits such as improved public revenue, uh, macroeconomic and sustainable performance. Now, doesn't that just sound great? Imagine what we could do with the billions of dollars that uh, governments have chosen to give to corporations who are reporting those record profits. And in the mi middle of a cost of living crisis, which we've heard about all week in this place, where people are having to choose between paying rent and feeding themselves, governments still continue in this country to give billions of dollars to fossil fuel companies. Now, this latest IPCC report was frankly uh, a scary reminder of just how much we have to do uh, to have any hope of limiting ourselves under the 1.5 degrees uh, warming, which we are on track to, in fact, fly right past. So 
For the minister to stand in this place and say that we need the resources sector to fight climate change without addressing the fossil fuel industry and the 116 fossil fuel projects in the pipeline is in fact misleading at its best. Um, but there's some truth in the minister's statement, and we will need minerals like lithium, uh, silicon, and others to build batteries and wind turbines and solar panels. And I acknowledge the conversations that I've in fact had with Minister King uh, about the government's new critical mineral strategy, mainly ensuring that traditional owners are not left out of this conversation. After all, every single resources project in this country is on the unceded lands, and every tonne that is dug up and sold is in fact stolen wealth, and every cent made from these projects is stolen. So we have to remember that. And First Nations people have been locked out of our economy for many, uh, for many years and in many different ways and across every sector. And this includes having projects go ahead on their lands without consent. Paying little um, royalties is just not enough. Um, First Nations people need to be the owners of these critical minerals projects on their lands and being deeply embedded in every way, uh, every step of the way, and from drawing up environmental plans, exploration, production through to rehabilitation. And in fact, this is the only way we can be confident that our cultural heritage is being protected and we can avoid another disaster like Julkin Gorge. We will continue to. Uh, to, to do mining in some circumstances, but um, and particularly in places like my home state of Western Australia. But the conversation now needs to be how we can do this with little environmental, water, cultural and climate impacts as possible. Now we need stronger regulations and we need to climate trigger and uh, happy to you know, uh, share in the fruits that we've negotiated with the government this week and the balance and the need for these minerals and the impacts of minings um, mining them is a tricky one to get, but we simply can't continue making the same mistakes that we've made previously. Uh, that's led us to where we are now, and we continue to to work alongside the government, and I continue to work alongside the minister to make sure that that balance is not forgotten. Um, we are in a crucial, crucial decade of change for climate action. We have so had so much delay from previous governments that we. Uh, need to now sprint away from fossil fuels towards renewable energy in this country. We need more ambitious emissions reductions targets that are actually in line with the science. And we need a government that's not going to accept the dirty donations and be captured from fossil fuel industries in this country. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cox. Uh, I think very briefly I can go. Uh, you seek leave to continue remarks? Just, okay, yeah. rightio. Well, the, the question is that we take note. Um, all those people say yes, that's agreed. So I'll now move very quickly to Senator Chandler for the general business debate. And I'll call the clerk. Uh, general business notice motion 211. Uh, in the name of Senator Chandler on Iran. Thank you very much. To move this motion and bring to the Senate the views of a large number of Iranian Australian community groups. Every senator here is aware of the appalling violence and human rights abuses that have been perpetrated by the Islamic Republic of Iran regime against its own citizens over the last six months. Women and girls who have been forced for decades to comply with oppressive laws dictating what they can wear and where they can go have been specially targeted by the regime with violence, uh, indefinite detention, sexual assault and rape. And it was very pleasing that late last year this Senate supported unanimously a referral to the Senate Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade References Committee for an inquiry on the human rights implications of the violence in Iran. And the report that was tabled from that committee has been supported uh, by a collective of 23 Iranian and Persian groups from around Australia on the 24th of February. Thank, thank you, Senator Chandler. That, that time has expired. And I will call the minister. This is when I should do it, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Yes, <laughs> thank it is. You. I was just looking for that reassuring nod that you sometimes get, yeah, which wasn't there, but now it exists. Thank you very much. Um, I move that the Senate, at its rising, adjourn until this Tuesday, the 9th of May, 2023, at midday, or such other time as may be fixed by the president, or in the event of the president being unavailable by the deputy president, and that the time of meeting so determined shall be notified to each senator and leave of absence be granted to every member of the Senate from the end of the sitting today to the day on which the Senate next meets. Thank you. The question is that the Senate agrees to the motion moved by the Minister. 
Those of those who can say aye, those who can say no, the motion is agreed to. Uh, I now propose that the Senate adjourn, and I call Senator Wong. Uh, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President or President. Um, <clears throat> I rise today to pay tribute to a force of the South Australian progressive labour and feminist movement, Michelle Hogan. Michelle died this month, and a loving family and community mourns her passing. She was a unionist, a feminist, a community organiser, a woman whose life's work was dedicated to advancing the cause of equality. She was a long-term supporter of the Anna Stewart Memorial Project, of a feeder, of the May Day Collective. She served as a Port Adelaide Enfield councillor and was a member of the Port Adelaide National Trust. She was also the chair of the Working Women's Centre of South Australia which provides advocacy and representation to vulnerable working women. As a board member for 20 years, Michelle led the centre as chair for the last five years, including through the uncertainty and upheaval of the COVID-19 pandemic. During this distressing time for so many people in insecure work, she never faltered. She never faltered in ensuring the centre continued to support people who find themselves in precarious situa situations while she also steadfastly prioritised the safety and welfare of her dedicated staff, to whom she was a mentor, a confidant and a friend. Michelle's enduring contribution to the feminist and union movement cannot be overstated, and we will feel the benefits of her legacy for many decades to come. On a personal note, when I was a young person engaging in politics and in the trade union movement for the very first time, I was privileged to be surrounded by a movement of incredible and courageous women, feminists, trade unionists, who worked when I started working in Trades Hall for various unions, including the TLC, United Trades and Labor Council. Michelle was one of the women in this movement. And as a young progressive Labor woman, these women made me feel as if I had found my place in the world. Progressive women who, in their different ways, worked for a more just community and for a better world. So I, I extend my deepest condolences to Michelle's partner of 30 years, Rob, to her family, to her many friends, and to all in the South Australian Union and women's movements. I also acknowledge her friends in this chamber, including uh, Senator Barbara Pocock, who made a moving contribution last week, and Senator Grogan, who is with me today. My thoughts are also with the staff and management committee of the Working Women's Centre. You've lost a leader, a friend and a comrade. Michelle practised her values in all that she did. She recognised, recognised that feminism has to be applied to have value. And she dedicated over four decades of her life to fighting for fairer working conditions, a greater work-life balance, and to helping women find their own voice. And she also understood that working women deserve emotional sustenance alongside material sustenance, with so many since her passing, quoting from that famous song, from birth until life closes, hearts starve as well as bodies, give us bread but give us roses. Vale, Michelle Hogan. Thank you, Senator Wong. Uh, Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, uh, President. Uh, I rise with uh, two good news stories. Uh, in, in the first instance, I'd like to pay tribute to my dear friends in the Liberian Association of Queensland, Inc., who just held a very successful Sharing Love Through Diversity dinner in my home state of Queensland last Saturday night. So it was a deep and great honour to attend that dinner. Also in attendance were my good friend Benny Bull, who's president of the Queensland African Communities Council, Christine Castley, CEO of Multicultural Australia, Uncle Barry Watson, uh, a, an elder in our First Nations people, who spoke about how close he'd become to members of the Liberian community, young Liberian members who came here originally as refugees. Uh, also in attendance were two delightful primary school age boys, uh, Zika and Elijah, who brought great spirit uh, and uh, 
uh, made a great contribution to the evening, and I was particularly impressed with Zika's uh, oratory skills. He was actually referred to by the MC as Baby Obama. And uh, Zika, you've got a great, uh, a great future, I'm sure. And uh, it was just delightful to see your interaction with your dear friend Elijah. Also in attendance were the uh, enchanting elephants from a Chauli tribe of South Sudan, uh, who attended to put on a dance performance. And if I can also call out uh, the two members uh, of that group, uh, Santa Benon Ayuli and Konsi Layet. Uh, and Konsi is actually the daughter of Santa, and I know Konsi uh, well from her work as manager of the African Centre in Maruka, referred to as the African Village. And I really do commend Konsi on the great work she does in the community um, as a mentor at the African Youth Support Council. Uh, and from my perspective, Consi, you and your mother, Santa, uh, represent the very best of Australian values. My second good news story is to congratulate Komatsu in relation to its partnership with the Endeavour Foundation. And Komatsu had an issue with respect to, or identified a, a, an issue with respect to the yellow plastic canisters it uses to uh, engage in engine oil testing, and they produce something like or use something like 220,000 of these canisters every year. And if they were not recycled, they would contribute approximately 10 tonnes of landfill each year. Uh, so what Komatsu did was enter into an arrangement with the Endeavour Foundation, which provides great opportunity to disabled people in our community. Uh, and working together with the Endeavour Foundation, those engine oil testing canisters are actually being recycled and being reused instead of going into landfill. And that is extremely commendable. And if I can say to uh, the Endeavour Foundation first, thank you so much. Thank you so much for all the work you do in providing opportunity for disabled Australians and meaningful work and employment. And I've seen firsthand what a positive contribution you make to our society. And secondly, if I can really deeply congratulate Komatsu, I'm not sure uh, that many members in the chamber know, and I didn't know uh, before looking into it, but Komatsu was actually founded by Matori Takeuchi, and excuse me for my pronunciation, um, and he was the owner of a copper mine in Japan, which closed in 1920 and he was concerned about the impact on the local community of that copper mine closing. So he actually moved to diversify his business, and that's how Komatsu was actually started, to provide opportunities, employment opportunities for people in regional Japan, an issue which we've been talking about this week. And can I just say to the leadership of Komatsu, I think that initiative Komatsu has taken with the Endeavour Foundation uh, fits with the values of your founder, Mr Matori Takauchi. Uh, I compliment you on it. It is noted by this Senate chamber in this country. It is appreciated. It is greatly admired. And it is a shining example, I think, of what it means to be a good corporate citizen. Uh, Senator Polly. The Albanese Labor government has not stopped implementing positive reforms since we formed government. In the last two days, we've uh, witnessed again a commitment to the Australian people to continue the path down economic, security and opportunity with action to transition our economy to net zero. The Albanese Labor government's safeguard mechanism reforms have now passed the House of Representatives and the Senate. This puts Australia much closer to net zero by 2050 and cutting our emissions by 205 million tonnes by 2030. That's equivalent to taking two-thirds of the nation's cars off the road over the same period. Now, this is a long overdue reform which will keep Australian businesses competitive in decarbonising the global economy whilst reducing emissions. The Albanese government's plan to look for future opportunities, for good environmental opportunities. We're looking for good jobs, and all of this is very good for our economy. 
Being in government is about making the tough decisions and displaying leadership at home and abroad, taking decisive action to reduce emissions and follow the rest of the world isn't just about being a good global citizen. No, it's about investing in upskilling the uh, secure and renewable jobs of the future. It's about securing our economic future as a nation and not being left behind. Action on climate change will prepare our economy for the future, and I urge those opposite to get on board. The government is also ensuring responsible cost of living relief, because we know in communities right across our country People are doing it tough. Australians are doing it tough. That's why we are implementing cheaper childcare, cheaper medicine and direct energy bill relief in the second Albanese Chalmers Labor budget in May. Our fee-free TAFE policy for students across the country is investing in Australians. We're delivering our Made in Australia commitment with a National Reconstruction Fund, which will assist businesses like Waverley Woolen Mills in my home state of Tasmania. And we are addressing the homeless crisis with more affordable housing, with our Housing Future Fund. And I urge those opposite who talk often in this place about how expensive life is becoming, the cost of living crisis in Australia, but there's nothing more fundamental in helping Australians than providing a roof over their heads, to providing the opportunity for those women and children who are fleeing domestic violence to have an affordable home. So you can't on one hand talk about these important issues without being prepared to address and find the solutions. Well, we in government, we have legislation ready in relation to the uh, National Future Housing Fund, $10 billion that we prepared to back our policy, but we need those opposite to actually support that legislation. You can't just come in here and oppose everything because you're getting known as the opposition of no policy. No policy, no action. So I'm urging Mr Dutton to bring the Liberals and Coalition into both chambers and to support good policy, to support the national uh, housing future fund that will deliver affordable housing and provide opportunities for not only for people to have those affordable houses, but to be able to establish a home for their family. That is so important. But that needs leadership. And the only political party at this point in time that's showing leadership to resolve the housing emergency crisis that we have is the Labor Albanese government. You can't come into this chamber and vote against energy bills that's actually going to give relief to Australians and their energy prices. You can't come in here and talk about your concern about jobs and skills if you're not prepared to support the National Reconstruction Fund. You have opposed both of those measures. You are not prepared at this point in time to support people to get an affordable home. And what you're doing is you are adding the real serious risk of higher inflation for much longer. You're damaging you, our economy and you're damaging our, Australia. Your time has expired. Senator Chandler. Thank you, President. I believe women and girls are entitled to play single-sex sport, and I believe that women and girls are entitled to the privacy and safety of single-sex spaces. These are basic, simple requests for fairness, safety, dignity and privacy. They are rights that have been available to women for decades. It is hard to believe that at the intensity of attacks a woman receives in 2023 simply for saying these rights should continue to be available for women and girls in Australia. As the world has seen over the last two weeks, these attacks come from all angles. They come from social media, where a man in Canberra, the city where I'm standing right now, proudly tweeted that his community would burn a woman alive if she ever came back. They come in the form of physical violence, as demonstrated when a man taking part in a vicious baying mob punched a 70-year-old woman in the face in Auckland last week. 
They come from courts and tribunals where women face punishment simply for offering a female-only service or even just for saying that women's sports and women's spaces should be female only. And they come from the media and political leaders who defame, denigrate and punish women defending their own rights in order to appeal to the more authoritarian elements of the left. And haven't we seen this in action over the last two weeks? This political and media culture has been created for one reason to try and intimidate women out of raising completely legitimate concerns about the erosion of our own rights. Back in 2019, I asked Sport Australia whether it agreed that the purpose of women's sport was to ensure that females, women and girls, had the chance to compete fairly and safely. My proposition, then and now, was this. Women and girls playing sport at all levels should be allowed to compete in their own sex category. Nothing in this proposition prevents sporting codes from making sure that everyone can compete in sport. Each sport can and should make sure there is a place in sport for everyone, and there are so many ways to achieve this without denying women and girls single-sex competition. For more than two years, the media, both here in Australia and around the world, insisted with everything they could muster that maintaining this position was bigotry. But last week, World Athletics became the latest global governing body to recognise that protecting the female category from male advantage is essential for fair competition. They've joined World Aquatics and World Rugby in making this finding. In Australia, women are defamed and denigrated for holding the same position as the global governing bodies for athletics and for swimming. For three years now, I have seen journalists and media outlets repeatedly insist that nobody in sport is calling for female-only categories to be protected, that no female athletes are asking for female categories to be protected. Let's be clear, that is always a lie. I have had days where I've spoken to Olympic athletes in the morning about how important it is to protect single-sex sport and then been lectured in the afternoon by journalists insisting that no female athletes care about this issue. Many female athletes have been pressured and even threatened into not speaking out. It has only been the sheer bravery and tenaciousness of female athletes along with the biologists, coaches and supporters who did speak out that women's categories are now being protected. This should be a lesson to those who insist on using the power of the state, the power of the media and the power of their own positions to control what women say and when we say it. We will write about women's sport. We will write about women's prisons. And if you had listened in good faith to us, instead of looking for any angle to attack and diminish us, you would have understood this before women got hurt. Thank you, Senator Chandler. The Senate stands adjourned and we'll meet again on Tuesday, the 9th of May 2023 at 12 noon. Good night, everyone. Whoop, whoop. <laughs>